programs. Good evening. This is Chairwoman Julie Hen. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, February 22nd, 2022. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Mr. Christian Thomas. We will then have a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held in person and virtually and broadcast online through Microsoft Teams and through BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is the consideration of the February 22nd agenda. Dr. Williams, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? I am unaware of any changes or additions to tonight's agenda. Mr. Kuhn? Ms. Hen, I'd like to make a motion to include um, a state mask mandate update between items H and I for this evening's discussion. Second, Causey. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Thank you, Mrs. Causey, for the second. Is there any discussion? Mr. Kim, would you like to speak to your motion? I'll just speak briefly to my motion. Today, the Maryland um, Board of Education took action um, regarding the state mask mandate, and I would like to have that discussion, a discussion about what Baltimore County is doing here, and I believe that this item will cover that discussion. Thank you. Mr. Thomas, did you have a comment or question? Yes. Uh, I was wondering, is staff prepared to answer any questions or to, for a discussion on this matter this evening? Dr. Williams. Thank you for that question, Mr. Thomas. Um, we will make ourselves prepared to respond if this is added to that agenda based on what we know that happened at the State Board of Education today. Thank you. And is the purpose to discuss what happened at the State Board of Education meeting today? Or is it BCPS's response? Or is it both? So, Mr. Kim, would you like to respond? Thank you. Thanks for the clarification. I want to talk about what we're doing regarding masks, but discuss, you can't talk that in, you can't talk about it in a vacuum without first talking about the direction the state's going. So thank you for the clarification. Uh, I'm not quite sure, you know, we could basically talk about COVID mitigation protocols and updates, if you'd like to rename it or um, modify it. What do you, I'm open. Okay. Any other, Mrs. Causey? Thank you, Madam oh, Chair. I'm, I'm sorry, Mrs. Causey, Ms. Joes was first and then I'll come back to you. Certainly. My apologies, Ms. Joes. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Uh, Dr. Williams, that meeting was just held today, and my question is that based on the improved metrics after you discuss with um, Baltimore County Health Department and other health experts, you will then provide a mitigation plan to the board based on uh, how you do that, and that is operations. Is that correct? So if added, I'll be able to respond to the direction that the state board shared today and what our reaction may be. We've provided ongoing updates to the board about our mitigation strategy. So we can speak to our understanding of the masking discussion by the state board and what those next steps may look like. Thank you. Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate my colleague um, requesting this addition. Uh, there's already counties in Maryland that have uh, taken action regarding the um, 
fact that the state board was known to be discussing this today and also um, the fact that the metrics are improving rapidly um, and we the board will not have another meeting for two weeks um, and the off ramps from the previous regulation did give instances in which the board of education for local districts could make decisions regarding uh, mask lifting or mask wearing so I, it's a time sensitive issue and it is uh, one of great interest to our students and staff and community. We've been hearing a great deal about it. Thank you. Ms. Jones, I see that you have a question. Um, I'd like to open the floor to any board members who have not had a chance to ask questions yet, and then I will return to you. Um, have any board members that have not had a chance to speak yet on the motion on the floor, would you like to ask a question or comment? <clears throat> Hearing none, go ahead, Ms. Jones. Again, the question is to you, Dr. Williams, regardless of when the board meets, you as the superintendent of the district, if you were to make that decision in the next two weeks to keep masks or um, make it optional, that will be your decision as a superintendent. You do not need the board's approval for it, correct? Well, what we can do, Ms. Joes, is clarify the off-ramp um, that was shared by MSDE and um, an additional information as to even if the board has a discussion today, there's some next steps that must take place beyond this board. Um, and so we can tee that up when we present the information um, if this is added to the agenda. Just what does it mean? What are potential next steps? Um, what we potentially look like or what we look like now and potentially down the road. So we, we can provide a quick update about masking here in Baltimore County. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Mr. Thomas? Thank you. So I guess my question is, is the intent to take action tonight when we're discussing this or just to have a discussion? Well, I'd, I'd like to comment on that. So in order to take any action, we first must add it as an agenda item. So the motion on the floor just adds it as an agenda item. So. I'm concerned that we are venturing into the discussion now before it is an agenda item. So I'm going to um, end discussion on the topic itself because we have not added it as an agenda item. And I hope that answers your question. Okay, I understand. Not added it as an agenda item. I understand. So yes. whether or not we act on it, we are voting. I, I understand. To add Thank it you. As yes. Thank you. I understand. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hearing no further questions, may I have a roll call vote, Ms. Gover? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? No. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. And that item has been added to the agenda. Mr. Kuhn, that was between items H and I, I believe was your motion. Thank you. The revised agenda is approved. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals, and nine, conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. The minutes of the closed session and information summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. The next item on the agenda is election of board vice chair. As chair, nominations are now open for the office of board vice chair. Are there any nominations? Mr. McMillian? Ms. Hen, I'll nominate myself. Second, Mac. No second is needed. Are there further nominations for the office of the board of vice chair? Mr. Yes. Offerman? Ms. Scott? Thank you. Are there any further nominations? Mr. Yes, Tom Ms. Mr. Uh, uh, Ms. Ms. Hand, this is Ms. Jones. 
Yes. I would like to nominate a Christian Thomas. Thank you. Are there any further nominations? Hearing no further nominations, the chair declares the nominations closed. We will now open the floor for discussion. Are there any comments or questions? Ms. Scott? Yes, thank you, Ms. Hen. Um, I appreciate greatly Mr. Offerman's nomination and um, belief in me. Um, However, I would like to decline the nomination because I do not feel that um, this board is open to my nomination and is um, progressive in the way that I am progressive um, as far as moving this um, board forward and the kinds of things that we need to do. So um, I thank Mr. Offerman for that, but I would like to respectfully uh, decline the nomination, but I am glad that Mr. Thomas was actually nominated because I think that um, Mr. Thomas could bring some great energy, um, a student voice and perspective to the um, to the board. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Any other um, discussion? Mr. Thomas? Thank you, Ms. Hen. Um, and thank you, Ms. Joes, for the nomination. Um, I, I do accept the nomination. I do not know if I will have the support of the rest of the board tonight, but I think this would be a very inspiring thing for the students of BCPS if this mob was to be elected as vice chair. And I think that I have, over the past months of my term on the board, shown that I can serve in a leadership position as vice chair of the legislative committee, and I hope that you will consider me. Thank you. Thank you. And maybe there's a, another comment in the chat. One second. Ms. Joes? Yes, thank you, Ms. Hen. Um, I am proud to nominate our student member of the board Ms. because he represents, sorry? I'm sorry, Ms. Joes, go ahead. Because he represents the student body and he represents the 110,000 children that we're here on the board to serve. Our district is a majority minority district. We have 66% children of color on this on in our district. And it's important to have representation. It's important because representation matters. And Mr. Thomas has shown that he is skilled, uh, astute, and a lot more mature than a lot of adult board members. So uh, even if you don't win, Mr. Thomas, consider this a victory and good luck. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay. Hearing none, we will now take the roll in order of the nominations received. All those who vote for Mr. McMillian as vice chair, please say yes when the roll is called. All those opposed, please say no. Ms. Gover, would you please call the roll? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? No. Mr. Thomas? No. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Scott? No. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Favor is seven. Thank you. Mr. McMillian has received seven votes. I am pleased to announce that Mr. McMillian has been elected as vice chair of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. Congratulations. Thank you very much. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters, and for that I call on Ms. Anderson. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman Hen, Vice Chairman um, McMillian, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, recognition of service. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits E1 through E3? So moved, Matt. So moved, Offerman. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Offerman and Ms. Mack. Any discussion? Mr. Thomas? Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I noticed that with the resignations for uh, this board meeting, uh, they are a little higher than the usual. I think I counted around 40 um, uh, staff members who resonated. So I'm wondering, is there something happening right now in our school system or in the country, in the state of Maryland, that kind of uh, might be influ influencing this um, or, or anything like that? Right. Thank you for that question, Mr. Thomas. No, there's not any anomalies that are occurring. Where we are in this particular school year, we've issued out our declaration of intent to our employees and that's whether or not they are going to remain with BCPS through the next school year. And based on those declarations, several of our staff members have indicated they, that they are going to be leaving BCPS. And so that's the number that you're seeing that's a little higher um, than typically. Okay, thank you so much. That clarifies uh, my, my question, thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions, board members? Mrs. Causey? Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Ms. Anderson, for your presentation. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge Mr. Roger A. Enzer, who was an outstanding building service worker at Hereford High School, who um, passed away January of 2022 after 29.6 years of service. Um, just another outstanding um, employee that just loves to take care of the buildings with and be engaged with the students. So I just wanted to acknowledge that loss and send sympathies to all of the family and friends. Thank you, Mrs. Causey. Okay. Any other discussion, board members? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hemp? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that I call on Dr. Williams. Good evening, Madam Chair Hinn. Mr. Vice Chair McMillian and members of the board, I'm bringing forward the following administrative appointments for your approval. First one is the Master Scheduler in the Department of Curriculum Operations, and the second position is Coordinator in the Office of Psychological Services. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit F1? So move, Thomas. Thank you, second, Mr. Thomas. Causey. Thank you, Mrs. Causey, for the second. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Dr. Williams? Sure. Our first appointment is Ms. Deanna Janelli from assistant principal at Perry Hall Middle School to the master scheduler in the Department of Curriculum Operations. She brings to us 21, over 21 years of experience in Baltimore County. She served as assistant principal at Perry Hall Middle, a teacher of mathematics at Perry Hall Middle, and prior experience in Washington County Public Schools. Congratulations, Deanna Janelli. Second appointment is Dr. Aaron Willer, from Supervisor of the Office of Psychological Services to Coordinator of the Office of Psychological Services. He brings to us over 13 years of experience in Baltimore County. Obviously, he served as the Supervisor of the Office of Psychological Services, and he was a school psychologist. So congratulations, Aaron, Dr. Aaron Willer. Thank you. Thank you. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer, refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. The Board of Education will conduct the public comment portion of the meeting by allowing those who registered to speak to attend in person. 
Registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Speakers are selected randomly using a, an electronic selection process from all registrations received within the designated time frame. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. Of course, if fewer than 10 registrations are received, all who registered will be permitted to speak. However, no speaker substitutions will be allowed. While we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask speakers to observe the three-minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the tone or see the time has expired. The, the microphone will be turned off at the end of your time, and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. More information is provided on the board's website at bcps.org under Board of Education Participation by the Public. I now call on our advisory and stakeholder group leaders to speak. Our first speaker is Cindy Sexton with TABCO. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, Chairwoman Hen, Vice Chair McMillian, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. For TABCO members, today was a Red for Ed day. Red for Ed is about educators coming together for better schools for our students, our educators, and our communities. If you look at our Facebook page, you will see pictures of educators wearing their red to draw attention to the budget and the needs it begins to address to draw attention to what we, the educators who work as the boots on the ground with students, what we need so we can give those students the best learning opportunities possible. And of course, as we have heard repeatedly for almost two years, the needs of our students have grown exponentially since the start of the COVID pandemic. It's not news to anyone that our students have greater academic, social, emotional, mental health, and even physical needs due to every challenge that the pandemic continues to bring to them and their families. The needs are great. What will it take to address these needs? Well, educators, counselors, school nurses, related service providers, social workers, reading and math resource teachers, special educators, educators of every kind to help our students regain not only their learning loss, but all the other needs they have as well. You have heard me say that there is a crisis in education and there are not enough educators going into the field or staying in the field. That the great resignation has hit the education field in a way that won't be easy to turn around. We must do all we can to keep our educators and to attract new educators to Baltimore County. The instructional inequities existed long before the pandemic and have been exacerbated by it. We can't keep using the pandemic as a reason for them to continue. We must focus on all we can by supporting our students, by providing them with educators who will work with them and help them grow not only academically, but in all the other ways they need as well. The new positions in this budget start to address some of the problems, but it isn't enough. We need to be sure our educators are compensated so they can afford to stay in their roles. Statistics say nearly one third of educators work a second or third job just to make ends meet. I know when I was the librarian at Villa Cresta and a single mom with three school age kids, I was working four jobs. That wasn't okay, but I had no choice. Let's give our educators a choice. Let's show them we not only need them to stay in BCPS, but we want them to stay. Let's be sure that money isn't the reason they leave this profession. Please be sure the budget reflects the needs of our educators so they can address the needs of our students. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ryan Coleman. 
with the NAACP Randallstown. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening. Uh, hello, uh, Chairman Hen, Vice Chair McMillan, I guess for the second time, Dr. Williams and other members of the board. Happy to be here and to see everyone um, tonight. The uh, fiscal year 2023 budget addresses learning loss due to COVID and staffing issues uh, through additional targeted positions and compensation enhancement. It certainly is equitable and fair. I actually wrote, <coughs> wrote these comments, but I'm, I'm gonna go just off script because the, the moment has, has hit me. I came, I used to spend a lot of time in this, in this room on this campus. And as I was walking through these halls, I thought about Dunbar Brooks and Dr. Harrison and all the educators that made this system great. And back in the day, we used to have people come from all over the country to look at our curriculum and to see what we're doing. We're certainly a shining light. All our students were achieving. But unfortunately, that's not the case now. Fortunately, if you're a minority student, you're a black student in Woodlawn, you're not achieving. And I listen to this board and we talk about mass mandates. We talk about all these different things that don't matter. As our students in Baltimore County fail, in the 2020 equity report, and I quote, Across all school levels, rates of students achieving established benchmarks on academic achievement measures were notably lower for the following student groups, black African-American students, Hispanic Latino students, students eligible for free and reduced meals, English learner and special education services. Most people think that this is just a minority issue that are not learning in Baltimore County, but it's not. It's white students not learning as well in Lansdale and Sparrows Point, special education children not learning throughout the county. I urge this board to focus on academic achievement, to focus on our students, all of our students, to stop worrying about these frivolous things. The Randallstown NAACP certainly will support you, but our patience is running very thin. We have tried to work within the system and work with you to ignite change. But if change does not come soon, we will have to look at other areas to ensure that our students get what they deserve. We are here to advocate for the students. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bosch Ferrone with the Central Area Education Advisory Council. Good evening. Good evening to all. Congratulations, Mr. McMillian. Well deserved. I would like to draw attention for our event for March 2nd. I know I sent it to you by email. We chose the topic of depression, and I was able to um, seek the uh, presentation by Dr. Todd Peters the vice president and information officer in the Shepherd Prep medical system. He specialized in uh, adolescent and teenage uh, mental issues, anxiety, depression, etc. Uh, depression medically is the most common disability in the United States. It has negative effects on the person, on the family, on the workplace, has negative effects on the students if their parents are affected. And I really think this presentation would be very helpful for our teachers and our students. You are really most welcome to participate. I hope you do. Uh, our speaker is a very good speaker and very experienced and knowledgeable. And most of my active members will be uh, participating in this event in one way or the other. So uh, 
it's on Zoom, and I wish everyone is uh, able to attend. The public is most welcome. If anybody outside our universe right here is listening to me and needs to attend, uh, my name and my phone number and email are all on the internet, and I'll be glad to send you the, the link. Um, and I thank you again for all what you do. Thank you. Thank you. Next is general public comment, and our first speaker is Sharon Saroff. Good evening. Good evening. First of all, congratulations. I heard today that the MSDE has decided to turn over the decision about the mask mandates to individual school systems. I hope BCPS will take into consideration students and staff who are immunocompromised when making their decision about mask mandates. But that's not why I'm here today. I am actually here today to talk about the actions that the county is taking to address, or more appropriately, not address, parent concerns regarding their children with disabilities. I have noted previously that BCPS has removed the item of central IEP meeting as a mechanism to resolve disagreements on the school and district level. Now that BCPS has removed this form of helping parents and schools to come to a resolution, I have watched schools and the Office of Special Education bully and harass parents into making uncomfortable decisions or push them to litigation that they simply cannot afford. We don't condone this kind of behavior for our students and staff, why are we allowing this to happen from central office and school administrators? The concerns that parents are bringing that they are being bullied about include failing grades, not following the IEP, promoting students against the parents' wishes, placement of a child in a placement that the parent feels is inappropriate or unsafe, unwillingness to provide a safe environment as a whole, provision of compensatory services, unwillingness to communicate policy changes, following state and federal law timelines. I mentioned that last time, and that list goes on. The job of BCPS is to educate students. Parents have the right to voice their concerns and they should not be bullied or harassed into making decisions that they don't feel are right for their kids. Let's return this mechanism to help parents and your students. Thank you. Our next speaker is Amy Adams. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillian. Congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn, for the um, addition to the agenda this evening. I spent today listening to the MSDE board meeting and trying to understand the next steps in regards to our school mask mandate. It is my understanding that once the AERLR committee votes to remove the statewide mask mandate as recommended by 12 to 2 vote, that you all regain control over this policy and decision making. MSDE said that the three identified off-ramps can be used as guidance but are no longer requirements. I would like you all to act proactively tonight, similarly to what Carroll County did at their board meeting on February 9th. 
you can motion and vote that all requirement of face coverings in BCPS end automatically for students and staff upon the State Board and AELR Committee rescinding their emergency regulation COMAR 13A17. The governor stated over a week ago that Maryland has had the lowest case rate in the nation and we are one of four states still with a statewide school mask mandate. That doesn't make sense. It is now a known and accepted fact that one, cloth masks are facial decorations with 0% effectiveness. Children have been wearing 0% effective masks in school for a year. So what's the rationale in continuing an ineffective practice? It is also known that one-way masking with a KN95 is an acceptable practice and will protect the wearer if they are worried about personal vulnerabilities. Most importantly, children are at the lowest risk population in the state, but the only group currently under any COVID restrictions. We know students suffered socially, emotionally, and academically during the last three school years. It wasn't the pandemic that caused these, this harm to the kids. It was policymakers' response to the pandemic that prolonged their suffering. It is time for you all to adjust and allow our children to begin the journey of recovery and regain their childhood. We want to have class parties, field trips, music concerts, assemblies, normal social functions like junior and senior proms. We want it to resume as soon as possible. I also just wanted to add that I appreciate Mr. McMillian's idea at a few of the recent meetings of moving the Board of Ed meetings around the county to engage with more of the community members. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Timothy Goetz. Good evening. Good evening. Um, good evening, members of the Baltimore County Public Education School, whatever. Uh, my name is Tim Getze. I am a father of three children and attend, uh, or that attend elementary school in BCPS, and I'm here to speak about school safety within BCPS. One would think that elementary school would be safe, a safer environment, but I know one teacher that quit due to the administration doing nothing about a student that threw scissors at her. We also have received a report about a student bringing a knife to school. My children haven't been physically harmed, but who can tell what type of, or what level of psychological damage has been done to them? Um, uh, however, this doesn't even compare to the safety issues that are occurring in secondary school. Since the last board meeting, there was a shooting at Catonsville High School where uh, two students were arrested for allegedly committing the crime. Potaspol High School was uh, locked down due to a credible threat of a school shooting and a loaded gun was found in a student's backpack at Kenwood High School. I don't know about you, but I find this very disturbing and it doesn't even account for all the un unreported safety incidents that have occurred. I'm currently debating if I should even have or allow my children to continue and remain within BCS for a fear of their safety. And I'm not, and I'm sure other parents are asking the same type of questions. In December, BCPS held a series of virtual town halls on safe and supportive environments with the perceived goal of reassuring parents that stakeholders in each zone uh, that BCS has school safety under control. Each town halls followed roughly the same formula with administrative briefing followed by a question and answer period. The town halls focused on the current practices of social emotional learning restorative practices and the reliance on parents to report issues to BCPS. However, in light of the recent incidents that have occurred within the past two weeks, I would like to know what is PCS going to do to change their practices. It is not unreasonable for parents and staff and students to expect a safe environment in school, which is why I'm requesting the board to develop a special council to address school safety. I know the budget includes considerable expansion in the arena of school safety, but action has to be taken today. We cannot wait until next school year to adjust safety practices because based on the recent uh, incidents I just cited, I know they're not working. School administrators can play the game of uh, downplaying disciplinary action in order to not look bad on the school, and uh, who loses the most? It's children. Uh, I'd like to close. I have more, but I work way too much, obviously. Mass have to end. I mean, it has to stop. The MSD voted today. They have to be removed from the kids. You want to instantly help with mental health? Get the mass off, off our kids so they can see each other smile. Thank you. Thank you. 
Our next speaker is Mary Taylor. Good evening. Excuse me one second, please. Good evening, Chair Han. Congratulations, Vice Chair McMillian. Mr. Kuhn, thank you for uh, putting uh, unmasking our children on the agenda this evening. Um, I appreciate the board allowing the public to comment on current, current topics within BCPS as it allows the board to hear concerns of parents that the board might not be aware of. My comments tonight will center around the BCPS curriculum and how it's very important that the curriculum is accessible, available, and easy to access so parents have an understanding of what's being taught in our public schools. As a taxpayer-funded institution, it's imperative that the BCPS fully publish the curriculum used for all grades from kindergarten to 12th grades and for all classes to allow for transparency in education. Transparency is an important factor in public institution as it means, as list of means of retaining the trust of the public. And when public institutions fail to be transparent, the public takes notice. And then the public loses trust in the institution and begins to question their motives. I personally don't want to see this happen to BCPS, which is why I testified in support of HB 826 to the Baltimore County delegation. HB 826 requires the Baltimore County Board of Education to publish the curriculum used in schools and make it easily accessible to the public. I think this is a great bill and enables transparency in education through legislation. During a meeting, there were individuals that opposed this bill who stated this is only a website problem and the curriculum is already posted. However, during the meeting, I was unable to follow the guidance provided by the opposition to find the curriculum on the website as pro provided instructions were invalid. Luckily, a delegate, a delegate pro provided a link in the chat which directly, directly linked us to the curriculum page. As the meeting progressed, I examined each of the grades and posted curriculum was lacking. For elementary, kindergarten was the most comprehensive with four subjects while the remainder of the grades had a mix of math, library, or dance. As for secondary schools, sixth grade was the most comprehensive, while seventh through twelfth grade were left blank with no entry. This is exactly why I support HB 829, because prior, 826, because prior to the meeting, parents had very little access to the curriculum. Now, in all fairness, someone from the opposition or one of the delegates must have made a couple of phone calls because as the day progressed, the curriculum page exploded with additional content and fields of study. And although even with the additional, there seems to be gaps in the curriculum for each grade, so I recommend that the board conduct an audit of this page to ensure that the BCPS curriculum is posted for parents to review. I personally didn't appreciate BCPS's reactive nature in updating the curriculum page after a legislative hearing. It should be available the first day of school, maybe even 30 days before school. But education transparency is very important to the community and the parents, and we support HB 826. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Muhammad Jamil. Good evening. Good evening. Peace and blessings to everyone present. Congratulations, Mr. McMillian. I've been appearing before the board since 1984. And many times the subject of minority achievement gap has come up throughout the 38 years that I've been involved. And finally, I realized that in the heart of my heart, there is a matter of lack of self-esteem of the minority population because of continuous degrading, denigrating, and negative attitude towards them in our history. In my humble opinion, I'm not a psychologist or a sociologist, the teachers need to teach the students about the historic achievements and invention by blacks having received over 50,000 patents. 
which raised the standard of living throughout the whole society. The Industrial Revolution would not have been possible without the invention of the internal combustion engine, two-cycle gas engine, rotary engine, and the wrench. Invention of blimp, helicopter, and airplane plan uh, propelling helped the air travel. Two-stage rocket, programmable re remote controllers, and space shuttle retrieval arm advanced the space exploration. Our entire food system and storage system is dependent upon refrigeration systems and refrigerators for homes, trucks, trains, and ships created by Frederick McKinley. His system also helped in preserving fresh food and also blood and medicines too. The fiber optic cable, touch tone phone, caller ID, and portable fax machine were the result of the research by a lady by the name Mary Brown. I need three hours, actually, and not three minutes to enumerate all the contributions by blacks. Therefore, I'll mention only a few more. Lawn mower, lawn sprinkler, protective mailbox, gas mask, modern porcelain toilet, fountain pen, portable pencil sharpener, printing press, radiation detector, torpedo discharger, player piano, fire extinguisher, home security system, yellow traffic light, method of separating red blood cells and plasma urine analysis machine, disposable syringe, pacemaker, and the first COVID vaccine are the developments and inventions by black men and women. They co-invented the first IBM's personal computer and the color monitor. I believe that inclusion of such knowledge will make the black students proud and inspire them. And also, they will earn respect from their non-black colleagues. Please stay warm and don't forget to thank black woman, Alice Parker, who invented the gas burner and the gas-fired central heating system. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Our next speaker is Farooq Marfani. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Madam Chair, the newly elected Vice Chair. This is a historic day. Today is a 0 2, 2, two, two, two. So this is, will be in your, uh, in your diary that you elected on this day. I was listening the, in the morning radio. And uh, today, after three years, I came back here. I used to come over here with a very heavy heart because of the holiday for the Muslim. Today, I came here with a very lighted heart. You know, I worked since 8 o'clock in the morning tired, rain, but I said I have to go. And other thing is that I listened doctor on YPR, uh, YPR in last week. He talked half an hour about the budget. But my suggestion for you, doctor, that give a last 10 minutes to the public, to the answer, the question. In that way, so many people, you're going to get a lot of feedback when you are on the radio. I listen all the day, all the time. Tom Hall, all the time. Question number, number two. I have a few points very quick. I don't know how you, how you do the zoning, school zoning. That this area will go to this school. This area will go to that school. So what's happening here? The people live here, and their schools are not good. They ask their friends to use their address to go to that school. And that, that area is less populated. This area is heavily populated. So you have to come up with some kind of a, a system or check or audit to level, level, level the population. 
After the COVID, I was talking to my friend today. School started. His kid says going and a cadence will high. He says, now teachers are not paying any attention. They are not giving any extra work. We used to get before COVID the email, homework is not done, all is nothing happened. Especially, I don't know about other schools, but in the COVID. You talk about bus driver, you talk about the teacher. My daughter, I have three daughters, and thanks to the Baltimore County Public School teachers and all the staff, because I have three kids and all went to the public, public school. They are top notch and they are all over. One is in San Francisco, one is in Houston, one is in here, Maryland. And my first one, she said that she is a math, she is a math teacher in Frederick County instead of Baltimore County. So we brought her back here. And now I said, why didn't you just talk, go and talk to the Baltimore County? She said, there's so much pressure from the administration not let me do my work. That's what it is, you know. Time is up. Thank you very much for your, for your support for the, our kids, and you are doing a very good job. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bosch Farum. So I would like to I would like to continue what I asked you the other day. Why so many people complain about BCPS, except for my friend, Mr. Marfani? Uh, and there are so many good things. And I asked you in the past also to consider to support the idea that all the board be elected. So I hear a whole lot about the board being independent. But honestly, you can't truly be independent unless you are all elected. And you can't be truly independent unless you have tax levying authority. I sat here for so many decades. It's the same problem. If you have tax levying authority and everybody is elected, you'll have the money. And the people who are coming to complain to you, they really can't complain because they elected the board. And if they did complain, okay, well, you know, go for recall or go complain in front of the office or whatever. This is democracy. I have an another idea for you. I came to the States, to Baltimore in 1974, no, 75 long time, okay? So I'm not really Syrian anymore. And it used to be so much that everybody loves and helps their neighbors. Now it's different. People are not really helping their neighbors. You know, politics are dividing people. And democracy, I believe, including in the US, is in peril. I hope not. So if the board is all elected and we focus on educating st students about the value of being involved in public education and in government, to be part of it, we strengthen our system and we don't really become like some of those people outside our borders that are threatening our way of life in one way or the other. I hope you buy in by starting the idea from here. All elected tax levy and authority. I hope you do. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Fern, you can stay where you are. You're the last speaker on the last topic. Me? Yes, sir. Three times? <laughs> oh my gosh, what am Third I doing Third time's wrong? a charm. Next is public comment on the name of the new Northeast Area Elementary School. And you are our only speaker tonight on, on that topic. I have a name for you, but before I give the name, I want to give a little bit of history. 
I bought my clinic in 1986 on Ridge Road, Gum Spring, and it was most of it quiet, lots of trees, and the building across from me was a florist greenhouse. So when the wind blows, I can really smell the flowers. Um, there was a piece of land on Gum Spring and Roseville, has really long and big trees, beautiful trees. And the kids were playing in that area. The teenagers were playing in that area. And all the trees were cleaning the air for all the people living there. And then one day, I saw a sign, property of the Board of Education. And next day, I seen the trucks coming in and cutting the trees that clean our air and replace it with brick and mortar and parking lot. I don't smell the roses anymore, and I don't have those trees in my backyard cleaning the air. America is cutting lots of trees, including the Board of Education. I asked before many times, why can't the school system go up instead of taking more land and destroying more trees? They destroy trees in the Amazon, but we don't have to do it right here in our backyard. Another problem is the florist in front of me, which is really excellent business and smells good, it's a good for depression and everything, was bought by a drug farm, a marijuana farm. So now they make marijuana there. And I can imagine that the kids are coming in the bus to the school, and they see this marijuana greenhouse, says good life forever, or whatever advertisement they have. Is this the message we want to give our kids? It's OK to use marijuana. It's OK to use drugs. You know, we have enough problem with alcohol. I just have a hard time really accepting cutting the trees and the school being close to a marijuana farm. Um, I don't know, you could call it cut the trees school, you could call it it's okay to have marijuana, you know. I don't know. I, I, I really have a not really so good feeling about it. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session. And for that, I call on Mr. Mercedes. Good evening. Nothing to report from closed session. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the report on the Maryland Leeds Grant Program. And for, yes. I'm sorry. Thank you, Ms. Gover. Thank you. Thank you for that correction. Next is our added agenda item, which is the st state mask mandate update. And for this, I call on Dr. Williams. So good evening, board. I will ask Dr. Yarborough to come to the table, Dr. Zarchin and Ms. Charlie Green. So we will display a quick slide. If we can get that slide up. It is the masking update. We don't have it? I'm getting up. I'm back down. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
No worries. So as we're getting started, um, let me just give an overview as was reported today. The Maryland State Department of Education voted to return masking requirements to the local control. Effective, they gave a date of effective March 1st of 2022. However, in that discussion, they talked about a decision must be made by the Joint Committee, which is the Administrative, Executive, and Legislative Review must approve this recommendation. So currently, face coverings in our school facilities, regulation provides guidance on, our, on when local school districts can consider lifting mask requirement. Our county, thank you, our county health official predicts if our rates continue to decline, uh, Baltimore County will enter the moderate transmission category as soon as the end of this month. Uh, we always work with our Partners, our health partners, the Department of Health, Johns Hopkins, Johns Hopkins University, and the University of Maryland. Um, <clears throat> MSD provided three off ramps. Uh, the first off ramp was based on the 80% vaccination of the population of the county. The second one off ramp is based on the 80% of the students and staff at a school or facility to be fully vaccinated. And the third off-ramp is based on the 14-day transmission rate of not substantial or higher from the centers of disease control. Again, based on the metrics, we believe that we will be able to reach the third off-ramp as we're seeing the transmission rate um, go from substantial to probably moderate in a week or so. So our recommendations is that masks will become optional in schools and offices uh, the first day after the Baltimore County has the 14 consecutive days of COVID-19 case rates and the moderate or low transmission levels. Um, based on the current guidance, masks will still be required on school buses in alignment with the federal requirements and masks will still be required in school health rooms in alignment with the CDC guidance. And I'll pause to see if Dr. Yarbrough, Dr. Zarchin, or Ms. Charlie Green would like to add any additional information. Dr. Williams, the only addition would be that uh, the Joint Committee on Administrative, Executive, and Legislative Review is now scheduled to meet on the 25th at 2.30 p.m. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Kuhn. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams, for, for providing this on short notice, and thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. As you can tell, this is kind of fast moving with uh, the board meeting today and uh, making a, a very lopsided vote to send this back to try and spur the move and removal of masks in our school, in our schools, and making them um, optional, which private schools in the area have already done. So. My question, because I see the recommendation here and I just want to dive in. I know we don't have this slide up any longer, but I'm looking at it online. And it says masks will become optional in schools and offices the first day after Baltimore County has 14 consecutive days of low transmission level, moderate or low transmission level. So my first question is where, where can the public find this information? Where can they find, like, where Baltimore County um, currently, you know, what their rates are? Because I've tried to look and I've had some challenges myself. So every Monday, our COVID-19 dashboard is updated. 
Um, in addition to that, our uh, director, Ms. Somerville, also uses the CDC site. Um, and we would make sure that everyone has access to that information, but it's updated on Mondays regularly. Okay, so that's, that's our information. And I actually have a link to Baltimore County site, and it, it was not showing the actual rates. I don't know if it was because we had a long weekend, and maybe that threw the data off. Okay. But I'm trying to actually see it so I know where we are. And so that's my second question. Where are we currently um, regarding COVID-19 case rates? As of today, we're at 57 cases per 100,000 over a seven-day period. So we are very close. We anticipate by the end of this week, we will be under 50, which is moderate or low. Uh, and that would start the 14 days once we get there. And just, and I'll, I'll let other people ask questions after this, but the, um, the 14 consecutive days of the lower um, case rate, where is this recommendation, our recommendation or is this from another entity, please explain. So, so thank you for that question. Um, two things. One, uh, the off-ramp that was provided by MSDE, that was one of those triggers that we could use that as an off-ramp. But I think it's important to remember that we work in conjunction with our health partners from both the University of Maryland and Johns Hopkins. And it was after consulting with them last week uh, that we made the prediction of when we would be in that low to moderate transmission. So we continue to work with them. We continue to follow their advice to make sure we're making the most informed decisions possible on behalf of BCPS. All right, thank you. Thank you. Board members, other questions or comments? Discussion? Mr. Thomas? Thank you. Um, are we going to be using, uh, you know, the percentage of our population that is vaccinated as one of the determinants for, during those 14 days or anything? How are vaccinations kind of involved in this uh, decision? So we continue to encourage vaccination. Uh, that is one of the things that we will um, work with the, the county uh, government to make certain that we are making available to those who, who desire it, uh, vaccination, as well as promoting and encouraging vaccination. However, again, this off-ramp related to transmission rates is one of the off-ramps that was not only recommended previously by MSDE, but was also um, you know, part of our conversation with our health partners and sanctioned by them as well. So we will continue to encourage vaccinations and continue to encourage people to make personal choices around masking. We, Thank we, you. We will also continue to monitor. We, if, when the masks come off, it, we don't anticipate this, but if the, the numbers go up, we may have to readjust. That's very important. We'll still continue to push vaccines. We'll still look at the numbers daily uh, to determine whether we're making a good decision or not. Thank you. One of the other MSDE off-ramp recommendations was an 80% vaccination threshold. Isn't that correct? Okay. But there are multiple off-ramps and we're using a different one. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Causey. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for um, uh, gathering this information for us. Um, the state board had provided guidance around um, the um, aspect of when to lift the mask mandates. Um, <clears throat> and they based it on that uh, regulation 13.A. Um, and so the board, uh, the state board removed that today. Is that correct? They rescinded that regulation? That's not totally correct. Uh, they made the recommendation to uh, rescind those masking requirements effective March 1st. But that joint meeting that happens with AELR on February 25th, they will have the final decision. Okay, so it was recommended by the state board that they rescind that regulation so that there are no um, specific guidelines to follow. Is that correct? Yes, they made the uh, recommendation to rescind the regulation that right now all LEAs have to follow. And under that regulation, the face coverings in school facilities, there are those three specific uh, off-ramps that we've discussed. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, given the metrics that I've reviewed and that I've, uh, the state board has reviewed, um, and the um, fact that the vaccination rates are so high uh, in Baltimore County, 
And um, I, I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to move that the Board of Education lift the mask mandate in Baltimore County Public School System on March 1st, 2022, in alignment with state board vote today, February 22nd, 2022. Approval of state board action is required by AERL. The superintendent will implement the transition with timely communication about lifting the mask mandate, BCPS ongoing COVID mitigation practices, and options for individual employees, students, visitors, and volunteers to wear masks. Masks will still be required on buses as required by federal law and in health suites. Mrs. Causey, do you have that motion in writing? And would you please send it? I do. I'm going to. To Mrs. Gover? Yeah, cut and paste it right now. Thank you. And is there a second? Second, Kuhn. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn and Mr. McMillian. Any comments? Would you like to speak to your motion? And then I'll open the floor for discussion. Um, someone can speak first so I can send this. Um, Ms. Joes had a question. Ms. Joes, do you have a um, question or comment about the motion on the floor? I need to see it in writing since it was just sprung sure. up. Um, but you can go to the next person and circle back with me. Thank you. Will do. Thank you. I saw Mr. Mr. Kuhn can speak to the second and then Mr. Offerman and then Dr. Hager. I just want to clarify something that that we're going mask optional when we rescind the mask mandate. Is that that accurate? Yes. Do we need to clarify it or is, does everyone understand that we're going to go mask optional? It's, it's in the language, which I'm going to. All right. Thank you. That was my comment. And Mrs. Causey, are you put, putting your language in the chat? Um, I'm not on the chat. I'm going to email it. Okay, it's sent. And was that your your question, Mr. Kuhn? Are you finished? Okay, Mr. Offerman. Dr. Williams, is this going to be needed? Is this, do we have to have a motion on the board to, 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 to actually do this? So based on the discussion with the state board, the comment was to go back to local control, local decision. So I believe as I, I if the board wants to go in this direction, we support in this direction. Again, our data is very promising based on the transmission rates. Um, I think by March 1st, we will probably look good just following the science. So um, again, based on the discussion with the state board, is to go back to the local school board. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Hager, I believe was next. Um, my comment it can be for the motion or just in general. Um, I just want to say that I, I'm very proud of how we've, um, how we've approached masking in all of our COVID metrics and working with experts in public health who uh, have provided wonderful guidance the whole time and, and we're so lucky to have them. And I feel like we're so close and we're following the science and that again makes me very proud of how we've handled all of this. And you know that we can see the finish line, and I, I worry about kind of jumping ahead of it for for whatever reason. And so, um, I agree. We're 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 almost there, both with vaccine. I didn't realize how high our vaccine rate was until I just uh, looked it up among those who are eligible. It, it's pretty close, and we're at 57, which is pretty close. And so again, we're almost there. So, personally, I would not support the motion because I feel like we, I think standing by the science is more important and. We're going to get there very, in a very close period of time. Thank you. Um, Ms. Rowe? I agree with Dr. Hager. I prefer a uh, metrics-driven decision-making process to an arbitrary date because mm -hmm. while we believe that things will head in that direction, really what we've seen with this pandemic is God only knows. So I'd rather have the metrics drive the decision. Mm -hmm. Ms. Scott and then Ms. Joes. Thank you. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I would have the metrics drive the decision. Um, no one on this board is an epidemiologist. And also, I believe, as I've stated before, and also was stated in the um, uh, Public Works um, report, <clears throat> the efficiency review, um, this is going into operations. 
and I believe that the superintendent should um, make this decision. And also, again, I do have an issue with motions being sprung at the last moment that are not presented to us, that are confusing, that we have questions about, um, that could have been sent over earlier. I think it's disrespectful to us as board members. It's inconsiderate. And um, I would advise board members against doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Joes, I know you said you I could return to yes. you, but I want to make sure that I acknowledge that you've had a question and you've been waiting patiently. So would you like to go Thank ahead? You. Yes. Um, so Dr. Williams, mass requirements for Baltimore County Public Schools and offices will end and become optional the first day of school when Baltimore County has 14 consecutive days of COVID cases that are below the required uh, rate. My concern is that lifting this prematurely before we reach the required category may cause another uptick. It's been two years of this pandemic and we're all exhausted, I get that, but uh, I cannot support this motion because we have to do it in conjunction with the health experts and the guidelines and uh, looking at data and data is right there and we're very close, like Dr. Hager said, um, it just needs a little bit of patience and we can lift it in a promising way and in a very, uh, way that's uh, conducive for all of our children, especially our special needs children and children with a uh, compromised immune system. So uh, I cannot support this motion. Thank you, Ms. Joes. Um, Ms. Mack, I know you have a question. Mr. Thomas was next in the chat. So, and then I'll come to Ms. Mack. Thank you, Ms. Thomas. Thomas. Thank you. Uh, I agree with the comments of Dr. Hager and, and some of my board colleagues up here. I do think that we should be waiting until the 14 days happen. Let the science lead our decisions. We're almost there. Um, and so I just wanted to state that uh, I will not be voting in support of this motion uh, for those same reasons. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Mack? Dr. Williams, when is the 14th day? When would be the fourth? I mean, assuming all goes well and the metrics continue to do what they're supposed to be doing, 14 days from today, 14 days from when? So, so Dr. Zarchin, if you could add to that, it's a period in which we look at the data. It's but when, what, what is day one? <clears throat> so we anticipate that day one could be as early as tomorrow. So we're looking at two weeks from that day, as long as we don't have you know, an increase. So ultimately, we're looking instead of March 1st as proposed, mid-March. And if in one of the 14 days there is an increase, does the clock start again? It would be. It has to be 14 consecutive days. Okay, thank you. Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Is it an increase above 50 or is it an increase of anything? Is it like if there was, if we went from 31 to 31 the next day, is as that long as it's under 50, we're okay. So good question. Not just an increase, it would be an increase over 50. Okay, thank you. So best case would be tomorrow's our first of 14 days. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at two weeks. That would be ideal. Okay. Dr. Hager. But we're not looking at daily data. We're looking at weekly averages. Yes. So, and the data that we, so we got data today because the holiday was yesterday, which is why I didn't know about the 56. That made me super excited. Um, but the, that means 56 as of the last seven days. Correct. So to me, if the Friday data that we put out Monday, well, I guess, so you're saying tomorrow, I would, I would backtrack it to Monday personally because it was the seven days prior. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I, yeah, to me, yesterday's day one. Yeah. And then we'll get to the two weeks and then we'll start. Yes, in that March week. 7th. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm talking specific days, but it's that week that we're looking at. Right, so to the earliest, assuming our numbers are good on Friday, which we report on Monday, then the earliest would be March 7th, right? Yes, best case scenario. Best case scenario. Best case scenario. Crossing oh, all yeah. my fingers and toes. Yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you. Mar Monday, March 7th. If everything continues to go well, that, that would be. So what we're seeing now is we had a, a, a drastic reduction. It has settled just a little bit. It's still trending in the right direction, but we're not seeing the change as quick as we have. It, that's not a surprise. 
not a surprise. So I'd like to make a comment since I haven't spoken to this motion. I'm wondering if the board would feel more comfortable with a March 7th time frame, given our own schedule and the fact that we meet twice a month. Um, two things need to happen. One is the AERL approval, which if they grant that on the 25th when they meet, meet. Um, the state board has already said March 1st. We are looking at basic best case scenario of March 7th. I'm wondering if there is any interest in supporting an amendment to Mrs. Causey's motion for a week out, either of March 8th or March 7th, because I would offer such an amendment if that is of interest. So I'm going to put that out there for discussion if, if that's something that anyone would be interested in, since it sounds like we may be unwilling to support an, a, a date as aggressive as March 1st. Ms. Matt? I did have some concerns about a March 1st date, but I would I would personally support a March 7th date. Thank you. Mrs. Causey? Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I do know I had some comments before I made my motion, but I, um, I'm going to speak to my motion if that's okay. Sure. Please go ahead. Um, Governor Hogan has lifted the mask mandate statewide in all state government buildings. The ba Baltimore County uh, county executive has listed the mask mandate countywide in state and in county government buildings. The state board has covered the issue uh, widely. They also have access to health experts and metrics and science and research. And so there's a reason that the state board decided to do away with the off ramps uh, and making uh, the <clears throat> decision a local decision. Uh, the research and science supports continued reasonable mitigation. The research and data have shown us that children are suffering from many issues um, other than uh, COVID infection. Um, Mother Teresa said, let us always meet each other with a smile, for the smile is the beginning of love. And it is clear to me that after this period of pandemic lockdown, isolation, lost opportunity, lost celebrations, lost education, lost loved ones and friends, that love is what our communities need, especially our children. So. I believe that March 1st is a reasonable date based on the state board, and I think that we can um, accept that. Thank you. Um, Mr. Offerman has had his hand up and has not spoken, and then Ms. Scott, who has also not spoken, and then Mr. Thomas. I, I've actually spoken to, to Dr. Williams once, but I'd I just like to comment that I, I'm going to forward, I, 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 I want to support I'm going to support following the science, and I don't think it's appropriate to put a particular date in, since no one can predict what the science is going to say. If the motion says we're going to open on March 8th or March 7th or, or, or March 1st, and we have a, an uptick, a serious uptick, then, then we're putting people at risk. And I don't, think that, I don't think that is in the best interest of the children or the families of Baltimore County. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Thomas? Thank you. Uh, I, I agree with Mr. Offerman. I think that uh, my, my concern is like, what if we hit 50? What, what if we're staying steady at 56 and we're still above the 50 uh, people per day on March 7th or 8th and that we have this date in mind? I just want to follow the guidance of uh, wow. Johns Hopkins and the Department of Health and our, our, our team. I want to follow uh, the decisions that have led us to this point right now in keeping us safe in our schools. Um, and I want to support uh, the team that we have in BCPS to make these decisions because I'm not qualified to make a decision on whether or not we should have masks in our schools. Many of us up here are not qualified as well. So I, I think we should just follow what the healthcare professionals and the people who have dedicated their lives to studying this um, in these decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Scott? Yes, thank you. Um, I think to truly show love and care and compassion for our children is to follow the science and make sure that we show uh, our best interests and um, have their best interests um, at the root of, of this. Um, but my question was also, um, my understanding is that this is a work session. Is it appropriate to make motions during work sessions or is this motion out of order? This was an agenda item that was added and passed by the board, so it is in order. Thank you. But I under, as I understand it, we don't make motions during our work sessions. That is not neither policy nor rule. It is, and as chair, it is in order. Okay, so we can make motions during our work sessions henceforth. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you. Dr. Hager? Um, I just, you know, wanted to reiterate March 7th, March 1st, we'll follow the, the, the science is, is really the bottom line. We are meeting March 8th, so we could also revisit it at that point. Um, and then as far as other guidance that others have, I do want to point out that one of the two dissenting opinions of the state Board of Education was a public health scientist. So I think that really following the science is so important and I, I think we've done a great job so far. And so again, I, I think sticking with that. Thank you. Ms. Joes. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to take up too much time. I just want to say that we should always make decisions and think about the least amongst us, follow the science, and whether Teresa also wore a mask when she worked among the lepers in India. So people should know that, not just use it in a misconstrued way. Um, believe in science and um, follow what the experts are telling us. Nobody on this board is an epidemiologist. Thank you. Mr. Kuhn? Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to mention that, you know, we've all been through this pandemic. Uh, and at the very beginning, they told us, you don't need a mask. Don't bother wearing a mask. Don't need to wear a mask. So the experts, you know, haven't gotten it right from the beginning. They've tried the best. We're learning and we're moving towards things. I'm sorry, Mr. Offerman, did you have a comment? Okay, okay. So I just wanna be clear. There are many states across this country where there are no masks in schools. And Maryland has extremely good numbers, and I follow the numbers, and I try and follow the science the best I can. And we have other schools within this state, including Anne Arundel, that have taken the step to make masks optional. And that's the other key here. This is an option. If people are not comfortable, they can still wear the masks. So I don't believe we're, we're removing the ability of people that have concerns, health concerns, because we need to protect them. If there's a reason you need to wear a mask, please wear your mask. But healthy children do not need to wear masks. Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion? No? Mrs. Causey? I just wanted to close out by saying that uh, I'm not an epidemiologist, uh, but I have followed a lot of things, and the state board has also followed uh, the science. And um, one of the other things I know is that Baltimore County was one of the slowest to return to schools last year when many others did. And I feel like our children have lost out and that we need to try and make it right for them. And certainly anyone that feels that they need to wear a mask, whether it's a cloth mask or an N95, uh, they're welcome to do it, and that will be communicated effectively throughout the system um, because we do want people to feel safe and we do want them to be safe. Um, but we also know that right now a lot of children are not safe. Okay. Thank you. Okay. There's no further discussion. Um, we have a motion on the floor. Um, I call the roll. Uh, let's call the roll call vote. Please. Ms. Rao? No. There's a motion and a second. Yes. Ms. Causey's motion says, I move that the Board of Education lift the mask mandate in Baltimore County Public School System on March 1st, 2022, in alignment with the State Board vote today, February 22nd, 2022. Approval of State Board action is required by AERL. The superintendent will implement the transition with timely communication about lifting the mask mandate BCPS ongoing COVID mitigation practices and options for individual employees, students, visitors, and volunteers to wear masks. Masks will still be required on buses as required by federal law and in health suites. Okay, thank you. Okay, Ms. Gover, would you please? Ms. Rao? Call the roll. No. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? No. Ms. Jose? No. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? No. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Scott? No. Dr. Hager? No. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. 
favor is four. Thank you. The motion failed. Okay. okay. And that concludes that agenda Thank item. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. The next item on the agenda is the report on the Maryland Leeds Grant Program. For that, I call on Dr. McComas and Dr. Wistead. Good evening. Good evening, uh, Dr. Williams, Chair Hen, and members of the board. Um, Dr. Wistead was not able to join us in person. However, she is online available to support any questions. So I, I will do my best without my partner here. Um, so good evening, everyone. Um, I'm here this evening to provide you an overview of an exciting grant opportunity. The Maryland LEADS uh, grant uh, is a Maryland State Department of Education grant initiative designed to support local school systems in utilizing federal funds to overcome the interruption to learning that has resulted from the COVID-19 pandemic. The overarching intent of this grant is to accelerate student learning and to narrow any opportunity and achievement gaps that have emerged uh, over the course of the pandemic and to provide more targeted support for historically underserved students and their communities. The Maryland LEADS also supports school systems in addressing both short and long-term challenges related to the current labor shortage and attends to the longstanding need to establish and to strengthen our teacher pipelines and professional development. MSDE will provide uh, school systems with a series of information sessions and workshops beginning in February. They just started last week and will continue throughout the spring to support school systems through the grant submission process. Awards will be announced in the spring of 2022 with implementation beginning as early as this summer of 2022 and continuing over the next two academic years uh, with the grant sunsetting September 30th of 2024. Next slide, please. The grant initiative is centered on seven high leverage strategies that have been proven to be effective and transformative for schools and school systems across the nation. Uh, you see on the screen before you the seven strategies uh, that are uh, part of the grant initiative. And each of these seven strategies contains a, focus, a number of focus areas and best practices from the field that school systems may choose to implement. The school system's choice will depend, of course, on our individual needs of our students, our schools, and our unique communities. Each school system will have the opportunity to work with best-in-class partners to strategize and execute plans within and across all seven strategies. Um, and to participate in this grant opportunity, school systems must choose at a minimum two out of the seven strategies, but can, in fact, um, um, pursue all seven um, or any combination between two and seven. Choosing, uh, there is bonus, choosing the science of reading and or growing your own staff will allow school systems to access a greater amount of, of grant funding. Next slide, please. Um, as always, we anchor our decisions in our strategic plan, the compass, our pathway to excellence. Um, and as you look across those seven strategies, you will see um, many points of intersection between our strategic plan and the grant initiative. Next slide, please. On the screen, be, on the screen before you, you see the overall timeline um, as published um, for the Maryland Leeds grant. Uh, as we said, the grant was initially announced on February 8th. We uh, school systems have until April 7th to submit our grant sub application. A grant grant awards will be announced April 22nd. And grant activities can begin as early as May 1st of this school year. And again, we'll run through when the grant sunsets, September 30th of 2024. And next slide, please. And that concludes our overview of the Maryland LEADS grant. Thank you, Dr. McComas. Uh, Ms. Mack? Thank you, Dr. McComas. Um, the two, February 9th announcement from the state indicates that, as you said, we can unlock as I read it, $2 million in bonus funds for demonstrating the existence of an in-place science of reading, which I presume Open Court, Orton-Gillingham are science of reading programs. 
and an additional $1 million for Grow Your Own staff. They also talk about $1.5 million in additional funds if an LEA chooses to supplement the program with local funds. Yes, that, all of those are correct. Um, and as you know, because of our Striving Readers Grant, we have introduced um, methods and uh, resources anchored in the science of reading for a number of years now. So, yes. So, because we are going to vote tonight on the FY 2023 budget to maximize the amount of money that we can get from the state through the American Rescue Plan, is it the $1.5 million in additional funds that we would have to contribute in order to get that amount of money from the state? So the 1.5 is matching funds. They do indicate that um, school systems can um, use leverage multiple sources to provide that matching funds, uh, and that sort resources can be braided. Um, so that that 1.5 million could be a combination of, uh, I believe, other ESSER funds. It could be operating funds, but it does indicate that that can be a braided resource. Okay, but we would have to ensure as a board that, to, again, to maximize the dollar amount that we could get through the Maryland LEADS program, that regardless of the source, we would have that money in the FY 2023 budget, correct? Yes, we would pr need to provide that matching fund. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Rowe? So, um, Ms. McComas, Dr. McComas, do you know specifically um, what it is we're going to be doing with this money and how we expect that to directly impact academic achievement? Well, we are in the process of attending each and every one of those information sessions. For, so for each of those seven uh, strategies um, that are offered through the grant, there is an information session. Uh, they have not all been conducted. I know, uh, for example, Ms. Shea is going to the one on the science of reading uh, next Monday. Um, and so, of course, we want to understand more deeply what is involved with each of those strategies. So to answer your question, the long answer is, no, I don't have our application already completed. Uh, what we do know, of course, is that we are deeply committed to our focus on, on anchoring um, our methodology and the science of reading. So we certainly will, will be looking very seriously at that. It will, it will optimize and build upon what we have been doing for a num number of years. We know that we, like every school system, have to work hard to um, help produce teachers and the grow your own um, teachers uh, pipeline is certainly a, a key strategy that would be uh, very relevant to us and our school system as well. Um, I don't want to, at this point, give the misperception that perhaps we may limit ourselves to just those two strategies. We know those two strategies. Uh, there are incentives, uh, as um, indicated in the grant overview, uh, for school systems to pursue those strategies, but they may not be the only ones that we pursue. So I just want to be upfront uh, around that. So does the grant allow us the opportunity to hire um, reading specialists? It, um, again, we have to find more of the details um, of what is permissible uh, within each of those strategies. Um, fundamentally, it really does help us, um, for example, some of the things that it would help us um, to build upon is professional learning related to Orton-Gillingham, related to um, letters training. Um, in terms of hiring personnel, I have to find out if it allows us to bring on additional personnel. But I, I don't know that that's uh, accurate at that point, at this point. You're welcome. Thank you. And if I may comment on this, and thank you, Dr. McComas, um, to Ms. Rowe's questions. I had asked Dr. Williams if staff could present on this topic, Ms. Rowe, um, at a very high level, um, given the timing of the board's approval of the FY23 budget and the need to um, provide matching funds, potentially. I asked for a very high-level overview of this um, program because it was very exciting, the potential to tap into this as a resource. So. Um, this is at the very preliminary stages, as Dr. McComas said. So I'm, I'm very appreciative of the willingness um, to present to us this evening. So thank you to Dr. Williams, Dr. McComas, um, Dr. You. Wisted for, for preparing this for us tonight. This was very helpful and look forward to more information to come. Yes, we will keep you informed. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Williams. Thank, thank, thank you, Ms. Well, and thank you, Dr. Wisted, for the hard work. <laughs> thank you. 
And that brings us to the next item on the agenda, which is the consideration of the superintendent's proposed FY 2023 operating budget. And for that, I call on Dr. Williams and Mr. Saris and team. So we have uh, Mr. Hartlove, Mr. Tanliff, and Mr. Saris this evening. So I'll turn Great. it over to them. Welcome. Good evening. Good evening, uh, Chair Hen, Vice Chair McMillian. Uh, tonight we have the uh, the uh, adoption of the uh, FY23 operating budget, and uh, of course I'm coming in midstream. These two gentlemen have done quite a bit of work, so I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mr. Tanwiff. Uh, sure. Uh, tonight's the board's night to uh, make any motions they'd like, and we're here, and staff is here to answer any questions you may have. Fantastic. Thank you. So, board members, I'll open the floor to comments, questions, discussion. Ms. Matt? Uh, yes, pursuant to the conversation that we just had, uh, I have a motion. And let me go ahead and put that in the chat. Sorry. As I'm at putting it in the chat, um, I move that the adequate funding be added to the FY 2023 operating budget to position BCPS to receive the maximum amount of Maryland Leeds grant money for which grant activities begin on May 1st, 2022 and conclude on September 30th, 2024. Second, Ms. Causey. Would you like to speak to your motion, Ms. Matt? Um, yes, I would. I know that we are early in this process, but because the start date and end date span the FY 2023 budget, I think we would be foolish not to um, ensure that we have the funding for the matching dollars, because as I read the state's announcement, we would be leaving $1.5 million on the table without doing so. Thank you. Thank you. And I have a follow-up question. Um, gentlemen, do we know approximately um, a number on that to maximum, what the maximum grant amount would be and what we'd be expected to match? Or is that a question that uh, Dr. McComas could answer if she's still available? We can ask Dr. McComas when she comes back in. Okay. Fantastic. And Ms. Mack, can you um, send your motion? I put it in the chat. We don't see it. It's 1.5 million. 1.5? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> yes. Would you? Please. While you're re-entering it, I'll restate your motion. Okay. Ms. Mack moves that 1.5 million be added to the FY 2023 operating budget to position BCPS to receive the maximum amount of Maryland Leeds grant money for which grant activities begin on May 1st, 2022 and conclude on September 30th, 2024. Okay. Yes, Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Uh, some, I have a few questions. Um, if we were not to put this in the budget right now, would we be able to still have all the grant money down the line? Like what would happen if this was not in the FY23 budget? How would we secure the, the maximum amount of funding if we didn't approve it today? Or do we have to approve it today to get the funding? Because I'm thinking of other school systems who are, have already finished their budget process. Well, I think we, as Dr. Boswell McComas indicated, one option 
might be the use of ESSER funds, and we would have to make an amendment to our current uh, award and request funding for that purpose. Thank you. And is that the information that was presented about leads? I know this is the early stages. That is 100% accurate and final, the 1.5 million, and that we'd have to match that? That's that, my understanding. That's what we but have yeah. here in, in, in writing. It's uh, 1.5 million. So. Okay. Then, although I can't vote on this, um, I do support this. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Would Williams. you clarify that 1.5 is for which of the seven areas? Well, it's for whichever of the two or more that we elect to Thank you. pursue. Yes. Two or more that we want to pursue. Thank you. Thank you. And that is the max m match yeah. that we would. Okay. Thank you. And I um, believe it's a competitive application, which doesn't, depending on how many other applications are received and, and who's are uh, considered most favorably, you know, we may or may not get that total. Sure. Thank you. Um, Ms. Joes, I believe you are next. Do you have a question about the motion on the floor? Yes. Um, so my question, um, Mr. Sarris, is you said this is a competitive application. So does this motion even, uh, is it a moot point in this motion? And the first part of my question was what would happen without this motion? What would that grant dollars go towards? And also I want to know, was this motion sent in advance to staff members for review and uh, seeing the fiscal impacts? My, my understanding would be that either by adding it to the, to the budget, the 1.5 as, 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 you're, as you're discussing, or we could use ESSER funds, either way we would be able to meet the, the match. Um, so, so, you know, it, it just depends on whether we want to use some of our ESSER funds for this or whether we want to add additional dollars to the, to the, to the budget. Um, but as far as it being competitive, that's it, it's, it's exactly what it says. It's there's no guarantee that we'll get the dollars. We have to put a, an application in, and that application will be viewed versus other ju jurisdictions' uh, uh, applications, and uh, hopefully we'll be successful and get the and get the uh, the dollars, or as Mr. Sarah said, some uh, fraction of those dollars. And, and I think Ms. Joe's also asked if if it was moot. If we, if the money is budget funded and appropriated, um, it would be specifically designated for that purpose, so that uh, it would uh, revert to county government if we were not to use it for that purpose. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Do you have a question? I didn't have a question on the motion. I was okay. putting in for the budget overall topic. Great. Thank you. Um, Ms. Scott, did you have a question about the motion on the floor? Or were you um, asking about the budget in general? Oh, no. Mine was about the motion. Um, again, I wanted to state, as I have stated in the past, um, that, again, to send a motion um, that was not emailed 24 hours in advance, that is cost impacting to expect mm -hmm. board members to vote on that and to have motions sprung on us at the last minute, I think is extremely inconsiderate and not how um, budgets are done. And I, I think that it's it's inconsiderate to ask board members to, to even vote on that. It, and also it goes into operations. Um, and I would also ask, you know, um, uh, you know, this motion that goes into operations, um, I guess perhaps if Ms. Um, uh, Ms. Mack, who presented it, what is the purpose of this motion? So, so your com, thank you for that. Um, I believe that that's not relevant to the motion on the floor, however. So, excuse me, point of inquiry, what is not relevant? We're, I'm not entertaining that, that discussion but right I now. A, I have a point of inquiry, though, and, and I have the it's, right to ask that. A motion that sprung not, on me at the last moment, I do have the right to ask, what is the purpose of this motion that goes into operations? 
Ms. Scott, we're discussing the budget, and the budget is the board's purview. I'm not entertaining discussion on it. Um, Mr. Okay. Thomas, so you do you have a question about the motion on the Ms. floor? Uh, point, of in, point of inquiry, um, yeah. Ms. Hatt. Please go ahead, Mr. Thomas. I am asking. Oh. I've, I've raised a point of inquiry. I want to know. And Ms. Scott, I'm not entertaining the discussion. Mr. Thomas has okay, the floor. So you're shutting me down, and Mr. you're shutting Thomas. down the voices of all the district Thank residents you. of the 4th District. You're not allowing me to ask Ms. Scott, question. you're out of order. Mr. Thomas has down. the floor. You were out of order for shutting me down. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I'd like to ask what Dr. McComas's thoughts are, or Dr. Williams, if that's okay, um, on putting this into the budget now, since this is revolving academics. Um, I just want to know, is, does she think that, the, yes, we should do it now, or does she think that we should wait um, until we have approval, considering this is competitive? I just wanted to hear her ad advice, because she is the expert on this matter. So Dr. Boswell McCombs can, can respond. I, I think to your point, Mr. Thomas, this was released to us on February 8th, and as Dr. Boswell McCombs said, there are sessions for us to understand. And it's a grant, it's competitive. And so to earmark funds that we may or may not get, it is a question. I will say all seven of the categories are very, are interests of ours. Um, and so we have been very good about pursuing additional support as a system and our team, but I'll let Dr. Boswell McComas to finish this. Um, so yes, um, first of all, I would like to say that um, in the published resource related to the Maryland Leeds uh, opportunity, it indicates that um, uh, the state allocation um, is a non-competitive grant process, so forgive me for not clarifying that when I present it, and uh, forgive me, Mr. Saris, because I didn't want to cut you off, but I was trying to, uh, I wanted to confirm that that was accurate, so it's, it indicates here uh, that it is non-competitive. Um, um, for the purposes of ensuring that each school system has uh, sufficient funding to implement uh, the plans. Uh, the, the total state allocation is $133 million that the state will be dispersing. So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, that being said, I, I would say that um, the, certainly the will of the board uh, to find matching funds, rather that is accomplished, that could be accomplished in a multitude of ways. That could be some resources used from our current operating budget. It could be resources used from some of the other ESSER grants. It could be resources used in the FY um, 20, the July 1 budget, excuse me. Um, and so I just offer that to say that I don't know that it has to be um, strictly in the July 1st budget, but that um, there, there is, it specifically calls out that you can braid funds. And I think what the state is doing is they are providing school systems um, a wide berth to pull together the resources and to try to optimize our resources. And so that would be my, my best response. I hope, uh, Dr. Williams, that was uh, adequate. Yeah, I will just add, I'm looking at a uh, a part of the document, the goal of local matching funds is to establish a mechanism for the long-term investment. So I know we've referenced ESSER grant, but the goal is to have matching funds for sustainability long-term. So again, there's still questions board around the grants. Um, I just have to put that out there and, and, and we're having these upcoming sessions to really learn about the grants and we will do our due diligence in terms of applying, because again, these, these seven are, are interests of mine. Thank you. Dr. Thank you, Dr. Williams, and thank you, Dr. McComas. Um, oh, can I? Have more. Dr. Yeah. Been waiting I just want, yeah, I just wanted to say that, uh, I guess, hear, hearing that, I mean, uh, it's so early. I said that I was in support of this before. I don't know if I'm necessarily in support of this now. There's so much unknown, and I just feel like this is something that I'm just learning about with this presentation. And I guess I would have liked to have, you know, more time to digest this and to read about all of these parts. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Hager? Um, I, I, I actually applaud Ms. Mack for being so forward thinking. I didn't know much about this program until I just heard the presentation. And, um, and it is moving fast, but as someone who writes a lot of grants, it, it says a lot that the, our Board of Education wants to invest in this program. And therefore, you know, I, I think it'll position us really well to mm -hmm. get additional funds. So it seems like a, a great investment in my mind to, to show that we stand behind this and we believe in this. Like you said, it, it hits all of our, 
our buckets. And, and so I, I, I do support this motion and I, I'm glad that it was brought forward. Thank you. Ms. Mack? I could add the language, I move that adequate funding be added to or identified in the FY 2023 20, operating budget, which would provide staff with more flexibility. It does not say that. I'm sorry, the 1.5 million be added to or identified in. Um, Mr. Tantliff, did you? Yeah, one clarifying comment. The uh, grant is good through FY24. So uh, as we learn more about it, if we did need to use an appropriate general funds, it seems that there would be an opportunity to do that in the FY2024 budget. I guess my question to that, Mr. Tantliff, is according to the timeline that I have, activities begin as early as May 1st of this year and could go through September 30th. So I would think at least some of the funds would have to be in the FY 2023 budget. The, the portion that's the match right. could be, uh, again, I'm s I somewhat know. speculative, but that portion of the funding that gets matched could be budgeted and planned in the second year of the grant. Right, but we have ESSER funds, we have um, unused funds, and we're here tonight. So I would like to see us add or identify within the FY 2023 budget. Ms. Mack, who was the second to your original motion, please? Mrs. Causey was? Okay. And she did not move to amend? You did not move to amend? It's, it stands as is. Okay, thank you. And Ms. Rowe, you had a comment? Um, I just, had a comment and, as well before Ms. Rowe. Y yes, Ms. Scott, you, you did, and Ms. Rowe has not yet spoken, so I will um, come to you next. It occurs to me that if this is a competitive grant, that this board taking a stand it's to not. make a commitment that we can make our contribution that that would help us as far as getting the full amount of the grant money. Mm -hmm. um, do you have an opinion on that, Dr. McComas? Um, again, I just wanted to clarify, it is written in the a document that was published by MSDE related to this that it is actually non-competitive. Right, I so if apologize we match, we for get that it. mistake. Yes, MSDE has designed this, and, and I will say this is MSDE's um, holdback funds of ESSER. So these are federal funds uh, from the ESSER uh, federal uh, grant opportunities, and MSDE had their portion, and now they are using their portion in this method. Uh, so they have designed it so every LEA will have the opportunity to have um, funds uh, to pursue these strategies. And the letter from the state superintendent indicates that all LEAs are strongly encouraged to apply or participate. So why would we not want the funds in the budget right now to fully participate? I don't think anyone is saying they don't want the funds. So there was a motion made about adding, we support the grant, we'll do what we need to do I think the staff has responded to the questions about the grant and moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Scott? Thank you. Um, I was gonna confirm that, that it is not competitive, uh, non-competitive grant. So you've already verified that. Um, and as I understand it, it doesn't mean that we will, or doesn't mean that we will get extra dollars. Um, Cause I understand, um, uh, I, or actually, I don't really understand. So I wanted to know that. And I want to know, will we hit a fiscal cliff? Is this something that's sustainable? So again, uh, the uh, grant, um, these are grant funds. And as with all grants, they eventually sunset. Um, and it is always incumbent on the school system to have a plan in place around sustainable funding. 
Um, and so that is something that with everything that we are funding through uh, grants, we have to plan over the horizon of what will be our sustainability plan if we choose to continue those strategies. Many of the high leverage strategies that they have in this opportunity um, really um, invest in building capacity of the people that we have. So for example, professional learning related to uh, the letters training, which is anchored in the science of reading, that is really around building up the professional uh, capacity of our faculty. And so the sustainability at the end of the grant would be uh, to what extent do we want to continue to provide that professional learning for new staff that come on board, um, at which point then we could leverage Title II funds, we could leverage um, maintenance of effort professional learning uh, funds at that point. Uh, but this would give us a huge infusion of funds to build capacity of those that are currently with us during the, the time period of the grant. Thank you. And um, what would happen without this motion? Would staff still have the opportunity to access this grant? Yes, we have um, the grant submission is, I believe the date was April 7th, I quoted. Um, and um, so we are still in the process of collecting information and understanding um, what resources will be um, part of this grant for each of those high leverage strategies, um, and then formulating what would be our actual application. Um, for our allocation. And so um, either way, if we as a school system choose to invest in the matching funds, again, those matching funds could be put together in a variety of ways. It, it could be uh, some of this year's current uh, operating budget. It could perhaps um, be funds in the July 1st budget. Um, there is a, a way to uh, look across multiple sources that we, we have to determine where we might have um, that matching fund. So then is this um, motion then redundant? That's the will of the board if you choose to do it in, in the FY24 um, budget or if you choose to uh, braid other funds. That's really the will of the board. So it sounds like from what you're saying that we would have access to it. So I'm, I'm not really sure. That's why I was asking before what this motion does. It sounds like we would already have access to this. Okay. So it, it, it just sounds like it's redundant. That's why I'm trying to understand, before I was interrupted and cut off, what does this motion do? Dr. McComas, I can speak to that. Okay. okay. So, okay. Ms. Scott, this motion ensures that we provide in our budget request the matching funds in order to maximize the grant funding that we can receive. The grant requires that we provide a match in order to maximize the grant dollars from the state that we are eligible to receive. So our this motion requests the matching dollars that we are required to provide. So we are eligible, and it's non-competitive as, as staff have confirmed, but in order to maximize what we can receive, we have to provide a local match. And that is what this motion does. Okay, but as you see in the um, chat, uh Ms. Wisted said the grant does not require that we provide a match. There is additional fund. There are additional funds that are available if we provide a match. Okay. There's a lot of contradictions there. So that's why this would have been good to have more than five minutes before it was presented so it could be vetted and discussed. And at 9 o'clock, almost at night, to spring this Thank you. on board members without it well being without it being vetted well, I, I think it just does us all a disservice. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Offerman? I'd like to move the question. Okay. Mr. Offerman has called the question. Um, that second row. It, I don't believe a second is required. Is it? Okay. Mr. Mercedes. And it requires two-thirds. Two-thirds vote. Okay. Maybe we have a roll call. It's non-debatable. Um, maybe we have a roll call vote on calling the question. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Now to the motion. So now we have the, the motion that's on the floor. Um, Is that? <laughs> Mr. Thomas? Yeah. 
I just Wait had a, a I just call the motion, which means there, which, well, no, and, now and, we, now and we that means, it. of course, there is, there is no more discussion. Is that correct? Yeah, correct. Thank I had you. a point of parliamentary inquiry. What is your point? I was wondering if I could vote on moving the question because, no, no okay, thank you. I'm restating the motion, um, Ms. Max motion to move that 1.5 million be added to the FY 2023 operating budget to position BCPS to receive the maximum amount of Maryland Leeds grant money for which grant activities begin on May 1st, 2022 and conclude on September 30th, 2024. And it was seconded by Mrs. Causey. May we have a roll call vote? Ms. Rowe? Please. Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jose? Abstain. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Abstain. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. Ms. Hen? Yes. Uh, can the record please reflect that I have an opinion vote in support? Mr. Bersades? Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. And next, I believe, Ms. Joes. Do you have a, a motion, Ms. Joes? Yes, thank you. I just put it in the chat. I move to amend the FY23 operating budget and add funding for one FTE to be designated as a coordinator of student activities position to oversee student extracurricular activities and enhance student leadership with the superintendent assigning an appropriate amount of funding for this position. Second. And who is the second, Ms. Scott? Yep. Okay, thank you. Ms. Jones, would you like to speak to your motion? Uh, no, in the interest of time, I'll pass. Okay. Ms. Scott, would you support. like to speak to your second? No, I think the motion speaks for itself. Okay. Any discussion? Ms. Rowe? Um, it's unclear to me specifically what this position would do, what level this position would be, what salary level the position would be, how this position's up, um, objectives are fulfilled now, and why we need it. Okay. I mean, if someone could address all those questions, that'd be great. So this is Ms. Joes. Would you like to respond? I could, um, certainly. What, what is her question? Ms. So Rowe, could you, yes. It's to create a position that would oversee student extracurricular activities and expand and all, expand the system-wide student engagement activities to help foster uh, student-based extracurricular, uh, extracurricular EDAs and uh, the potential tasks might include uh, conducting focus groups to gather input from diverse stakeholders, uh, analyze impact of programs on student and adult learning, based on successful implementation of activities and assess needs for student leadership, student service learning and volunteer programming amongst many. The specific goals uh, might be expanding organizations outside of student council, student GSAs, region-wide student activity and advocacy groups, uh, including increasing student engagement with the board, working with the Baltimore County Student Council to increase participation uh, for uh, engaging with the board as well. So how much would that cost? I think that's a operational question. I believe it was a ballpark figure. Dr. Williams, you can correct uh, between 80,000 to 100 some thousand. Um, you could, it's similar to something that was developed in the ESOL office. If you could verify that it's operational. So uh, we responded to that question and I will say Mr. Tanleaf, what was that figure? Uh, sure. It that probably is a good salary range plus about $30,000 in benefits. It matters the, you know, the final classification of the position, whether it's a coordinator seniority or just someone that coordinates that may be more junior because a coordinator seniority would typically have people reporting to them. So and those details would need to be worked out. Ms. Rowe. And these responsibilities, how are they fulfilled within our school system now? It looks like Mr. Thomas wants to answer the question. 
<laughs> well, I'd, I'd like staff to respond okay. to that, and then I'll come to Mr. Thomas for his comments. Well, we'll say there is no position for the system. We have something similar where the individual is working with our student council, Baltimore County Student Council and the Junior Council. So it will be another position to look at extracurricular activities that would be happening in our schools, the coordination. Potentially that individual of this new position and the person in the current position dealing with student leadership will work as a team. Um, I have had discussions with Mr. Thomas about this um, when we were talking about the budget. Um, he shared some information about another system that I'm fondly familiar with that has this um, position and that they work across many levels and many areas to support student engagement. Uh, and so I, I'll just offer that. So we do not we don't have this specific position but we have someone who has been working with our student council and our junior student council working on student leadership. So this would be an enhancement to probably a pos an area um, that we could do some improvement in getting our students involved and to monitor the data, how many students are involved um, and encouraging communication to get more students involved in school activities. So would this student act as a liaison also with um community events or extracurricular activities thrown like not public school sponsored community activities or recreation so like for instance it could the liaison work with the county government to institute pal center programs in schools if there's no pal center or something like that or is this strictly for only school sponsored activities i think as we're building it we should start with school sponsored but i will yield to Mr. Thomas if he wants to add any additional information. Again, we're, we're in discussion. We don't have a finalized job description as to why the budget gave a rough estimate of, of the range of salary, but this is something that we could actually utilize and work. And so it could be a possibility as we're looking at other duties uh, to get more students involved in extracurricular activities, but I would Madam Chair, I would yield to Mr. Thomas. Sure. I, one quick question, and I know you're chomping at the bit, Mr. Thomas, so I, I promise I'll turn it over. Um, Dr. Williams, did you mention where this position would reside within the organization? I did not. Okay. Would you mind? Do you have a, I do not. an idea? Not at this time. Not at this time. Thank you. Yep. Fair enough. Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Ms. Hen, and thank you, Ms. Rowe, for your questions. Thank you all. Thank you, Ms. Jones, for making this motion. Um, it's something that I've been very passionate about talking to Dr. Williams about for a while now, and a lot of this is coming directly from Montgomery County Public Schools and their position with here. The main reason for this is that we have one FTE right now in our Office of Family and Community Engagement, one program specialist, who on top of their duties as a program specialist is overseeing Baltimore County Student Councils and Baltimore County Junior Councils. But those, are, those can be exclusive groups at times. Not every student is a part of Baltimore County Student Councils and Baltimore County Junior Councils, and not every student can be a part of those groups. So this position is really trying to engage so many more. I mean, in Montgomery County, they have like 14 other region-wide groups that are dedicated to students organizing, students advocating before the board, students hosting volunteer events, and that's something that I envision in long term for BCPS to have. But in order to have that, we need the infrastructure, and this is the first step in creating that infrastructure and providing the support to our current program specialist who, quite frankly, is so overworked in, in the amount of uh, in the duties that she has right now. Um, so I am excited about this. I hope that this will pass. And just looking, listening back to our equity committee meeting we had on Thursday, you know, we talked about GSAs in our school, but not every school has a GSA, and that was a claim as to how we're being inclusive to LGBTQ plus students. So with a position like this, to look at all of our schools, to see what we have, what we don't have, to look at the data, it's, it's so necessary. And I think it would really improve our school system, and it's something that I hope that, uh, I wish that I had had when I was starting my student leadership journey. And I hope that uh, the students who come after me in BCPS and students who are in the school system now will be able to have to really enhance their educational experience and maybe make it to this spot right here one day. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments or questions? Dr. Hager, did you have a comment on um, this? It may have just motion? been answered. The person who oversees student council activities, is that a full-time or is that a portion of their job? Does that make sense? Or do they do other things, or is it just? 
they they do other things. That's yes. it, yeah. No, I, I really like this idea personally, and I, I definitely support it. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Right. I just I I wanted to you know I don't have any objection really to this. Um, I just want to clarify, and I think uh, Mr. Thomas, you, you you clarified it somewhat. This position is focused on basically system wide type activities because. My understanding is there's a tremendous number of extracurriculars. You've got sports, music, academic, you know, type curricular, um, extracurricular activities at all sorts of schools. But what I'm hearing about this is, this is kind of an overarching, like when you talk, because you keep talking about councils, right, that are across the, the system. I just want to make sure we're clear as to what, what we're focused on here, because I would, I believe that at every school, there are different people assigned to provide support for extracurriculars, and I, I, I don't want to get confused. I want to be very clear as to what we're talking about. Mr. Thomas, did you want to? Yeah, I can respond, of course. So I think it, uh, it could be a combination of both in this position. I mean, having those system-wide groups, trying to foster and create those, while also being able to support the EDAs we have in our school, the ED, the student, the staff members of the EDAs in our school system who are, are having events, making sure that we are having our extracurricular activities in our schools kind of more robust and enhancing them all together. So I think it's a combination of both. And I think that's something that Dr. Williams would have the flexibility to be able to determine when he's creating the position description for this and seeking out candidates to fill this position. Um, yeah, does that answer your question fully? It does, thank you. I would, I would kind of leave it to uh, Dr. Williams um, you know, this, this position sounds like, you know, we could, we could definitely use it, right? We could definitely use more people in all sorts of places. Um, and we want our children to grow and have lots of opportunity to do things. So I don't have a problem with this addition whatsoever. I just want to make sure that we're clear because I know that at the schoolhouse, that's where all the real work happens. And that's where all the kids are and the students, and they're focused on their activities there. I do like the, the ability to go outside of that and go across the system. Um, and I just, it sounds like that's exactly what this is focused, cross-system work, extracurricular-wise. Is that yes. your understanding, Dr. Williams? That is my understanding. You can liken it to we have an athletic director at our schools, and you have an athletic coordinator. Go. So. Right. So it is to look at not only individual schools, but across the system. Those are the conversation I had with Mr. Thomas. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn, for your questions. I had similar ones and also wanted to, to ask about that. There are two needs that um, I support this motion and, and thank you um, to those that brought it up, Mr. Thomas, Ms. Joes. Um, the two needs that come to mind, one, when schools closed, when COVID hit, I was um, very interested in the con continuity of extracurriculars, which seemed to be as a sore spot and something that we struggled with for lack of resources to ensure that that happened. And in, in trying to maintain that continuity um, for students remotely to continue with their extracurriculars, and we had resources for athletics, but we didn't have to seem to have the same level of support for other extracurriculars. The second being um, support at the school level, just on various needs, whether it be technical support for robotics or STEM clubs or whatever the case may be, to have that liaison back to the central office to be able to support um, those extracurricular coordinators is a, is a huge need and that, that we don't seem to be adequately filling right now. So I am in support of this motion. I hope that that's part of the vision um, for the position because and I don't know that one person can do it, but it's a start, so I will be supporting this motion. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. McMillian. Dr. Williams, I have two questions. Do middle school and high school advisors to student governments receive stipends? So I believe there's an EDA uh, for those positions. Okay, and did I hear you mention, is there a, a position right now that oversees all the middle school student governments and all the high school student governments? So a part of our program specialist job, uh, she is not only doing outreach, but she's also helping to coordinate 
the will or the, the actions of our junior council and our student council. And so um, actually she does a very good job with managing all the different responsibilities. So this would be enhancing. We're a large system with over 110,000 students and there's interest of our students to be involved. So we currently have someone that's a part of their job. I think this would enhance and provide the, the needed support. Thank you. You're welcome. Yep. Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Uh, just one last thing. I recently held a small town hall with regards to student activities and extracurricular activities. And this was one of the biggest things, having the infrastructure to create these things, having the support to have enhanced student governments, to have enhanced clubs in our schools, to have region-wide programming for students. And so this had wide support from the students in that town hall. And it's had wide support from all the other students that I've talked to, especially during my school visits to some of our schools that don't have access to as many extracurricular activities. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion before we call the vote? Okay. Do we have a roll call vote, Ms. Grover? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? I'm sorry. Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. I'd like for the record to reflect that I have an opinion vote in support of this motion. Thank you. Sure. Ms. Rowe, I believe you were next. I have a motion that I'm putting in chat. And if if I may, I'll read the motion and speak to it all at once. I move that the Board of Education require that the final county approved transportation allocated be utilized in whole or in part to begin a process to outsource all student transportation operations and services to a vendor who will take over our entire student transportation operation, provided the vendor will also absorb, comply with, and negotiate with BCPS bargaining units, absorb all employees at current pay and benefits or better, and take into account the absorption of all student transportation related assets, excluding real estate, as part of the agreement. There are multi mul Before you speak to it, we need a oh, second. I'm sorry. Uh, second for discussion. Okay, go ahead. There are multiple educational equity issues that our stakeholders have expressed an interest in pursuing. However, our decades long motion in the chat. Did, it is. You? We don't hang see on. it. Oh, hang on. I didn't put send. Okay. I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay. Can I speak now? Should I wait? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. There are multiple educational equity issues that our stakeholders have expressed an interest in pursuing. However, our decades long persistent inability to supply adequate transportation to all students prevents us from providing equitable magnet access, transportation for sports and after school activities, adjusting school start times, special education transportation for all eligible students, and supplying transportation capacity for more than 80% of eligible students, such that parents don't need to drive their children to school to get them there in time for breakfast. Additionally, there are multiple problems which have come out in meetings efficiency review and MDOT investigation of buses. 18% of our buses failed inspections. We have massive driver shortage of over 100 drivers and already utilized some piecemeal contract driver services for 18% of our routes. Our maintenance facilities are inadequate for vehicle maintenance and apparently some don't have running water. The ransomware attack has left Point us without adequate software such that we are literally rebuilding our transportation infrastructure. We don't even have people to answer the phone or communicate with schools and parents because the routing employees end up in buses driving on a routine basis. The situation is so bad that the best anyone could come up with was a stop arm contract that would give us the software we lost for free in exchange for a camera fine system attached to buses from a company the Montgomery County Inspector General found has a history of bribing public officials in order to get contracts. 
If we are this desperate in this underwater financially, then we will never catch up and we need the services of one of the many companies one can meet. Thank you. Point of clarification, Ms. Hen. Yeah, Ms. Rowe is speaking to her motion, Ms. Joes. If this is not a motion, I would like clarification from um, council. Ms. Ms. Rose, time just expired. Mm -hmm. She she made her motion, and then she was. I called on her to speak to her motion. I call for a point of clarification Next. from legal counsel. What is your point of clarification? That this is not a motion. This is that so was, long and rambling. And that was I would not like her motion. That was not her motion. Her she motion. She says I move. That is a motion. I move that the board of education require that the final approved transportation that's written in there so was she talking to her motion or was that the motion i'm not clear because her this motion. motion was not sent to us her motion neither was yours miss joe's her motion is in the chat and she spoke to it was that your comment or question or do you have an additional question or comment i do have an additional comp question. Please this whole motion looks like Ms. Rowe is intending to, um, I guess, abolish the transportation department for Baltimore County Public Schools. Is that the intent of this motion to um, get rid of the transportation department as a whole? Yes. Okay. And then this requires a vendor services. So how are we going to take, you know, this requires an RFP to go out if we were to abolish 800 buses that we have. Uh, and we have, I don't know, Dr. Williams, if you could clarify how many staff work in our transportation department. This is actually a huge fiscal impact, budget impact, policy impact, and equity impact if you're just doing something. Uh, it, to me, that's the equivalent of going into a uh, ICU and plugging off all of the um, life support services without knowing what, what is connected to what. Uh, this is not a motion that one would just spring up in the middle of the night at 9 o'clock without board having time to absorb it. This is something that you deliberate over, you you consult with the superintendent, give him the respect, and not just abolish a whole department. Dr. Williams, how many staff are employed by the transportation department? And we have asked me that we would also be, um, um, I don't know how many things we would be breaking in terms of policies and uh, agreements that we have. Uh, so I, I think this motion is mood point, it's out of order. Uh, but, you know, I'm going to leave it to other board members. And if Dr. Williams can clarify, I just think it's, it's visible. So, Mr. Oz, Dr. Williams will respond, but I'll call whether it's out of order or not. And the motion is on the floor. So board member has a second for discussion. So I will allow discussion on it. But I'll allow Dr. Williams to respond to your question regarding staff. Most appreciated. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Hardman. Uh, yes, we have approximately 1,200 uh, staff in the transportation area. Most of those are the support staff. We have uh, 32 professional staff. Thank you. So this motion would essentially just abolish 1,200 people out of their jobs. Great. Wow. Okay. Good job. Thank you. Ms. Scott, I believe you were next. Yes, thank you. Um, that's most concerning, um, what Ms. Jost just said, um, abolishing <laughs> 1,200 people out of their jobs. Um, this severely goes into, again, operations. And again, I just want to say these last minute motions that are sprung on the board to Madam be voted Chair, on. Madam Chair, I'd like to call a point of order decorum, please. Me, excuse me, point of order. I'm still speaking. These last minute motions that are sprung on the board without having been brought in advance so that we could have time to look at them that are cost impacting to the system, I believe are disrespectful. Madam Chair, and again, I, I would call point of order for decorum. Me. Excuse me, I am being interrupted as no other board members have been. I've been interrupted, I've been maligned, I'm the only black woman on this yeah. board, and I am the only one that has been interrupted and attacked continuously. Please there's, stop there's, doing a, that. there's a point of order before the chair. Ms. Scott, there's a point of order. Ms. Causey, please state your point of order. According to the Board of Education of Baltimore County Board Principals, I will center my Equity, it, my, I will center equity in my work as a board member, recognizing the need to acknowledge the system inequities that persist for historically underserved student populations. 
I will treat each board member respectfully, recognizing that we are being watched by students, staff, and our community, and have a responsibility to model Point appropriate order. behavior Point and conduct order. during Point our order. meetings. I will Point listen with an open mind and demonstrate flexibility and creativity in seeking solutions. I will listen to all board please members' please expressions please of order. ideas and opinions, including and especially Mr. those in opposition to mine, with an open well. mind and with the expectation that every board member holds rambling. the best of intentions with student success as the goal. And I raise a point, or, uh, point of order as point well. Of order. What does Mr. Ms. Mercedes do? He's our legal counsel. Excuse me. I raise Ms. Scott and Ms. Joes. Right, right now, Ms. it's appropriate for the chair to rule on the point of order. Okay, I raise a point of Thank order. Thank you, Mr. Mercedes. Well. Ms. Scott, I need to rule on Ms. Causey's point of order first, and then you may make yours. So I, up, I uphold Mrs. Causey's point of order. We will speak one at a time and follow our, our own board principles in doing so. Ms. Scott, would you like to make your point of order? I most certainly would, because I was the one that directed and led the House developing a civility code. And I find it it completely egregious that Ms. Causey is raising a point of order when she has been most disrespectful to me um, as, as a board member. And I would like to raise in our um, efficiency review, one of the things that was said was that this board is non-professional, does not listen to the viewpoints of others. And I would just like to say, I was just stating that it's important for us to be able to have these um, motions in advance so that we can properly review them, so that we can look at them and give them the appropriate amount of time that is necessary. And for Ms. Causey to disrespect me continually, as she has continued to do, and has been most egregious in that manner, is most abhorrent. And I find it completely disrespectful. So what I'm saying is, is and Mr. Call, Mr. Um, Mercedes, I would really like if you would place my time back because I was interrupted. What I was stating was that I find long, drawn-out motions that are cost-impacting, that board members have not had time to thoroughly review and look at, to be most egregious and to be most offensive, and to raise a point of order for clarification when I am trying to understand a motion that is cost-impacting and costing people jobs and causing money to the system that I have not had 24 hours in advance to review and to raise a point of order around that to be most offensive. And I am done. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Ms. Causey, I'm calling on, um, we're back to the, the issue on the, on the floor, Ms. Rowe's motion, and I'm calling on board members in order. So we're back to the, the order of business. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Offerman, you've been waiting patiently. Please go ahead, sir. Yes. Uh, this is a discussion of the budget for 2023, correct? Ms. Rowe, what, what will be the financial impact of this if it is passed? A vendor would have to be hired that would absorb our entire transportation department and all of our employees and bargaining unit agreements so that our entire student transportation operation would then be taken over by them. So that has a fiscal impact and the motion asks for whatever the final approved budget is for the money that is allocated to transportation to be used in whole or part to begin that process. So you're not, so you have no actual number, correct? Of, of, of what this is gonna cost us, is that correct? The number would have to be determined. Uh, no, I ask you, do you have a number, yes or no? Several vendors said that they uh, You have a number, yes or no? Mr. Sears, what is the cost of our current transportation department? I'm not asking them that. I'm asking you if you have a number. That's you, the you, number. You, you're proposing a budget, a budget change, okay? And all the other budget changes we have, we have to, if we're going to vote on something. Mr. Offerman, excuse me, you can address the chair if you have questions or concerns about Ms. Rose. I, 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 I just. Motion, please address I, them to the chair. I, I cannot support a motion that doesn't have a budget number on it. This is a budget discussion, okay? And uh, I think to do this now for anybody on this board would be very, very premature without, without, without an absolutely extensive study of the impact on all kinds of factors involved. That's just my opinion, thank you. Thank you. 
And let's see. I believe Mr. Thomas had a comment or question next. Thank you. Yes. So, Ms. Joe's, I'm oh, sorry, Ms. Rowe. Um, oh, sorry, Ms. Hen. Can, can Ms. Rowe please explain, you know, what is the intent behind this? Like, just in, in plain information, because I'm really having a hard time understanding with the, reading all the documents and her explanations. Could just like plainly explain what the intent of this is. Thank you. Ms. Rowe, would you please summarize the your motion? The intent is to completely outsource our transportation department, which has been proven through other school systems to be more cost effective and more operationally effective. And as our operations couldn't possibly be further in the toilet, I don't see how it could get worse by doing this. Okay, and have you reached out to staff to discuss this, Dr. Grimm, Dr. Williams, or any staff members in discussion about this motion? No. Oh, okay, then I, this is, I, I, I would give Mr. Offerman pretty premature. I think like there needs to be more information conducted. We need to know more. We don't even know if there's gonna be a vendor available to purchase everything. We, have, we don't have any information with this. So I'm not gonna support this. And I, I hope, I mean, I, I don't even know what the impact of outsourcing is. I don't know if that would be beneficial really in, in terms of our budget, but there's so many unanswered questions. So I would love to you know, have more information, uh, maybe for the next school year budget, so this could be brought up again or, or discussed. I just think there's so much information lacking before we can make this big of a decision. So uh, I don't support this, and I will be stating in my opinion vote that I do not support this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. And then Mrs. Colsey. Thank you. Um, Although I applaud Ms. Rowe's attempt to um, address the transportation issues that we've had uh, via the budget process, um, I cannot support this um, motion at this point in time. Um, so I just wanted to put that on the record. Uh, I do agree that there's gonna be substantial work associated with trying to do something like this. Um, and. I would like to move the question. Okay. Is there a second? Second. No seconds no required. Second. Thank you. Sure. You do need a second. Okay. Thank you. I'll second. Second Hager. Thank you, Dr. Hager. Um, it's not debatable, so may we have a roll call vote? Ms. Rowe? No. Ms. Causey? No. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. This is moving the question. Moving the question. Moving the question. Moving the question. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Sorry. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? No. I would like my opinion vote to read. Um, the favor is seven, so it did not pass. Okay. Eight are required to move the question, so it did not pass. So debate will continue. Ms. Hen? Mm, yes. I would like my opinion and vote to reflect that I was still going to vote in support in that. I was going to vote yes. Thank you. To moving the question. To the moving the question. Yes. Thank okay. you. Um, Mrs. Causey was next. Come on. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to reread the first part of the motion. I move that the Board of Education require that the final county approved transportation allocation be utilized in whole or in part to begin a process to outsource all student transportation operations and services to a vendor who will take over our entire student transportation operation. Then I'm gonna scroll down and read it, uh, speak to that. If we are this desperate in this underwater financially, then we will never catch up and we need the services of one of the many companies uh, one can meet at any National School Board Association conference capable of taking over our entire operations at our current or similar costs without any penalty to current staff as they would become employees of that company. They would also upgrade all the transportation infrastructure they take over. It's time to do what Howard County and uh, other counties are doing and admit we need to focus on the core mission of academic achievement and stop spinning our wheels literally in the mud over something we are really uh, not effective at and that can cost effectively be outsourced. This would also free up a significant amount of HR hours, which the efficiency review also said we don't have enough staff hours to fulfill those needs. Let's outsource all student transportation and let student transportation experts handle student transportation so we can focus on education. And I would just point out that in 2015, the Office of Legislative Audits had a finding that the transportation uh, department had not utilized routing software. In 2020, the Office of Legislative Audit had the repeat finding. And we've heard recently 
that uh, we still don't have routing software that's effectively placed. So while that seems like a, a, a very bold move, it actually can be incremental. Um, and there are other school districts that do that. And I think it's important that we focus on the education, the things that we do well that we need to do better. Um, and I, um, so I'll be supporting it, but I would um, think we might be open to a motion to amend it to a certain dollar amount. Thank you. Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Uh, I think that we should definitely look into outsourcing our, our transportation department, definitely look into this, but I don't think it should be in the budget. I think if we at the next board meeting can make a motion to have a study conducted on this or a presentation on this matter, that would be great. I would support that. But I, again, this is, our, this is our, our, our operating budget for right now, and there's just not enough information. Also, consider, talking about routing software, I mean, going back to the conversation we had about the previous contract, there, there are things that we could have done about that now. So again, not going to support this, and I hope that we can continue this conversation, because I, I do think it's a conversation we should be having. And I, I, but I don't necessarily know if I'm in support of it just yet. So thank you. Thank you. Dr. Williams? Just want to bring to the board's attention, if you look on page 216, you will see under business services the number of professional staff and support staff, and it may answer your question. It will answer your question about the number of FTEs. It will answer the number of the amount that we pay. I will also caution the board, it is March. We have summer school. We have activities that happen in June and July. <clears throat> and think about what you're asking with a quick turnaround to, to transport students that will continue during the summer. Um, this, this motion, I will voice my opinion. I'm very concerned about this motion. I'm very concerned about what we've done with our bus drivers and trying to secure additional bus drivers and paying them extra, giving them a retention bonus, looking at recruitment, and then to go outsource all of them, I think that message, there's a message that you're providing to our bus drivers and everyone who's working with transportation. Mrs. Hen? Yes, Mr. Uh, if, if I might just add, uh, w without having poured over the uh, collective bargaining agreement that with the uh, applicable employees here, uh, I think I could safely go out on a limb and say that there would likely be some provisions in it that would uh, make it very difficult for the board to enforce uh, going forward with something like this if the board voted to do so. Given the current agreements. Thank you. So, Ms. Joes. Thank you. Um, if this is something this board would choose to do, the proper thing if people had you know, professional experience would be to go to the superintendent, call for a study on implementation, impacts, cost efficiency before we make such a huge decision. We had an opportunity to get a zero dollar contract between Baltimore County Police Department and Baltimore County government to get routing software. This board rejected it. This is going into operations. This will be used as an example by other school system boards on what not to do. And what's to say that this board will not reject the vendor that comes in, besides the fact that we will be breaking all kinds of um, negotiating bargaining units and getting 1,200 people out of a job and dismantling the entire transportation department and setting forth uh, into motion uh, possibly a, a disaster in the making. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Scott? Yes, thank you, Ms. Hen. Um, it's concerning that we would be doing something that would be employee impacting, um, taking jobs away <laughs> from hardworking BCPS employees is, is, is very concerning. Um, the, this motion is cost impacting to the system. And also, I have to keep saying it, it goes into operations, which in our um, 
our public works operational efficiency review, it was stated that the board goes into operations, which we should not be doing. And um, also, lastly, I would say it's also cost impacting. So for this and many other reasons, I will not be supporting it. And I think it's of concern that this was not sent to us in advance so it could be properly vetted and reviewed. And I'm seeing a pattern here that we are having mo uh, motion upon motion just sprung on us at the last minute that are cost impacting, employee impacting, that we are not given the proper amount of time to properly review and vet. And that's most concerning. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments on this motion before we vote? Mr. McMillian. Is transportation broken? I think it is. Uh, however, I think that transportation leadership is doing an outstanding job of trying to fix it. We're the 25th largest school system in the country. We transport somewhere between, I think it's 75 and 80,000 students a day. Uh, a smaller school system that has 10 or 20 or 30,000 students, that might be, this, this might be really functional for them. But a system our size, I can't, I'm, I'd, I'm really curious out of 25 school systems, 24 above us, how many actually farm out all the contract out all their transportation? Uh, I just, this is a mega, mega, mega operation and I just, I, I just can't, I, I can't support this as it is now, and I'd, I'd like to see some more research and see a, maybe a presentation on this topic. I'm not saying we don't discuss it, but I just think that I can't support this presently. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to comment on this as well. I, I agree with Mr. McMillian in that we've got real issues. I, I think, I don't know that there's anyone on this board that would disagree with that statement, um, and I hope that those listening hear that, that this board is very concerned about our ability to deliver um, our students safely, reliably, efficiently, um, that that's the message that we take away no matter how this vote goes and that we have to address those. Um, I would like to see the experts brought in, not to take over transportation, but to tell us how we can improve, seriously improve, because we, we need to know and have the wisdom to know when to ask for help. And I think this discussion here tonight is what more proof do we need to say we need help? And I would support a study. I would support bringing in experts, not to outsource, but to say, here's, how, here's what you can do better and differently. And for the, this board to provide funding to be able to do that, to bring in experts to say, here's what we can do to help you. And board, here's what they need because we all want to provide what we need to be able to do this better. So I'll leave it at that. Um, with that, Ms. Gover, may we have a roll call vote on the motion? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? No. Ms. Jose? Ms. Jose? No. Mr. McMillian? No. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Scott? No. Dr. Hager? No. Mr. Kuhn? No. Ms. Hen? No. Thank you. Thank you. The motion fails. Ms. Hen? Mr. Thomas? Yes. Um, I would like my opinion vote in the, for the record to be noted as no. Okay. You got Thank, it. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Hager? Um, I also have a motion. I sent it two weeks ago, um, and we decided to postpone it to this meeting. Um, I moved to add to the budget one, a $1,000 stipend for one teacher or staff member per school to lead their school-level wellness team, also known as a wellness liaison, in support of policy 5470, which is our wellness policy, which states that each principal shall ensure their school complies with the wellness policy by appointing a wellness liaison. Second, Ms. Causey. Thank you. Would you like to speak to your motion? Um, sure, I sent some rationale by, um, by email, but basically wellness policies have been required by the federal government since 2006. And um, specifically, there's a big focus on the implementation of these wellness policies. And our 2021 triennial assessment, which was due to the USDA, we actually said that we would plan for every school to have a wellness liaison. 
And so this is essentially an unfunded mandate right now. Teachers are not paid for this position. It's not, it's not specified in the TABCO um, list of uh, ways that teachers are paid for extracurricular activities. But it is a best practice, and I believe that it's not fair to ask school teachers or other staff to take on an unfunded mandate. And so the $1,000 essentially aligns with the lowest possible TABCO scale for, um, for clubs or coaches. I would eventually love to see this included in, as an actual TABCO uh, club that's um, sp specified in the agreement. And in my email, I included Dr. or Mr. Sargent that um, uh, different ways that we could potentially use the funds and the operating budget to pay for it. Okay? Thank you. Mrs. Causey? Thank you. I'm really glad that this um, motion was made. I want to point out that in February of 2019, the board voted to approve 15 minutes extra a day uh, to recess for all elementary students, um, but we were uh, did not get the funding for the 15 minutes uh, that year, so that, um, that um, <clears throat> did not get implemented. Uh, but what we know is that our students do need uh, more focus on their health, well-roundedness. I would also like to add that the in that same uh, BCPS school day task force recommendations was a recommendation to have uh, safe, healthy start times, uh, which is flipping the start times of the secondary schools to later and the elementary schools to earlier. Uh, that recommendation was not um, it was requested by staff that the board not approve that recommendation because transportation was a limiting factor. Uh, so perhaps one focus of these wellness uh, groups can be to really look at that, how can that be implemented for our students uh, because it's uh, well-researched and a lot of science behind that. Um, and the other issue is our students have um, really been in a hard spot with the pandemic and so wellness uh, is taking on a lot of meaning, uh, not just physical, but also mental, social, emotional. And so I think this is this motion is right on time for what our students need and what our system needs. Thank you. Ms. Joes. Thank you. Dr. William, or maybe that this question is to Dr. McComas. All of our schools currently do have uh, some kind of health, wellness, teachers, coordinators, because we do have uh, different programs, I believe, after school, uh, you know, running programs, or whether it's a chess club, whether it's robotics, whether it's um, uh, some kind of physical activity that's going on. So how is this any different? And I want to understand what does this differ from what we currently have in place? Um, Dr. Williams stepped out. Dr. McComas, do you want to? Um, Dr. Dr. Zarchin? Zarchin, it helps with the School Health Council, so. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Zarchin, if you could answer that. Do we, right. we have something in place already, and how is this supplementing it, or is it not? So we, we do not have a position with a stipend. Uh, the way this would help, uh, it would take our system-wide goals, uh, as mentioned earlier, for food, nutrition, physical activity, mental, uh, emotional health, and, and bring it down to the school level where you can work together at the school level to set goals, monitor, and evaluate programs. So that would be the difference. It's, it's somebody who would be responsible at the school level. So it would be one teacher in every school. Uh, would that person be coordinating with the therapist and counselor on site and the um, I'm just trying to understand how is $1,000. Wouldn't necessarily, I believe, as, as proposed, have to be a teacher, uh, but a staff member who would work with the school and then do work with the system-wide initiative. And if, may, may I add? Thank you. Sure. Uh, um, sure. Just to, to add to that, um, we have a wellness policy, and a lot of the layers of the, specifically the rule of the wellness policy includes school-level implementation. And really to do that well, having a point person at the school level who ensures that recess happens before lunch and kind of does all those different things that are in the policy is really, uh, again, an evidence-based practice that, that is really important and, and those folks should be compensated for their time. Thank you. Mr. Thomas? Thank you. Uh, does every school, oh wait, never mind. I think I answered my, oh wait, yeah. Does every school currently have a wellness liaison that's in action? Because I know the policy says that. So if not, do you know how many schools currently do have an active 
wellness liaison? I don't know offhand. Okay, that's okay, that's okay. Um, would this be in effect to all of our schools, like including our special schools as well, every single BCBS school, Dr. Hager? Okay. Yeah, the, the USDA triennial assessment requires 100% response rate about the activities that are happening within the school relative to the wellness policy. So every school in the system. Awesome. And how would this, I mean, would this be like the similar role as like a tech liaison in the school building? Um, I don't know if it's, is it a technology liaison. Do they currently have EDAs? Yes. They do have EDAs? Okay. So this, we wouldn't have an EDA for this, but this would just be a $1,000 stipend. And I mean, in the future, could this be negotiated to have an EDA for this? Okay, thank you. Well, I, I'm in support of this. I think this is great. And thank you, Dr. Hager, for bringing this forward and the board for this discussion. Um, uh, I, I'm super excited to see this hopefully pass. Thank you. Okay, any other comments, questions? Ms. Scott, I see you typing in the chat. Do, do you have a comment or question on the motion on the floor? Oh, uh, no, my comment would be that I appreciate uh, Dr. Hager sending it to us in advance so we actually had time to review it, mull it over, <laughs> and actually respond to it. Thank, Thank you. you. May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen. Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. Mr. Thomas? Yes. I would like my, the record to reflect my opinion vote in favor of this motion. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Board members, other comments? Discussion? Mr. Kuhn? Thing Ms. Scott was before. Chair Hen. Has his hand up, had his hand up before. Yeah. Ms. Scott entered her question. Ms. Scott will be next. Go ahead, Mr. Kuhn. Thank you. I have a fairly straightforward and simple motion that I'm now pasting into Teams for everyone to look at. All right, I move that the proposed FY23 budget is amended to include the following increases. In Department 001, Board of Education budget, is modified to increase contracted services to $300,000 and provide an additional $50,000 to other charges. Is there a second? Second, Ms. Causey. Thank you. If I can speak to my motion, please. Please go ahead, Mr. Kuhn. Thank you. So, um, this, the fiscal impact is $255,000, uh, and the purpose for the added uh, budget to, um, to our specific budget uh, stems from the Office of the Inspector General for Education's findings that we went over our budget in you know, the past, I believe, the last fiscal year and possibly this fiscal year. Um, we are about, the next board budget will be a transitional budget. We're gonna have all new members. They're gonna be deciding what they wanna do. Um, and uh, I wanna make sure that they have s enough funding so that they don't have to go back to the superintendent to ask for funding uh, in the future. And that it also has the $50,000 is specific for training so that uh, the board members can go to conferences, um, uh, go to training, uh, and we don't have to worry about the training budget outside of the board uh, being impacted. So it's, it's fairly straight and simple. Uh, so hopefully uh, this makes sense to everybody and we can quickly get to a vote so that we can move this along. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. And I have a question for staff. If this, if the board approves this motion and the board office um, or the board does not spend this additional allocation, can that be transferred just like any other um, in the bat yes. to yes. any other area? Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Joes? Yes, so my question may be to Ms. Gover. The board typically has in our budget, and I've seen this previously, we allocate X amount of dollars for training for board members between 50,000 50, to 70. I'm not sure that's a ballpark figure I remember. 
last year and the year before that, due to the pandemic, we did not expend that amount, but that went into other expenses, i.e. legal services due to our board meetings being long and other legal troubles we've had. So how is this 50,000 additional dollars? What is that going into? Because we already allocate that money every year for training, for our membership for May, NSBA, those are already allocated. And I don't know, Ms. Gober, you might be, I don't want to put you in a spot, but I don't see how, what that additional 50K is going to go to. Is that going to go to legal if we don't use that for training? As the previous chair and vice chair have done, is that additional money just got usurped by legal services and we didn't have any training. Mm -hmm. So my concern is just adding money is not going to help. We really need to have it allocated based on uh, properly, efficiently doing things. If board members don't use that training, where does that money go? Ms. Joseph, I'm going to ask Ms. Mr. Kuhn to respond to you since it's his motion. Thanks. Those are great questions. Um, so my understanding, and and um, uh, Mr. Tantliff and Mr. Sarris can probably answer this, um, my my reasoning for putting the $50,000 in there for training and conferences, what have you, um, is because my understanding is now all the training is in a central pot and then we have to ask for a transfer of sorts um, to the board budget and I was trying to just shortcut that. That is my goal with adding the $50,000. So is that, could you please speak to, like, is it, isn't the training and stuff all centralized at this point? Um, there is a large central training budget, but each office also has the ability to fund, you know, training. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, we reduced everyone's travel and conference budget a couple of years ago to fund the 1% COLA. Um, so. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I would also suggest, uh, Ms. Joes, that, um, like I said, it's a transitional year. There are going to be a lot of new members. Um, on December 4th, I will, I will not be here. I can promise everyone that I will not be here going forward um, on this board. Um, but I believe there are going to be a lot of new members, and that will increase the need uh, for more services and training. So I just want to make it available, and I also want to make sure that the next board is not put into an embarrassing spot where they go over the budget. So I'm providing the funding. Um, and that's it. Thanks. Thank so, you. Mr. Kuhn, Ms. if you could clarify, we do have a board budget that Ms. Gover works with board offices every year, and that comes to the board. I don't know if board members pay attention to it or not, but I do since I'm a numbers person. And that numbers have struck in my head that every year for the past three, four years, we have 50000 to $70,000 allocated for training. We have uh, some X amount of dollars $24,000 for May, uh, what is it, membership, NSBA. We have money allocated for food. We do have our own budget, and it is an issue that this board has been very ineffective and inefficient in using that dollars. Fiscal mismanagement is what I would call. But the training, what we didn't use the past two years, did not go back into the pot, so to say. It actually got used into other expenses. Mr. Kuhn, would you please respond? Um, okay. Um, to the need for your motion. Yes, I, I believe that the motion pretty much speaks for itself. I'm trying to increase the amount because it's going to be a transitional year. Um, you know, for example, people are going to be going to San Diego for a conference, I believe, in April. Um, and that's expensive. And if every member went, you know, you would spend you know, twenty to thirty thousand dollars just for one conference. So, um, I do understand uh, your point, Ms. Joes, uh, and I'm just trying to give the next board leeway. And those funds can be moved in a bat, as Mr. Tantliff explained. Thank you. Thank you. And I have a point um, before Mr. Thomas is next with a question, um, but of governance, and that is the bat is the is under the jurisdiction of the superintendent. Um, the board has um, previously not been involved in that process. And when the OIGE found that the board had exceeded our, bud our board office budget, um, there was an opportunity when that could have been corrected through the BAT process. 
the board was not involved in that process. So I will be supporting this motion because I think of it as an insurance policy for us that we are providing what we think we may need, not we may need, but what the future board may need because they will be coming on during the next fiscal year. And we need to be looking out for them. And we certainly don't want to make repeat the same mistakes that that we we made. So um, I will be supporting this motion for that reason. Um, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Ms. Han. Um, I guess, so the cost would be $255,000, is that correct? Okay. So with this money, could this be used instead of just like contract fees or anything? Could we use some of that money to have an additional FTE, an additional senior executive assistant? Because we know that uh, Let's go back here works incredibly hard for all the things that we do. And I just think, I, I think one of the best ways we could use funds toward the board's budget to what we can do is actually having another person to assist us in our duties as board members and, and having another person who is, who is here for the board of education and, and independent to the board of education for our activities. So uh, that's something that I would like to see, not necessarily just money allocated towards uh, conference fees because as we know, not all board members are participating in the conferences. And there's, I mean, less than half of us at some of our conferences. So that's something that I would really love to see is having another FTE. I can't make motions or amendments on that matter, so throwing that out there if anyone wants to take that. So that's what I would like to see is another FTE to support the work of our senior executive assistant and to help the work of the Board of Education. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Rowe? So this is budget discussion. And every department in the school system submits requests for the amount of money that they want. And yet somehow, last year, the year before, whatever, this board managed to submit requests that did not adequately cover our expenditures because we had a legal services line item of zero dollars <laughs> in our budget. And I would just like to point out to everyone here, this board does in fact have an office of the treasurer. And I would like the treasurer to take responsibility for answering how the board's budget is not going to come up negative because we have zero funds for line items. The treasurer is Dr. Williams. <laughs> So, um, I'm sorry, Ms. Ms. Rowe, I was in another place. We will continue as reported in the efficiency review. <clears throat> we will provide the board a status of the budget on a regular basis, particularly to the board leadership, as well as to the board as we've done before. So anything, I'm talking about our related, board's budget. Any, that's what I'm talking about. Okay. Let me finish, please, thank you. Anything related to the legal services, we will continue to alert the board in terms of where we are with those legal fees. So are we going to have a board line item for legal fees in our board operating budget? Or are we gonna to continue to have the OIGE say that you overspent because your line item was zero, which is unrealistically low, considering just doing a superintendent search alone cost $160,000. And the last time we had to do one, the previous board tried to stop us from doing it by not allocating the money, which we obviously spent anyway, and then got dinged by the OIGE. Could we maybe not do that again and stop dancing around what we're really talking about here? Point of order, Thank you, Ms. Um, Ms. Penn. I'm not yes. exactly what is sure. Your, uh, sure. What is your point of order, Ms. Scott? Yeah, it seems that the um, board member, uh, Ms. Rowe, is actually attacking the treasurer, Dr. Williams, and, I'm, I'm, and is not being very clear. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, Ms. Rowe, if you could watch your tone. I apologize. Please. I'm frustrated because it seems no one wants to have the actual conversation. It was not my intent to attack Dr. Williams. I would just like for someone to recognize that we can't have a legal services line item of zero dollars and not overspend. So. Well, let me respond. Since you posed the question, I didn't hear the motion. I asked Chair Hen, wasn't that the motion to add more funds to the budget? And I will restate the motion. Okay. So the motion is for contracted services of which um, legal services could be um, drawn from that and the motion does a lot that there is an amount in the um, 
current fiscal year 23 budget that we are considering for legal services, which is based on the anticipated expenditures. Thank you. And again, I apologize for expressing my frustration. Thank you. Um, I believe Dr. Hager had the next question. You, you can you can go past. Have you been okay? Um, and Ms. Joes, did you you asked your clarification, or do you have a point of clarification? Yes, I, have, I can go after Dr. Hager unless she's done. Okay. Um, Ms. Joes, I'm sorry, you you've exceeded your time. Um, Ms. Ms. Cosier or Ms. Mack, which one of you was first? Ms. Mack, go ahead, Ms. Mack. I'd like to call the question. Okay. Is there a second? Second, Hager. Thank you. Um, may we have a roll call vote on calling the question? Ms. Ra? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Q? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. The motion carries. Ms. Hen? We'll now have, yes. I'd like the record to reflect that I would vote in support. Thank you. Okay. Um, we'll now have a roll call vote on the motion. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jose? No. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Abstain. Ms. Scott? No. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. The motion carries. Ms. Hen? Thank you. Ms. I'd like the record to reflect an opinion vote in support. Thank you. Okay. So were there any other outstanding um, questions not on the motion on the floor that anyone indicated? Yes. In Ms. Hen, I Ms. Scott? A, yes. Um, I move that the board adopt the superintendent's fiscal year 23 operating budget. Second. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Would you like to speak to your motion? I believe it's um, self-evident. Okay, Ms. Joes, would you like to speak to your second? No, thank you. Madam Chair, could the motion be restated, please? Ms. Scott, would you please restate your motion and would you consider Certainly. adding as amended? I wasn't amend. Oh, why well, you're saying because of the motions that were made tonight and passed? Yes. Okay, so I move that the board adopt the superintendent's fiscal year 23 operating budget as amended. Thank you. And Ms. Joes, do you um, second that? Second, yes. Thank you. Mrs. Causey? Uh, Madam Chair, I'm not in favor of that at this time. There were questions that I sent in that I wanted to ask staff about and a proposed motion uh, for uh, clarification of the SRO, personal uh, professional development funding, as well as another uh, motion that I already submitted. Okay, would you like to ask your, your question at this time? So my question is for board members to not support this at this time so that we can continue discussion briefly and then vote on it at a later time. What would Ms. Mrs. Clausey's motion be to? Okay. And then could the board reconsider that motion again in the same session a new motion could be made or could a new motion could the same motion be reconsidered if, if the board wants to entertain other other motions that may come up it should uh, vote nay on its second motion okay thank you i move to postpone this motion pending further questions and motions amendments to table it move to table until later in this meeting after Ms. Cosie's motions have been made okay second 
Okay. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion? The motion was to table the motion on the floor. Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to. Oh, I can't vote on this, but I would vote in support of this just because this is our last work session on the budget. So I think it's important that all board members have the opportunity to discuss something. And if there's an, a motion, an amendment coming forward, I'd like to hear the amendment. Thank you. Okay. I agree since board members um, have motions and questions that, that remain to be asked, I believe they should be um, heard and have the opportunity. So, Mr. Offerman. Uh, I just want to be clear that the motion does not end when uh, after Ms. Causey makes her, her her comments or motions, correct? Correct. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mercedes. Excuse me, Ms. Hen, I'm sorry. Could you repeat what Mr. Bersetti said? I apologize. Um, I couldn't hear him. Um, Ms. Howie is going to advise us on the appropriateness of tabling the motion on the floor. So, members of the board, if you want to lay a motion on the table, that is a proper motion. That is only when you have something that is more pressing that, is, that you want to deal with at this moment. You have a motion that has been... I believe your postponement, your motion to postpone was not seconded. So that hasn't been discussed. It correct? was. It was seconded. So there's a motion to postpone on the table. Um, I didn't hear to when you wanted to postpone it. Oh, until um, after motions and questions regarding the budget had been all heard. So, so today, later. So with respect to the motion to lay on the table, I do not believe that that is in order at this time. With respect to the motion to postpone at a definite time, the motion to postpone um, takes precedence over the main motion. So you can deal with the motion to postpone at this time. That can be debated. And you can then process the motion to postpone. But it would, you'd have to clarify exactly when you wanted to postpone it till. So the motion to postpone is until a definite time. I'm sorry. Is that clear, members of the board? Yes. Clear as muddy water. I mean, time, time to, to like. You can. Twenty minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Twenty minutes. Okay. Well, can we can we say postpone until all motions have been heard tonight? The intent is that that motion be the last one we do, but Ms. Causey stated she has motions still that she didn't get to say so the other thing that the board can do is simply vote down the motion to adopt the budget and then deal with additional motions so then do we get into reconsideration of a something already decided rules you don't have to, you, you wouldn't have to reconsider you just renew the motion if I you see. want you can't if you want to vote to reconsider then it would have to be moved by the prevailing side okay so What's the procedure for renewing a motion once we get to that part? Again, you can simply make that motion again at that point. Okay, thank you. Ms. Rowe, I'd like to hear from board members to see what we still have to process during this agenda item to um, determine a time on which to move to postpone an approximate time and then limit discussion on this agenda item to that time at which point we can consider the motion to adopt the budget. I have no so. further motions for the budget. Okay. Does anyone other than Ms. Causey have any further motions for the budget at this time? Ms. Mack, you have one. Mrs. Causey, how many do you have? Uh, I believe two or three, depending on staff comment. Does anyone else have any further motions? Hearing none, Ms. Ms. Rowe, would you like to make your motion to postpone until what time would you suggest? If every board member uses two minutes for each motion, I, I don't know. How long does it take us to get through a motion? 11 <laughs> Let's vote the time. We need a, we need a definitive time. versus postpone. 
Okay. I mean, we've got four motions, so theoretically two hours. You would need a unanimous consent to uh, withdraw the motion to postpone to entertain this draft. So you could do one or the other. Go with the postpone or go with the original motion made by Ms. Johnson. I think we could we consider it earlier. Ms. Joe's suggested midnight. If we can renew it, then I think we should get rid of the postponement because we don't know what time to make it to. Okay. Do we have to vote and process the postponement? Mr. Mercedes, so we have to vote and process the postponement? If that's allowed, I will, sure. You can withdraw as long as the second is withdrawn. I'm not actually sure it was ever seconded for we, the postponement. We, we need unanimous consent. consent to withdraw the motion to postpone. Unanimous consent. Okay. Okay. All in favor, does anyone object to withdrawing the motion to postpone? No objections? It's, okay. it's withdrawn. All right. So now we can now process we can. the Ms. Scott's motion and if the uh, board wants to vote it down so that other motions can be heard from Ms. Scott and Ms. Mack, then voting down the motion on the table is the way to proceed. Okay. So now we will process the Ms. Scott's motion and a, a no vote will allow other motions to proceed. <clears throat> and we will, um, the plan will then be to reconsider this after other motions are heard. Ms. Gover, may we have a roll call vote? This is to um, adopt Ms. to Ms. Scott's motion. Ms. Rowe? No. Ms. Causey? No. Ms. Mack? No. Ms. Jose? Yes. Mr. McMillian? No. Mr. Offerman? Abstain. Ms. Scott? Yes. Dr. Hager? No. Mr. Kuhn? No. Ms. Hen? No. Thank you. The motion fails. Ms. Mr. Hen, Thomas? I'd like the record to reflect that I would vote no. Thank you. If given the opportunity. Okay. So we will continue now um, with Mrs. Causey's motion, I believe. Thank you. Um, if I could have staff refer to a question sent in about the SRO professional training and respond to the last, uh, second or last statement about funding could be allocated from fiscal year 2022 if approval. Could you unpack that for the board, please? Um, several components of the conference will need to be paid for this year. Travel arrangements and the conference fee itself, probably about two thirds of the total $256,000 expense. So Dr. Williams would fund that from uh, central uh, dollars that we have available to support travel. Could I just correct that to $156,000? Certainly. I think, Mr. Tantle, if you said two hundred fifty. Yes, yeah, sorry, $156,000. So is approval required by the board tonight to make sure that that happens? Uh, not the 2022 component. If you want to add the $156,000 to the 2023 budget, which would then fund um, the hotel and per diem for this summer and then next year. So in summer of 23 would fund the same uh, 2022 expenses we're talking about, the conference registration and um, flight arrangements that would keep it in the budget in perpetuity in, in essence. So we would self-fund the first chunk of it that's due right now. Then it, you already approved last board meeting to add the $156,000 to the 2023 budget, which will complete the funding this summer and support the funding for next summer that has to be done during the fiscal year ahead of time. If I could ask you to read the answers to number 45. Everyone. 
the first one says about approval. Mrs. Kazi, what's the question? The information is not clear. Forty-five. We. And I would like it to be made clear without me using all my time. So if I'm responding to staff, I don't think that should be my time. The board's motion would cover the FY 2023 portion per diem and hotel of the July 2022 conference and the registration and travel for the July 2023 conference. The FY 2022 expenses associated with the July 2022 conference would be funded from outside of the Office of School Safety's budget. It also says, when will the SROs receive communication that this has been approved? Are you able to pre-authorize? Are SROs responsible for their own reservations and travel arrangements? And it says, SROs would receive a travel request form as soon as approval is received to move forward. The Department of School Safety handles registration and making all travel arrangements. So what approval is required? Is it approval by this board? Because I don't want to leave this meeting. No, it's internal. Not clear and get another call from one of our hardworking SROs about this issue, which should not have been an issue. So Ms. Causey, if an SRO calls you, please direct them to this office or Ms. April Lewis' office, number one. There are some pretty clear number reasons me, listed in the respond. public works recommendation. Ms. Cossie, Mrs. Cossie, excuse let, me. Mrs. Causey, Dr. Williams is speaking. Would you like for me to respond at this time? So as I was saying, we will, the approval is internal if we're looking at what Mr. Tanliff said. There are funds that need to happen now and funds that need to happen in the new fiscal year. <clears throat> so at this point, we have talked about supporting the SRO conference, and we will be notifying the appropriate staff to, in terms of planning those next steps. So we've had a discussion about this before. I thought that response was clear. We're ready to move forward in providing that opportunity for our SROs. So thank you then. Why does the last statement there say the superintendent has been working with the county executive on this issue and the CE may provide additional funding? That's what the conversation has been at the last board meeting. And what I've referenced, I would reach out to the CE to ask for additional support regarding this conference for the SROs. And if he says no, then we're then you'll find money for it. That was the response from the budget office, correct. Okay, so I don't need to make a motion tonight about making sure that the SROs can get there. Budgetarily, this is taken care of. Okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> earlier, I sent by email. Um, can probably do it from memory, but you all have it in your, here we go. Um, I move that an FTE and $149,000, including fringes, be allocated from the current proposed operating fiscal year 2023 budget and be allocated to reinstate the uh, board's ombudsman position reporting to the board. There's Second. already, oh, thank you. There is already a prior job description and the amount came from staff from a prior budget cycle. May I speak to my motion, Madam Chair? Once there's a second, would you please put it in the chat? I did second, second. Well, Ms. Harwood, I didn't hear your second, so I need to acknowledge you. Would you please put your motion in the chat? Um, I don't have access to the chat, but I did email it to everyone, including our executive assistant, hardworking. Please, yeah, go ahead and speak to your motion. And Thank you. Ms. Harwood, you have it. Thank you. As was pointed out earlier by a colleague board member, uh, we have one uh, executive assistant to support 12 board members and all of the work that's required. Uh, Public Works has recommended many improvements for the board, uh, for the operations, for governance, uh, for professional development. 
and recommendations for improvement in communications with community. Uh, as I said, there's only one senior executive assistant, and we also have been receiving requests from our area education advisory councils. Uh, they've been requesting support to engage community, um, which would be right in the uh, sweet spot of this position. Also, we have 11 board members who do not have a program specialist to help with town halls uh, and any of those sorts of things. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done, um, and we hear it constantly that the board is, uh, needs to be more responsive, needs to be more open, transparent. We have stakeholders that uh, routinely email us with concerns. Uh, there has not been a sufficient feedback loop, in my opinion. Um, and so uh, this would be very helpful. Thank you. Dr. Hager? And then Ms. Rowe. Okay, Ms. Rowe, you want to speak to your second? So we used to have an ombudsman. In fact, we were one of the first school systems to ever have an ombudsman. And then a bunch of other school systems decided to get ombudsmen. And then somewhere along the way, two superintendents ago, we decided we didn't need an ombudsman anymore. I can't imagine a school system the size of ours not having an ombudsman. So it's, it, it, it's fantastic that we could do this. Thank you. Dr. Hager? Um, I, I like this idea and I liked Mr. Kuhn's idea and I feel like there, there, there's a lot of overlap is my only concern. Um, I, we, we added $250,000 to our budget in my mind to address a lot of the same concerns and I, I just want to know how this would be different and maybe Ms. Causey can answer the question than what we are, have, have already passed. Okay. Mrs. Causey, would you like to address that? Certainly. So, um, this was a position before, as Ms. Rowe stated, um, and <clears throat> as we have seen during the pandemic, uh, that there is increasing levels of parent engagement, student engagement, stakeholder engagement, and the board has not been able to have any communication protocol uh, developed uh, with current resources. Um, and in Public Works, they've made several recommendations about uh, communication, and this is exactly what the position uh, facilitates. Additionally, we just voted this evening to uh, add a extracurricular activity um, liaison to the schools and this would be, could have similar things for the 12 board, or excuse me, 11 board members that don't have a program specialist uh, supporting their work uh, in terms of, you know, all of the different extracurricular things that board members do, maybe coordinating town halls, coordinating uh, different visits and things of that nature. So I think it's uh, beyond past due. Um, and <clears throat> again, it aligns with public works and it aligns with our policies for community engagement. Thank you. Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Well, I, I kind of suggested this earlier, so I, I, I am in favor of this. Um, so one of the concerns I have with our, I, I've looked at other school, not with this bill, one of the concerns I have in, in terms of operations general right now um, is I've looked at other school systems where they have entire staffs dedicated just to the Board of Education. And honestly, I feel like we're taking staff members away from the jobs that they have, the jobs in our school system when we're asking them for so many different things to do on, on behalf of us. You know, so I, I completely support this. And I think that we do need someone who is separate from our staff so that they can do the job that they're here to do, which is our students and our education system, and not have to necessarily always respond to the request of, of us board members. So I think this is a great addition. And I think that um, in working collaboration with our senior executive assistant, it would help this board be more productive. It would help the board maybe even create some better relationships. I think I discussed this in the past with you all, but to have someone who is not attached to the school system necessarily on um, being able to assist us in those matters. It definitely, I think, could help with a lot of a lot of the issues we have on this board. So I'm in support of this, and I am glad there was a motion made after I kind of threw that out there. <laughs> Thank you. Any other comments or questions, board members? Okay. Hearing none, may we have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Jost? Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Scott? No. Dr. Hanker? Abstain. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. The motion carries. Mr. Thomas? Thank you, Ms. Hen. I would like the record to reflect that I 
would vote in support of this. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Causey, did you have any additional? Thank you. Um, on January 11th, um, Dr. Williams provided this to the Board of Education. My understanding is that it has now been attached to board docs for January 11th. And I just wanted staff to explain um, the rationale on page yeah, one of three and two of three and three of three, <clears throat> what that means uh, fiscally in not implementing public works recommendations uh, to be done in fiscal year 23, but being pushed off to fiscal year 24. Ms. Quasi, could you um, clarify exactly where you're looking? We have the pages. Which lines are you uh, referring to? Uh, any of the lines that say hold dash fiscal year 24. Uh, those are initiatives. I think uh, Dr. Williams' feedback last time was uh, those are still being evaluated to be considered in the FY 2024 budget. What, what else would you care to know about that? So Public Works has said that it would be unwise and a disservice to our students if we delay implementation of these recommendations. Well, I'll just, uh, one comment is most of what's on this page is changing the seniority of existing positions. It's not adding or reducing positions, not that there isn't some of that, but for the most part, these are positions that are in place. Uh, their proposal is not to change the responsibilities. Their opinion was that some of the jobs should be more senior than they are now. There's also a number of organizational changes. Are you referring to the chapter eight section? It's chapter eight. I'm, I'm not sure what question I can answer, Ms. Causey. Well, I can't answer it. There's uh, all of these positions. But they're not creating positions. The positions on these pages almost in their entirety are changing seniority due to recommendations. Can you explain the fiscal impact? that is on uh, each of those pages. Uh, I, I don't understand your question, I'm sorry. The fiscal impact when and of doing what? I mean, Can you unpack I, I'm trying this three-page spreadsheet that has all question. kinds of numbers in red and it says hold? So this document, if I may, Mr. Tenley, this document was taking the recommendations from Public Works, going through all 759 pages and looking at the FTEs in which they were recommending additions, abolishment, reorganization. So what you see on these three pages are the actual costs or savings and actions that we looked at, I looked at, as, uh, as I presented the, uh, my budget in January. And so some of these are on hold for a reason to have further conversation about what that may mean for a particular department. And some were accepted and some decisions were made not to have, not to move forward. As you read the entire document, and I think Dr. Yarbrough can give me the percentage 
even Public Works said 70 or 80 percent of the recommendations would be followed. And again, it was their recommendations based on their time with us <clears throat> and getting feedback and looking at just our organization. So uh, we moved forward with what we felt was important at this time with major consideration as we look at FY24, particularly with some of those positions that were being changed. So the document shows the positions um, and it shows the actual costs if moving forward or as well as the actual savings if, if moving forward. And so what what is the bottom line for the fiscal impact savings savings delayed or cost incurred? So, Mr. Tanleaf, when we presented the budget we gave for Chapter 1, it was 1.7 1. 1. million. 1.7 million and a reduction of nine FTEs. Yes. And then we looked at our technology. We had some savings with our technology. Six and million dollars from existing contract reductions. And then what's listed here are some other positions where we're holding or to accept or um, one for an example, a recommendation, and Dr. McComas and I have had many conversations about combining mathematics and science to one coordinator, English and social studies. I felt that was not appropriate at this time for our system. So there had to be some decisions made. So this is giving you I guess a, a snapshot of those decisions per, pertaining to FTEs. And remember that the will be coming forward to the board to give the full package. You know, we have the division work group, the blueprint work group, and the stakeholder work group looking at the recommendations not affiliated with FTEs, talking about the work. And we'll be coming forward. March or April to give that update to the board as to where we are with those recommendations. Mrs. Cosey. I move that public works recommendations be implemented in fiscal year 23 as recommended. Unless the board has specifically approved the superintendent's recommendation to delay or modify. The proposed operating budget will be realigned to support those recommendations fiscal impact. Um, Dr. Hager, did you have a comment about Ms. Causey's? We need a second first, but I need to ask if Dr. Uh, no, Hager had a comment before the motion was made. No? Okay. So we need a second before we have discussion on, on the motion. Is there a second? I'll second for the sake of discussion. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Any discussion? Ms. Okay. Ms. Causey, would you like to speak to your, and then Mr. Thomas? Thank you. So the. Uh, BCPS operational efficiency review uh, was um, <clears throat> conducted along with the Baltimore County government, and they found through surveys and uh, community input uh, significant areas for improvement. Uh, these are um, professionals who have been involved in education. Um, they came highly regarded. And they have made specific recommendations in order for us to improve the education that we provide to our students and also to improve the morale of our employees because we need to have the staff. That's what we've seen this year. We need to have the staff to support our students. Uh, so there's a number of recommendations uh, that I have brought up at uh, different committee meetings um, that are not being addressed. The board has 12 um, recommendations just on the one of the first pages and there have not been resources allocated in order to get that done. So it, it, it needs to be done and um, I think that uh, the board needs to be bold and it needs to say are we going to have a lasting impact on the improvement of this entire system for our students as recommended by this professional organization. And not only did the findings that they had uh, you know, stand with the thousands of in, uh, employees and community members that provided input,
but it was very consistent with what this board uh, found through our community input process during the superintendent search. Um, so this is not just a one point of data, this is consistent data, and we have heard it from our staff and from our uh, key stakeholders that have come and talked to us about the issue of the culture, about the issue of uh, the structure, and we have some amazing, dedicated, and talented people. They need to be in the right place to get the work done. Thank you. Um, Mr. Thomas, did you have a comment on the motion? Yes, thank you. I, I just feel like this is a, a huge oversight into what Dr. Williams is, is doing and the, the conversations we've been having as boards with him and everything with that matter. I mean, a lot of these efficiency review recommendations have been implemented into the budget, and Dr. Williams, is that correct? Yes, based okay. on, so, so let me clarify. There are efficiencies in how we do our work and then there were savings around what this board shared and the feedback that the cabinet was too large. Right. So <clears throat> that wasn't just some work we could just do overnight. That, that took some time. So <clears throat> I, I, I just, yes, so to answer your, your point, but also, and I see Dr. Yarbrough is here, we've had these work groups to talk about the efficiency and how we do our work to talk about morale and climate, hence why we put forth a salary study, because that was one aspect. It's also other things dealing with work conditions, except training. So, so it's not just one thing. There's yeah. several things that we're looking at. Um, Dr. Yarbrough, anything you want to add? Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. William, you are correct in terms of how we've approached this work. Um, there were 197 recommendations in total that were provided to us. Approximately 150 of those went to the division work groups, the blueprint review team, as well as the multi-stakeholder work group. If you total up the number of people that are on those groups, you will see that we have more than 100 staff members represented. We have parents represented. We have all of the BCPS, Board of Education, stakeholder groups represented. We have all of our unions represented at each step of the way. And so one of the things that they had to do, the people who were closest to the work, had to unpack the specific recommendations. They brought in the context, the background, and then in alignment with what was recommended by Public Works, they had to make des decisions about whether or not they could implement as written, they could implement with specific modifications, or no, and the no was with the rationale to explain why this was not in alignment with our specific either strategic plan, board goals, or best with where we were for the system. And so what's happening in March when you have that update is you will see all of those recommendations. The recommendations, in addition to going to the web page now where you can see the action minutes, as well as the agendas that each group um, has worked through, what happens in the March report is you see by tier, you see the estimated timeline for implementation that they provided. The earliest implementation timeline, if I remember correctly, was from October to December. And that was tier one of the cabinet restructuring. Um, as Dr. Williams has stated, all of the recommendations from chapter one in terms of cabinet restructuring has taken place as recommended. Um, I believe it was the end of September or beginning of October when Dr. Williams identified the three key goals as we move through this process and that the savings, because public works, as you noted, gave $35 million worth of savings over five years. The commitment made by BCPS was to identify six to $7 million of savings within the first year. And in the proposed budget, you already see over $6 million. I believe it's $6 million with technology and $1.7 million in chapter one, as previously stated. And so um, in terms of the climate and morale plan, thank you for bringing that up because that has been a major area of focus, particularly with the impact of the pandemic. And so there were many steps that have been taken um, directly in alignment with the efficiency report. It was turned over to organizational effectiveness to lead. They led focus groups for non-represented staff 
to make sure that we had the voice and the input of staff members across Team BCPS, put that together with the surveys in the booklet, as well as the stakeholder survey results that we had to come up with a plan. We've been meeting monthly with our unions. Unions either met with all of their memberships or they had work groups where they gathered feedback from to identify what were their priorities that they wanted in a system-wide climate and morale plan. And that is the work that we've been doing every month while we meet, meet with them to really be laser focused on what are the needs of our staff members across all of our unions. Um, we also have made sure that this year in the interim, based on this information, we have focused on engagement, we focused on wellness, as well as recognition. Those things look like chat and chew with cabinet members. They look like the gift of time, which many members of this board have volunteered in. They look like, um, you know, uh, BCPS Connect sections, sessions for all of staff members to participate in based on their area of interest. It looks like a renewed focus with our employee wellness, um, EAP service, as well as the speaker series that really focused on mindfulness and best practices for staff members as they led and supported students during this difficult time. Um, the only other things I would add are the upcoming elements that you can expect in this comprehensive climate and morale plan in addition to what we're doing in the interim. We're not waiting for next year to implement. We immediately began implementation to let staff members know with your support how much we valued them, the additional half days that you provided for staff members to rest and recharge, the day off before the holiday break, the retention bonus that you provided. Um, but we're going to use the stakeholder save, uh, survey results, which will close soon. Those will be used as part of the SPP plans and the uh, office project um, progress plans under the direction of Dr. Williams, that the survey results will be shared with the stakeholders in the specific office or the stakeholders in the specific school. They will collaboratively identify and develop goals. We will provide support from the central office, whether that support is coaching, whether that support is resources that they need so they, they can move towards to, not only a system-wide plan where we're improving morale, but where we're improving morale and taking ownership for it at the school-based level or at the office level. So those are a few additional highlights that I wanted to provide in terms of where we are with savings right now, when you can expect an updated full report with all 197 recommendations, as well as um, how you can expect to see the climate and morale plan uh, show up in schools and offices and what we have done to date. Whoa, thank you, Deputy Superintendent Yarbrough, and thank you, Dr. Williams. That was incredible. Thank you for outlining all of the aspects of the efficiency review that we've been discussing. Um, that answers my question so thoroughly. And uh, with that, I mean, I think we're rushing into it if this amendment was to, this motion amendment to the budget was to pass. I think we should just wait for the report, wait for everything that's coming forward, and then move on from there. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Hager? Um, I agree with Mr. Thomas and I um, want to just point out that these are recommendations and not mandates and so we need to allow the system to kind of to, to do all the things that you were just saying and, and kind of and I appreciate how many of the recommendations you are putting into place because you, you don't have to and but you're, you're choosing to because you recognize that it can improve things so um, so yeah I, I agree with Mr. Thomas. Thank you Ms. Rowe. So um, I would just like to point out for the sake of the public that this was given to us, but I believe this is the work session we bumped. So we didn't get the full explanation of this during the board session. Um, but looking through this, so just maybe I counted wrong. It's late. But so we're accepting, according to these charts, about 28 recommendations. And then another 32 we're putting on hold till 2024 budget, so next year. And we're realigning approximately five and then we're declining um, 19 recommendations. But am I right that in declining those 19 recommendations, we're declining to um, eliminate a position, not declining to create one? Okay, and at some further report, are we going to get an explanation position by position why that didn't happen? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Mr. Kuhn. It will be after the budget vote. 
Okay, okay. I just had a really a question for Ms. Causey. Um, so your the current motion on the floor says execute these all these recommendations in FY23, correct? Um, but the timelines that were part of those recommendations, that's part of the whole thing. That that you we don't need to worry about the timelines that were part of that. You're fine with Dr. Williams moving along at the pace that he currently is for 23 or no? No. Okay, never mind. Ms. Mack. I just wanted to point out, Ms. Um, Causey just said it, that when we get a report in March, the budget, the budget will be out of our hands at that time. So that does concern me. I do think this motion is much too broad um, and probably does get into operations, but I have always personally had a concern that the county government paid over a million dollars for a, a company of experts to come in and evaluate us and you know, things that I see on this list, like the reorganization of the Department of Special Education and the reorganization of the Office of Health Services and a grant specialist have all been held to FY24. So while I don't necessarily support this motion because it is so broad, I do think there are important things on this list that should not be deferred um, for another budget cycle, and I really don't know how to address that. Dr. Yarbrough, please respond. Yes, thank you, Ms. Mack, for that question. And what I can share with you is what Dr. Williams has shared with us, um, is that when we get recommendations from a work group, particularly around either a work group or the uh, division closest to the work, for example, you identified the Office of Special Education. If Dr. McComas and Dr. Parandozzi identifies that there is a specific need in alignment and we are working under Dr. Williams' uh, leadership with the Division of Human Resources to identify current resources to support it, that is his preference, that we move forward with the urgent needs. And I think the, the one thing that is um, most important to note is in terms of adding positions, um, the majority of the recommendations for savings unless there was um, communication and discussion, those have moved forward to make sure that we were fiscally responsible in terms of um, addressing the needs of uh, Team BCPS. But we certainly, in the update, uh, will provide you with very specific information around how recommendations are being addressed and feedback from the division work groups. Thank you. I have one specific question because um, I happen to be looking at it where we say eliminate the passport program and then the action is consideration. But yet in the far right column, we show the actual savings. So what in that case does consideration mean? So that was one of the recommendations that the public works provided. They did not consider that there are students who are currently in the first year or second year of that program, and just to eliminate it completely, you will be getting emails from parents about not having that option for their students to finish uh, a program in, in certain schools. So <clears throat> again, I, I, I just think for this board, um, we went through the 759 pages and all the recommendations, and the one thing that Public Works had would not reference is that <clears throat> They've made recommendations previously, but no school system was in a pandemic. So, Dr. Williams, I don't know if you, I, I I'll, so, so, there, so therefore I'm just saying we we took this seriously about what we can do immediately, and what we could do months down the road based on our circumstances here. And if you look at this particular chapter, chapter eight is heavily around the educational programs. So that would be C and I. They did some discussions with safety and security, and I believe uh, research and accountability. But as you can see, a lot of the savings, the big chunk of the savings was around 
eliminating the passport. So if you eliminate it completely, that would be the savings of over $3 million. But that's really my question. It shows as actual savings. So it, if, if somebody in the public was looking at this, they would think we were eliminating it because it's showing $3.1 million oh, but the of savings. Says consideration. So you're right. Th that's all. All I was asking was a clarification. So the actual savings is not actual savings because it's being considered. Okay, that's that's what I wanted to know. Thank you. Thank you. Again, I would just point out to the board, a lot of the savings, chapter one was over one million, and then chapter eight was over, I believe, four million or so. And, and chapter eight involved multiple offices and a big chunk of that was the educational programs. Great, thank you. So there's a motion on the floor and a second. Um, Ms. Gover, may we have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? No. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? No. Mr. McMillian? No. Mr. Offerman? No. Dr. Hager? No. Mr. Kuhn? No. Ms. Hen? No. The motion fails. Ms. Hen? Mr. Please let the record reflect that I would vote no. Mrs. Causey, did you have anything else for consideration? Thank you, Dr. Yarbrough. Madam Chair, I'm out of time. Okay, thank you. Ms. Mack? I have one motion to make, and it should be fast. Um, it's in the chat. I move that the superintendent and his staff, when in discussions with our funding partners, prioritize the preservation of the 381.3 FTEs included in the proposed budget and the increase in compensation for the employees outlined on pages 36 and 38 of the superintendent's January 11th budget presentation. Thank you. Is there a second? Rowe. Second. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. May I Any speak? discussion? May I speak to my motion? Please go ahead. I am a strong proponent of asking for what is needed, and I have to applaud Dr. Williams and his staff for the increase in people in this budget. However, the proposed budget is 20.9% over maintenance of effort, and I believe the highest maintenance of effort that's ever been approved by the county executive and his team was about 5.2%. So this budget could be subject to significant cuts by our funding partners. And I am asking that you and your staff, when you meet with the county, be very clear that the cut should not include the 381.3 FTEs and the pay increases contained in the proposed budget because I personally believe we are not going to turn this school system around unless we have the people to do it. Thank you. Ms. Rowe, did you want to speak to your second? I agree with what Ms. Mack said. We need to be doing everything that we can to put people in the schoolhouse to help these kids, particularly in a pandemic. And if there was ever a year to fund more positions in schoolhouses, it's this one. Thank you, Mr. Thomas, and then Ms. Claudia. Thank you. These are the 381.3 increased yes. FDs. Okay. Thank you. Just wanted to confirm. Thank you, Mrs. Causey. Thank you. I just wanted to ask the question: the 381 increases in staff. To what enrollment is that tied? That's based on the projected enrollment for. Uh, September 20th, 2022. It's, based, there's, it's based on projected of 2022 or the actual from September of 2022? Well, the funding is based on the actual of this past year, but the programs are designed to serve the enrollment we expect for, for the coming school year. And is that reflected in the student counts um, report that's later on the agenda for this meeting? Uh, I haven't looked at that. I'm I sorry. don't know what that report is. The student counts? Well, we get the same data as being presented to the board, so I would say yes, but I have not specifically looked at that agenda item. So what, uh, <clears throat> so how did you come up with your projection? upon which the, the, the operating Department budget. Department of Facilities and Strategic Planning came up with that projection. 
just like they do Mrs. every Causey, year. Mrs. Causey, given the lateness of the hour, is this pertinent to the vote on the, the motion on the floor? And do we need to have this debate uh, over enrollment numbers at this hour? Uh, my only concern is that if we are um, over requesting and then uh, given it's a public works finding around increasing the projection for staff over 4% rather than 2%, which is industry standard. And then it ends up with a whole bunch of money that then needs to be budget allocated transferred, which is another public work findings that it's not presented to the board in a timely fashion. And it quote unquote undermines the authority of the board in budgetary matters. So that's my concern so is whether the operating budget is sufficiently aligned with a, re a realistic uh, projection. That we're requesting yeah. too many positions based on enrollment. Okay. Mr. Offerman. I want to just say that, uh, and I, this is not, this is not involved with a public work statement, but I don't think we could request t too many, literally. I, I'm, and I know that's not politically practical and economically practical, but I, I, I would fight for every person we can get anytime. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kuhn. So, in principle, I support this um, motion. Sorry, it's late. Um, but my concern is, and I want to understand the actual action that we are asking or directing Dr. Williams and staff to take, because when we use words like prioritize the preservation, so in my mind, and I want to be clear on this, everything else in the budget goes before any of this money is touched. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Any other comments or questions before? Because you've spoken to your motion. Mr. Thomas, you've spoken yeah, to no it. Way. Has anyone else not spoken that wants to? Okay. Ms. Cozzi, briefly, and then Mr. Thomas, uh, Dr. Hager. So now you, he just, I'm, it's, I'm also very tired, but um, prioritize the preservation. It is a conversation, though. So I know that we don't have the ability to, to say, you know, we can't make hardcore demands, right? So, the, but. But your point is just to, to please prioritize these these things. Is, is that correct? There are budget hearings, and mm -hmm. I'm asking Dr. Williams and his staff as they're sitting in front of the county council. Right. And the county council is making their decision. Oh, thank you. It says, I don't think we need this many social workers. I want Dr. Williams to say, but we do. Right, exactly. Okay, so yeah. But, but um, at the end of the day, we do need this many not, teachers, right. and we do need to increase the pay as outlined on page 38 and 36 and 38 of my budget presentation yeah. because we need to retain people, we need to hire people, and we need more people for our schools. No, I definitely su support the concept. I just want to make, make sure I understand that we, don't, we aren't completely in control, though, as yeah. we recognize. So okay. thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Causey and then Mr. Thomas. Thank you. And I want to say I absolutely support the intention of this motion. Um, my concern is, and it was one that was expressed to me, um, is that we have staff, they're asking for additional um, dollars. And are we asking for new staff that we won't hire at the expense of fiscally supporting the employees we have now in, in the manner in which they're asking? So that's my only concern. But it's a conversation, and I totally support uh, the conversation of resources in the schoolhouse, human resources. Ms. Mack, and then Mr. Thomas, and then Ms. Rowe. Um, Ms. Causey, I specifically asked in one of the budget sessions, and I went back to make sure that it was recorded, are we fully filling any vacancy within the schoolhouse? And the answer was yes. So in my mind, I'm not asking to do something in, in lieu of something else, but in addition to. Mr. Thomas. Thank you. So these, the 381 increased FTEs, um, those are only school-based FTEs. That wouldn't include like the coordinator of student activities we discussed today or central office staff. Okay. But does, does this include central office staff, the 381? Okay. I just want 
Okay. No, it's schoolhouse staff. Okay, thank well, you. Well, I'm sorry, psychologists reside sometimes in the central office. So, yes, yeah, some of the staff are central office staff, but most of the staff are school-based staff. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Um, does someone know approximately of all the FTEs that we had in last year's budget, how many of them were never filled with an employee? such that they were basically unfilled FTEs? Um, the superintendent's budget last year um, didn't propose new positions. It was a maintenance of effort budget, if you'll recall. So we just were going after compensation increases. So when we have vacant FTEs, is it because the FTE was never filled or because it became vacant in the school year? Um, any school-based position, HR is actively trying to fill. So if it became vacant during the school year, a teacher resigns, they'll immediately try to fill that. If it's vacant going into the year, they're actively trying to, to fill those positions too. Do we know approximately how many months or years a position stays vacant for and where like a long-term sub fills that position? Um, I, I would have to think that data is available. Okay, yeah. And I would say, I mean, I'm, I'm new, but I would think we, we have trouble, every school system's having trouble filling positions, but I don't believe it's the practice that we hold vacant positions. So as, as Mr. Tanev said, we're actively trying to hire all the positions that we have. It's just some we have a lot of trouble finding folks for, but we don't have a policy where we say let's hold these positions. We're try we'd love to be 100% um, filled. That would be the goal. Yes, and I agree with Mr. Hartlov here. Um, our process in HR is that if a position it does become vacant, we would immediately work to fill that position. Similarly, as new positions are added within our budget, we develop a process plan whereby we work to fill that position as well. So it's not a standard operating procedure to allow positions to remain vacant throughout the entirety of the fiscal year. Okay, so d does that not happen then? Like, what's the longest that something's been vacant? What's the average? Not wanting to provide an incorrect response, I'll research that information and provide you a fulsome answer. Thank you. Um, because we can't look at vacancies unilaterally. Mm -hmm. We have to look at the vacancy with respect to the specific position that's vacant. And in BCPS, we also need to look at the position with respect to zones. So there are various variables um, that go into a position vacancy as well as the long-term effects of that vacancy. I'd be very interested to know how long it takes to fill a vacancy and then once we hire that person, how long it takes to onboard them. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions before we vote? Mr. Kuhn? Um, so one of our items in information is the financial report for the month ending December 2021. And I'm wondering if Mr. Saris or Mr. Tantliff can tell us what funds have not been expended that were specific for teaching resources. I'm guessing we know the number. It's just a matter of asking the question the right way. Um, so activity three uh, is the primary activity that covers teachers in the schoolhouse. And we have a significant number of teacher vacancies. Um, so we project that by year end, we'll be um, underspent by more than we typically would in that activity. Activity six also has a lot of teachers, that's special education. But that report's really just telling you how much we've spent year to date and giving you a, a gauge of that versus the total budget. But it doesn't tell us how much we were supposed to spend up to that point? Uh, yeah, no, gonna, it, do, it doesn't in the so budget. So in other words, if you look at instructional salaries, um, we have spent 42.2% relative to 50% of the year. So okay. that variance is 
represent. It's the underspend the of what we haven't filled. Or, right, right. Okay. Thank you. Sure. I have no further questions. Thank you. Ms. Governor, may we have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Ms. Uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. The Thank motion you. carries. Mr. Thomas? Thank you. I'd like the record to reflect that I would vote in support. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Mack, did you have anything else for the assembly? Thank you. So I have one motion I'd like to make at this time, if I may. I move to increase the allocation of funding in the FY 2023 operating budget for alternative education programs to be equal to or greater than the highest school systems per pupil allocation for alternative education programs in the state, not to exceed one million. Second, Causey. Thank you, and that is in the chat. So I will um, comment on my motion. Um, currently feedback I've gotten from our school system staff is that our alternative education programs are underutilized, um, that, place, that they are unable to get placements for students that are in need of the services, that they've received overwhelmingly positive feedback from students who need those placements um, and that want additional services to be made available. Um, and that they are desperate for these placements and cannot get them. Um, this is a, a service that, that we are in need of providing more. Again, as Ms. Mack said, we are in need of people for our students, and this is one area that certainly um, the social and emotional needs of our students have never been greater um, in the pandemic, and this is one area that, that folks are, are begging us to help them with. So that said, um, this is a, a way to um, be responsive to ensure that we are providing equal to or greater than the level of supports that um, other LEAs are providing in the state. Ms. Yes, Mr. Thomas, Mr. Thomas, and then Ms. Mack. Thank you. So, with this uh, money that's being allocated, my question is like, what's the purpose to, for that money? Like, do you have is there a, like, besides just giving money to the alternative education, there's like, what's the purpose? What, could, what would that money be used for? Whatever the needs of those programs are to accommodate more student placements. Staffing, primarily. Okay, okay so it could be allocated towards staffing. staffing supplies, whatever they need to, to um, serve more students. Okay, so why didn't we just add more FTEs to the alternative education programs? It's to award, flex, to give staff flexibility to provide what they need. With okay. This Can I ask Dr. Williams or staff what specific, like what do you, what would they what would you guys use with this amount of funding for those programs? So let's see. A lot of I think, the I think to your point it would be and, and Mr. Sarris, you can look at the current allocation would be to look at what we currently fund and expanding that funding could be instructional materials, could be additional types of FTEs that may be necessary. I, I don't have the specifics right now. We, of yeah. course, would have to work with our alternative schools and look at the needs and prioritize. Mm. Mr. Saris, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I'm trying to, a lot of the alternative programs uh, expend funds to pay uh, teachers and tutors to do additional hours and and might not necessarily require FTEs, but I need to quickly find that section to see. Um, sure, while you're looking how, that up, one yeah. example that I was told is that um, alternative programs will only serve students with very limited IEPs. So there may be staff, special educators that we could provide to serve um, a wider range of students that have more complicated needs if we were to provide additional staff. Okay, and is this only for, this is only for the BCPS the three al programs. alternate education. Okay, not the non-public schools that we have our students right. also going to. So I'm not clear now if we're talking about special education or alternative programs like evening, weekend, 
bridge programs, that kind of thing. Our alternative schools. Oh, alternative schools, okay. The Crossroads Center? Correct. Okay. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I think that would, to increase placements, we probably would need staff in, in those alternative schools. So um, we'd have to work with the program directors and the principals to see uh, how to allocate that million dollars between staff and uh, non-salary expenses. So we would, uh, as we'll do with all these motions, we'll begin work tomorrow morning and uh, we can provide you with an update of how best to increase seats. At the, okay. Is that the right direction? Yes, okay. thank you. Okay. So I have updated my wording to, thank you Dr. Hager, um, for alternative education schools to make that clear. That that's, that was the intent. Thank you. Do we know what, do, okay, so it says, equal to or greater than the highest school systems per pupil allocation of alternative education programs in the state. Do we know what that number is? And does that exceed one million and are we just gonna be allocating one million dollars? I don't know off the okay. top of my head. Uh, I'm sure of that. Okay. Um, Thank you, Ms. Mack? I just wanted to say before the pandemic started, um, I was able to visit the Crossroads Centers and another alternative school. And what I found to be very interesting was one of the biggest problems they have at those schools is that a lot of kids become so comfortable there that they don't wanna leave, mm -hmm. that they thrive on the personalized attention that they're getting, the smaller class sizes. Um, and I think they feel safer sometimes in that environment. So I fully support this because I think we need to utilize um, the alternative programs for whatever reason a, a student is sent there um, and recognize that they are beneficial to students such that they that some of them don't ever wanna leave. So I fully support this motion. Thank you. Dr. Hager? I'm getting confused again. Are we talking about schools like Catonsville yes. Center for Alternative Studies or schools for special students with special education needs? Sorry, um, they were talking about conversations like, are, the, yes. Right, Crossroads is um, one okay. that started out as a transitional program that has really been extended as a, you know, a full program through graduation. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm just clarifying, thank you. Yep. And we and have at this point 299 students projected between all four schools Crossroads being far and away the largest at 174, and Meadowood being the smallest at 20. So I just, um, and their, their non-salary budget's about 400,000. And, and the max, my motion puts a cap on it, but I'm, I'm interested in seeing how um, other schools are fund, comparable schools are funded so that we can ensure that, and I have no idea what that looks like, but that's why that there's that cap there. Again, with the goal of increasing placements. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Any other discussion? Okay. Mr. Thomas? Yes, I just wanted to state that um, I, although I, I would have liked to have more information as like, you know, how this money we allocated the FDEs beforehand. I think, although I can't feel that I, I am in support of this, um, I had the opportunity to visit uh, Rosedale Center. It was one of my first school visits, and uh, that was a c concern that was bringing up. The same thing that Ms. Max said about students who don't want to leave uh, was so true and how much more resources that they needed in order to maintain having students there and also to, to really engage students. So, yeah. Thank you. Ms. Sikazi? Thank you, Madam Chair, for bringing this up. Um, I support this. Um, I've heard from educators, uh, around uh, the district that there are s seemingly more students that have um, you know, some broader issues 
that would be helped at these schools, um, which then would allow the comprehensive school, um, you know, when a student is getting a lot of resources that the alternative schools are designed to provide, it allows the comprehensive schools to be more efficient um, and effective for, for those students in, in that community as well. Thank you. So do I need to restate my motion or amend it, Mr. Uh, Mercedes? Yes, great, uh, Let me restate it. Thank you. Yes. So I will restate it. I move to increase the allocation of funding in the FY 2023 operating budget for alternative schools to be equal to or greater than the highest school systems per pupil allocation for alternative schools in the state, not to exceed $1 million. And I'm the second that accepts that okay. completely. Thank you. Any objections? Okay. Thank you. Ms. Gilver, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hem? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. Mr. Thomas. Thank you. I'd like to state for the record that I am in support of this. I'm going to let that to be noted. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other discussion, board members? Does that wrap it up? Okay. Ms. Mack? I'd like to make a motion to accept the proposed FY 2023 budget as amended. You took my line. Second. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Would, would you like us to summarize what's been discussed? No. Just so we have a total. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> no. Thank That's you, though. <laughs> I wanted to see him do it. <laughs> Come on, let's, let's, let's put the newbie to the test. <laughs> I wasn't going to do it. <laughs> 20. We, we would love a written summary. Mr. Sounds Mr. good. Okay. Thank you. Um, so there's been a motion and a second. No discussion. May we may have a roll call vote, please. Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Ms. Hen? The budget is adopted as amended. I'd like to state for the record that I would vote in support of this. Thank you. Thank you. You all. Yes, thank you all. I was out of time before, but. Okay. And Ms. Mack, your motion was as amended, correct? You did state that. Thank you for, clarif that for clarification. The next item on the agenda is unfinished business, consideration of board policies, which was postponed from the February 8th, 2022 board meeting. And for that, I call on the Policy Review Committee Chair, Ms. Rowe. Members of the board, the Policy Review Committee ask that the board accept the committee's recommendation to amend the following board policy, 7330, facilities and construction, financing capital projects funded by private donations. This recommendation is presented to you on tonight's agenda as Exhibit K. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendation of the board's policy review committee? So moved, Thomas. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? Madam Chair. Mrs. Causey. Thank you. Earlier, um, I emailed, well, in previous meetings, I had discussed um, concerns, um, given some information about some projects that had been um, uh, lengthy time uh, getting approved. Um, where I wanted to make amendments and I had talked about it at the last meeting. So I had emailed and now I'm trying to find it. Okay. 
anyone gets there first, just let me know. Ms. Causey, what were your concerns about the policy? Can you summarize them? Certainly. It was adding language to um, be more descriptive in the um, issues addressed in, in the policy, uh, just in terms of it's there somewhere, uh, including uh, specific donor information, including type of donor whether units of government, nonprofits, business, community groups, PTA, individuals, the amount of donation um, and the type, whether it's funds, in kind, or service, um, and then adding a um, reporting. The superintendent will provide a semi-annual report to the board on the approval process and the implementation of capital projects. May I ask, is, is that level of detail currently included in the superintendent's rule by chance? Or would you um, want to consider providing that? Some of it is addressed that? in the, the detail is addressed in the superintendent's rule, yes. Um, but in evaluating the policy analysis presented from staff, that there are other boards that have um, additional detail. And as a board, we've um, from time to time been including reporting requests. So, do you have a motion? Or the, actually, there's a motion on the floor. Do you have? Yeah, I do. I it, it it literally disappeared, but I show here that I emailed it to twenty people. Well, we <coughs> need to. <sighs> okay. So we need to process the motion on the floor, and then if you have suggestions to incorporate into the superintendent's rule, unless you'd like to make another motion regarding the policy, but we need to process this. I move that draft policy 7330 be amended by adding the following language on page one, line 37, at the end of the phrase, who submit capital project proposals. Addition is including specific donor information, donor type, whether unit of government, nonprofit organization, business, community group, PTA, individuals, et cetera, type of donation, funds, donation in kind, donations of service. On page two, line four, Number four, satisfactory completion of the capital project with appropriate school system management and oversight. And finally, on page two, line seven, at the end of the statement, the board directs the superintendent to implement this policy, adding the superintendent will provide semi-annual reports to the board on the implementation of policy and superintendent rule regarding approval process and project completion. So were these changes discussed in committee, or are you they were proposing discussed, moving uh, them back to committee? What was no, the outcome? I'm, no, I'm adding, I'm making a motion to add it here and then pass the policy. Is there a second? Second. Do you have it, is that prepared that you can send? Yes, I'm trying to uh, cut and paste it back together. <clears throat> so this is an amendment to the motion that's on the floor? Yes. You're offering this as an amendment to the motion on the floor? Yes, ma'am. So if um, Ms. Gover can put it in the chat for those on the chat. I did send it.
So you are moving to adopt the recommendation of the board's policy review committee as amended? Yes. With the following lang language that you've stated? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Any, any questions? Mr. Thomas. Thank you. I just, I, if I had received this previously, if it had been attached, then I would, I would, I would have loved to have a discussion about this and, and participate in this, but we're just receiving this and it's really late. So I would just ask that we move this policy back to policy review committee, and then we can have the discussion there. Um, we have a number of, of upcoming meetings and, and so forth. So I, I think that would be best. So um, I, if Ms. Causey, if you're willing to withdraw your motion and Ms. Rowe your second, then I think we could, that would be, we could discuss that. So uh, respectfully, members of the board, this has been, I'm sorry, respectfully, members of the board, this policy has been postponed twice. It was voted out of committee without any of this discussion. So this is the first time that um, anyone is hearing about possible changes to the policy. And it was voted on in first reader as well. There were no questions in first reader. This is not the best way to make decisions, respectfully. Madam Chair, if I may, it was discussed that in fact there's two additional documents that have been attached uh, that staff replied to my uh, questions and concerns that I raised the first time where I said that I was going to be adding an amendment. So. I'd, I'd like the committee chair to comment on this matter. What is your recommendation, Ms. Rowe? That we take a recess so we can all go to the bathroom and I can look at this in the context of the policy and then make a recommendation. I'm not going to honor the, the recess because we we need to make a decision on this and move forward. But I agree with Mr. Thomas that if we could this is it, not how to process a policy if we could put that it we've back, never seen the changes to at 11.30 could, at night. If we could put it back to policy that's right. and review, that's fine. I'm just uncertain as to how we do that when I, we have a motion and an amendment. On so, Mrs. Causey, would you consider withdrawing your motion and instead moving the policy back to policy review committee? Um, I don't think I can discussion. withdraw, but I can amend my Amend amendment to you can send withdraw it back your policy. You can withdraw your amendment. Uh, I can your withdraw. motion to amend, and then people vote on it with consent. Okay, I um, move to withdraw my motion and send it back to policy review committee. Are there any objections? Okay, so now the original motion stands. If we wish to instead move it back to policy review committee, we can vote that down. So may I have a roll call vote on the original motion on the floor to accept the recommendation of the policy review committee. Ms. Rowe? No. I'm sorry, I thought we were voting on. And then we can move to move it back. Okay, There's no. a motion on the floor that we're processing to adopt the recommendation of the board's policy review committee. No. Ms. Mack? No. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? No. Mr. Offerman? Abstain. Dr. Hager? No. Mr. Kuhn? No. Ms. Hen? No. That motion fails. Ms. Causey, would you like to make your motion now? I move to send it back to policy review. Second, Thomas. Thank you. May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the update on the blueprint. For that, I call on Dr. Williams and Mr. Dixit. Madam Chair, could we recess for three minutes? This is the, we have two final items. Can we get through that? <laughs> if, if you need to step. Ms. Hara, if you. So this evening, we've actually have Dr. Boswell McComas and Mr. Dixit. 
So good evening uh, again, members of the board, Dr. Williams. Um, uh, Mr. Dixit and I are here this evening to uh, provide you an update on Blueprint for Maryland's future. Um, and specifically this evening, we will be focusing on progress with implementation of our blueprint related to facilities, um, focusing in on CTE and early childhood um, expansion. Next slide, please. As all of you are familiar with, our Blueprint for Maryland's Future uh, was a bill that took effect July 1st of 2020 and, and affects uh, five major policy areas, as you have seen before, and are on the slide in front of you. Forgive me, I'll slow myself down here. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. Okay. <laughs> next slide, please. Uh, um, and as always, we anchor everything to our strategic plan. And as you are familiar with, there is a great deal of intersectionality between the blueprint for um, Maryland's Tomorrow and the five policy areas uh, with our strategic plan. Next slide, please. Um, to begin with uh, this evening, uh, I just want to highlight our CTE um, beginning in the year 2023-24 school year, which is not next year, but the year after, um, all school systems in Maryland will be required to provide all students who meet college and career ready standards access to three pathways to further success um, at no cost to the students. And you can see on the screen in front of you that there are really three pathways related to that um, expectation. I'm proud to say that we in BCPS already have uh, elements of that, but one of the areas that we'll uh, be expanding and focusing on is the third column uh, specifically related to credentialing. But in order for us to do that, we will of course be looking at all of our programs and that's where uh, my colleague Mr. Dixit comes in and he will provide you an update on um, facilities related to CTE programs. So next slide please. So as the board will recall, good evening and uh, congratulations to Mr. McMillian on his appointment. Uh, as the board will recall that under the capital improvement program, board had approved a study money for Northwest CTE Center. The work is currently under progress to identify CTE needs in the Northwest area and site evaluation of existing and potential sites to provide those CTE programs. The goal is to complete the analysis by preparing specification to develop infrastructure or facilities to provide access to students in the northwest part of the county. Next slide is yours. Yes, and then, thank you. And then moving on, uh, we're going to highlight preschool and pre-kindergarten expansion. So if you could, yes, thank you. Um, for the early childhood education program portion of Blueprint, BCPS has traditionally always held a meeting uh, with an expansion group, an internal expansion group to always um, be discussing how do we expand um, seating half-day sessions at elementary schools where there is high need and potential space. What we are doing this year is this group is now looking at expansion for full day sessions around BCPS based on need. Um, and as described on in the blueprint line, which you see in front of you, uh, fundamentally we are looking to expand full day pre-K. Um, and for that, we typically mean the four-year-old uh, pre-K program, focused on making full day kindergarten sections available for uh, all four-year-olds from low-income families. Um, and uh, we are essentially looking to convert half-day slots um, into full-day slots um, and creating new slots um, uh, as new schools and facilities come online. This will occur at the same time that we are looking to expand full-day pre-kindergarten uh, for three-year-olds. So we oft for three-year-olds in low-income families, we often refer to our three-year-old program as preschool. So that's how we delineate. Uh, but the blueprint language uses pre-kindergarten and d designates the years. If you can move on to the next slide, please. This year, the expansion group met to explore full day sessions and has engaged in the following collaborative analysis with our partners in strategic planning. We analyzed schools that were underutilized for space. We investigated under-enrolled pre-kindergarten programs and matching special education programs that were located in the same building. 
We analyze specific schools regarding the educational specifications. We know our younger learners have certain room uh, requirements. And additionally, our Office of Early Childhood Programs has um, been researching and investigating potential new curriculums for pre-kindergarten programs. Next slide, please. Um, the current full day sessions in BCPS are 11. Uh, they currently are at Halstead, Halstead, Hawthorne, Maiden Choice, Sandy Plains, and White Oak. Um, and as a result of our work, uh, collaborative work with strategic planning um, and facilities, we are recommending the addition of um, sessions for next year at Berkshire, Lansdowne, and the new Northeast Elementary School, as you can see on the slide before you. With the expansion of these full day sessions, uh, that will bring us to 17 full day sessions for next school year. Um, at this point, my colleague will uh, explain some future facility plans that will include full day pre-K programs. So all of the new elementary schools that are under design uh, our educational specification and future planning, we are making sure that it has the provisions to support expanding full-day pre-kindergarten sessions. And we have looked at the northwest side of the county where there are several schools coming. All of them have uh, pre-kindergarten facilities to meet the requirement of the blueprint. And even those students who are in other facilities are being transitioned into neighborhood schools with those facilities being updated. Thank you. Next slide, please. And that's the, some of the um, schools that we were just referencing. Next slide. What you see on the map before you um, is um, locations of available uh, pre-kindergarten sessions um, moving forward um, at this point. The blueprint, you know, vision around expanding early childhood is quite a sizable endeavor, and therefore it requires that this will be a multi-year approach, um, and of course it engages private um, and public options for families. The map before you sh um, will show you three colored coded dots. The dots that are purple indicate um, where there are private providers that BCPS families can access. The black dots indicate where we had current full day sessions this year. And the yellow dots indicate the expansion um, schools for next year. Um, next slide, please. Ultimately, this sizable endeavor uh, requires a great a deal of collaboration, and our collaboration continues both internally and externally with stakeholders in order to ensure that the implementation of the vision for the blueprint is supportive to our students, families, and staff. An internal BCPS blueprint work group is a cross-divisional work group uh, that collaborates on implementation plans. Additionally, we have a work group that includes school-based staff and union representatives uh, representation um, in the form of the blueprint review team that has uh, approved recommendations to move forward that are in alignment with the blueprint for Maryland's future. Uh, additionally, the blueprint coordinator, Dr. Melissa Wisted, attends external um, LEA sessions where blueprint coordinators across the state are able to collaborate on impl implementation plans. And she meets with our Baltimore County government partners and holds discussions on implementation of BCPS's plan um, and coordination of resources. Finally, uh, the Maryland State Department of Education meetings are also another forum for um, LEAs to discuss the requirements for implementation of the blueprint. Next slide, please. Uh, last but not least, we are excited to um, debut our BCPS Blueprint webpage. It's dedicated to keeping our community appraised of updates related to our Blueprint um, and uh, the future laws as they become implemented. Uh, please look for this resource or contact me or Dr. Wistead with any questions related to the Blueprint and BCPS. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Thomas. Thank you. thank you so much. Um, that was incredible. Thank you, Dr. McCombs, and thank you, Mr. Dixit. Uh, on February 12th, I actually attended uh, Blueprint Day 2022 with Strong Schools Maryland um, in recognition of one year of Blueprint being passed. So I'm so excited about this. Um, oh, we also were praised for having the website up and running. So I just wanted to share that with you all. Um, my one question is about the private providers for pre-K. Um, 
are those currently um, being used by our, our, our students? Do we currently offer those private providers that were on the PowerPoint to our students? Um, I, that is, I will have to get back to you, to be honest, Mr. Thompson. I do not believe that we currently are for this year, okay. but in moving forward, part of what the work is happening this year is identifying where there are private providers that have space and meet the criteria as set for by MSDE. Incredible. And for those private providers, are we, I know in particular, like, are we going to be influencing the curricula that's being used in those private providers? Um, and, and those type of things, or is it kind of up to the individualized private providers to provide that? So it would be both. The okay. private providers can work with us around our curriculum, but they also can use their curriculum, but it has to meet the criteria as set forward by MSDE. Incredible. And how would our parents from those backgrounds uh, know about these private providers and access them? So that's a, a good uh, um segue to our website, they can reach out <laughs> and I can have Dr. Wisted and our uh, Office of Early Childhood support families in finding the appropriate uh, resource for them. Thank you, and one last question. Are these private providers fully dedicated to BCPS students or are there other students in other areas as well? There are um, other students in other areas, but they are uh, providers located within the Baltimore County um, geographic area or jurisdiction, if you will, and they may serve um, students that are not of low income. This is really right now focusing on providing that support for students or children of low income. Incredible. Thank you so much. Thank Dr. you. Dr. Hager? Um, simple question first. Uh, the ECE part is like one of my favorite parts of the blueprint, by the way. I'm very excited about <laughs> it. Um, so you keep you kept referring to them as sessions, 17 full day sessions. Does that mean a classroom? Or do you mean, what do you mean by that? It's a, um, it's really a classroom. And so essentially right now we use the expression morning session, afternoon session. Okay. Um, so what we're saying is it will be a full day session. And so it's really a classroom right now. We share space, right? So we would take and have a class in there in the morning and a different class of students in the afternoon in the half day model. Mm -hmm. And so when we say a full day session, it's really one group of students in that classroom all day. Okay. And just as a and aside, um, prioritizing sites that do have on-site aftercare for those kids so that their day doesn't end at 3 o'clock and, and it inconveniences family, working families. Um, uh, for those private sites where we're working with them, um, how is this different than the current voucher program that MSD already provides for low-income families? I, I don't know um, enough about the, the current voucher to be forthright uh, with you, Dr. Hager, and I will find out more. But um, I do understand that with the blueprint, there will be more of a sliding scale. I think that's one of the significant differences. But I will confirm that and, and get back to you on a weekly update. And then um, last question, I just uh, con concern that, that you know, because we have such areas of concentrated poverty, having enough um, space for all the students who need it so that they can be together in their home school. I don't know, just kind of, you know, I know you're thinking about all these things. but Yes, no, we appreciate that. And we do recognize that there is more need right now than we have mm -hmm. facility right. capacity, e even inclusive of private partnerships. And, and private um, also, will the children have busing for the pre-K? Transportation is provided. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kuhn? Um, so... <clears throat> Mr. Thomas mentioned uh, curriculum, and I'm curious, what does a what does a curriculum look like for a three-year-old? Oh, it, so it, it, there is literacy in mathematics. Um, when we think about mathematics at this age, it's really about pattern recognition, beginning number sense, uh, beginning counting uh, skills, um, colors, shapes. Um, when we get into literacy, it's, uh, again, a lot of the very basics around uh, recognizing letter symbols, um, associating sounds with letter symbols. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think there are severe limits, and I understand the whole ready for kindergarten, right? And that's where we're trying to get folks. Um, and we're, in essence, providing... Um, state-funded daycare for children, and that's what I see this as. Um, I'm not against it. I think it's an opportunity uh, that children should have. Um, I just want to make sure everybody understands that you know, we're not actually extending school. School is still kindergarten through 12th grade. This is, is just trying to prepare children for school, 
and not push school down into these age groups because I don't think it's actually developmental, developmentally, you know, appropriate to to try and force a lot of rigor at this age. And I'm, that's why I brought up the whole curriculum, you know, situation because, like you said, it, you know, your ABCs, numbers, shapes, colors, whatever. I just want to make sure we're not going beyond that. Sure. I will say that all programs for students at this age are uh, designed with their developmental readiness, and there is a lot of learning through play. There is a lot of um, kinesthetic learning. It's not just sit at your desk, drill, and kill. It's you, It would never work with children no. of that age <laughs> or parent. Um, and so the, the curriculum and the programming of the entire day is really taken into account uh, because it needs the work, right? You're not, it's not going to be productive for our children or our faculty if, if we design programs that aren't um, in respect to the developmental age and appropriateness. So. All right. And just one last question. Uh, kids at this age need to get up and move around. And, you know, I, would, I wonder, are we having at least one to two sessions of, like, going out and playing, you know, especially if they're in a full day? I couldn't imagine. Yeah. There, there certainly will be built in um, lots of activity, recess, and special areas, right? There still be opportunities for them to have music and, and art and, and things that, again, are not just when you think about traditional school right. sitting okay. and Thank you. Uh, drilling and killing. My pleasure. Good question. Thank you. Ms. Mack? Just to um, piggyback on what Mr. Kuhn was talking about, um, my kids recently shared with me a longitudinal study that took place in Tennessee. Um, they had, the, I guess, the luxury of looking at a cohort of students who began uh, state-funded pre-K in 2011, and the students who enrolled underperformed their peers in the control group who did not participate as observed through statewide achievement tests and disciplinary data. Um, I understand that the state will be mandating a lot of this, but this article that just came out um, on February 2nd was very, very eye-opening. Um, and I hope that when we do look at what we're expecting of children, that it's more play than anything, because this, this was a very well-designed study, and it was a well-designed curriculum, but it shows that kids learn better through play. Mm -hmm. So, and we, I was going to actually ask if we could talk about it in the curriculum committee meeting sure. um, at some point because it's a very, very eye opening. I'm happy to talk about <laughs> curriculum sure. and instruction <laughs> in the committee. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. So, my only concern about any of this is that there's not enough. Because I'm looking at these dots on here, and I know the poverty rates in our school system and the number of elementary students in our school system. And what I'm wondering is, is there not enough because we don't have facilities and providers, or is there not enough because we don't have enough funding? So fundamentally right now, especially Blueprint in these early stages, uh, the funding is coming as part of the Blueprint. It's, it's truly a, a facility capacity um, for us, as you know, we're always working to um, improve our facilities, and I certainly don't want to steal Mr. Dixit's thunder on that. Um, so for us, you know, we are a large school system that is at capacity in a lot of ways. So that's part of our problem. Part of the challenge is the private sector also has limited facilities, um, and there are specifications that they have to meet in order to be eligible to participate. Do we have the option to lease facilities? So, so the question you are asking about what are the issues, and yes, facility is a major issue, and when you talk about what can we do, it's a matter of competing priorities within the needs for the facilities. So what we are doing it is cutting into several little bites and taking one piece at a time. So for example, those schools that are being designed, we are making sure that they incorporate facilities for this program. Then we are identifying the schools that have extra capacity and looking at ways of modifying those spaces to meet the guidelines of the space that is needed for that program. And then finally, looking at the 
private providers to see their availability. So this is still an evolutionary stage for this program, but we are very optimistic about it. Okay, so how are we going to determine when a bunch of students show up at their home elementary school and say we want preschool? How do we determine, assuming they're all of equally impoverished, which ones get to go and which ones don't? Well, that's where the, the team will be working um, to help families um, identify where uh, their seats available. If they're not if they're not enrolled at their school and they are, they meet the eligibility, then our school our team will excuse me will be working with the families to identify where their slots in the private providers. So, but so like initially, a bunch of people apply. Is there a lottery or is it? How do you? I mean, sometimes people do apply for preschool in the previous spring, like you would for kindergarten or whatever. I guess what I'm just wondering is, somehow a decision has to be made, mm -hmm. and our parents are going to want to know how the decision is made, because we're going to have a lot more demand than supply. So how are we going to make that decision? It begins with the level of poverty, and so I can provide more details on that um, in a weekly update. Um, Dr. Wista would be able to provide you a much more thorough answer than I can tonight at this hour, but uh, it is based on uh, a scale of poverty. Okay, so it's basically a needs-based decision then. What happens if we have too many of those? Great question. Uh, yeah, it is I mean, they have question. to decide somehow, uh, right? Yeah. Well, and that that's part of why this is this is urgent, right? And I mean, we're moving towards implementation as early as next year, um, and this will be ongoing. This is not going to be a single uh, year uh, action related to Blueprint. Um, and so I think the the question will be: We will have the, the reality is we will have need that exceeds our capacity. So then, maybe waiting lists are an option. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Mrs. Causey and then Ms. Matt. Thank you so much for this presentation and all the hard work no. from everyone that's been here this evening. Um, Campfield Early Learning Center. I don't see them on this list. Yeah. What is their, what will their status be? So the program, part of the Northwest program, this Camp Field, uh, the goal is to move all the kids to their neighborhood schools. So a plan is being developed right now to make sure that the new schools that are being built, they have the capacity to take care of the students of their neighborhood and all of the other surrounding schools in that area. We are looking at what kind of space do they need to accommodate all the students that are currently housed in Camp Field. Okay, so, and, and we know that the students and families do better when they're in their home school. That's it's true. just, they're connected, it's convenient. Yes. So, okay, and then that facility that the um, board owns is being evaluated for future use after the children are transitioned to the home schools? We don't know at this point. The use of camp field has not been decided at this point, but it'll be repurposed for whatever the other useful uh, use is for that building. Okay, and what is the time frame for the children to um, be able to join their home schools? So our goal is to complete all of this plan by the time Bedford and Summit Park are completed. Okay. Thank so, you. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Mack, did you have a comment? I was just trying to say that Dr. Wistad. Uh, oh, is she? <laughs> yes. <laughs> She's still with us. <laughs> Excellent. She, she will uh, undoubtedly provide you a more detailed answer. So thank, thank you, Ms. Rowe. And thank you, Dr. Wisted. Hi, can you hear me? I, I can. <laughs> okay, great. So um, I can answer a few of the questions. The, um, Ms. Rowe, to answer your question about the priority process as far as um, children that are economically disadvantaged. So for now, um, we still have half day sessions. And so we are required to provide at least a half day session for students who qualify up to 185% poverty. Um, and so we will be required if not in their homeschool, we would provide a half day session 
potentially in another school in BCPS. So we have a lot of half day sessions. So that's going to be our process right now. So if, if they qualify for full day and their homeschool has full day um, and there are more kids than seats in full day there, we can go with the private provider that is also full day, or we can go with a half day session at another site. So that, that's the process if that helps answer that question. Um, okay, I will go on to, um, there was questions about the private providers. Uh, I also am not familiar with the voucher system, but um, I can share with you that what happens is that the, the private providers apply through the Maryland State Department of Education, and that's how they receive the funding um, so that our families can go to those private providers. But there is not, um, it has not been communicated to us how many seats that will be at each private provider. So um, hopefully that answers that. And Ms. Mack, um, I have also read that article you were talking about. So if, if you want to talk about it again at Curriculum Committee, we, we can certainly do that. Thank you, Dr. Weston. I do. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> Thank you. So, um, Yes, uh, so I'm not sure if, if there were other questions, but I think I hit all of them because I was taking notes. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wisted. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the report on academic achievement, fiscal year 2022, first, sem first semester attendance. For that, I call on Dr. McComas and Mr. Connolly. I will give my colleagues a moment to join me at the table. We can, we can pull the other chair over. So good evening. Um, I am joined this evening uh, by Mr. Kevin Conley, our Executive Director of uh, Research Accountability and Assessment, Ms. Kim Ferguson, our Executive Director of Social Emotional Support, and Mr. Howard Franklin, one of our proud people personnel workers who is uh, joining us this evening. The focus of our presentation this evening is, um, is to provide you an update on our first semester attendance rates for our in-person and VLP instruction by level and marking period. Promoting high attendance rates for all our students is an important part of their growth and achievement over time and is a critical factor in having success um, academically and having access to the Compass Pathways for Success um, for college and career readiness. Our Board of Education, you all have identified specific attendance goals as part of your focus on safe and supportive learning environments. Uh, it is important to note as we work through this presentation that COVID-19 surges and the emergence of different variants um, at, over periods of time over the last few years have resulted in adjustments to our instructional models. As you are familiar, we have experienced synchronous and asynchronous instruction, hybrid instruction, full-time in-person instruction, and full-time virtual learning instruction. Uh, so in marking period one of this school year, BCPS students returned to 100% in-person instruction for the first time since March of 2020. And so as part of the transition period, BCPS offered students the option to enroll in virtual learning um, or the VLP. Um, you will see the impact of these changing conditions compared to the historical patterns related to attendance. Next slide, please. Oh, actually, go back one. You were ahead of me. Thank you. As you know, our Compass uh, provides a system-wide focus on raising the bar and closing gaps and preparing our students for their future. Our dedication to ensuring that our students graduate college and career ready is a thoughtful and research-based approach to understanding key metrics of student progress along the trajectory of their learning across school levels. Furthermore, the National Center for Education Statistics notes that students who attend school regularly have been shown to achieve at higher levels than students who do not attend regularly. Furthermore, the homeschool partnership is critical to supporting our students in their attendance. A focus on attendance is one example of how our compass intentionally raises the bar for all students to promote college and career readiness. A next slide, please. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Conley, who will walk us through our data. Thank you, Dr. McComas. 
<clears throat> the first semester attendance rates provide us with information about current levels of attendance as we return to full-time in-person learning. The impact of COVID-19 variants have created some changes in attendance and chronic absenteeism data for marking periods one and two. The graph displays the overall student attendance rates for all students <clears throat> and by elementary, middle, and high school level. A comparison of attendance rates for marking period one displayed in blue and marking period two displayed in orange shows that the overall attendance rate decreased by approximately 4% across the system and three to 5% across all school levels. It is important to note that the Omicron surge took place during marking period two and attendance rates were adversely impacted as transmission rates increased. Next slide, please. Similar to the attendance rate data previously shown for in-person learning, the BCPS virtual learning program or VLP data shows a decrease in attendance rates from marking period one to marking period two across all levels. In comparison to the previously shown data, middle school and high school students who participated in the VLP had attendance rates which were slightly greater in marking period one and marking period two than all middle and high school students. Next slide, please. The trends in decreasing attendance rates from marking period one to marking period two are consistent with historical attendance data trends. Typically, seasonal illnesses result in decreased attendance during the second marking period. The pre-pandemic attendance rates from 2017 through 2020 show an approximate 3% decrease and student attendance rates. The impact of the COVID-19 global pandemic has resulted in a more significant decrease in student attendance rates from marking period one to marking period two for the last school year. A closer look at, at this year's change from marking period one to marking period two shows improvement when compared to last year. This year's decrease is 3.8% compared to last year's decrease of 13.2%. It is important to note that the positive relationship between full-time in-person learning and enhanced mitigation strategies for this school year, in spite of an increase in the COVID-19 transmission rates related to the Omicron surge. Next slide, please. As we take a closer look <clears throat> at comparing the marking period one and marking period two attendance data from last year and this year, it is evident that marking period one attendance is more consistent across levels compared to marking period two. This year's quarter two attendance rate increased by 6.3% for all students compared to last year, with the greatest increases in attendance rates occurring at the middle school and high school, which increased by 12.9% and 13.7% respectively. Next slide, please. The ongoing reporting of attendance rates by grade level and student groups provides system and school leadership with opportunities to monitor and report student attendance by level and student group for each marking period for students participating in in-person instruction and the VLP. Share attendance results with parents, care providers, school attendance teams, school nurses, school counselors, resource teachers, PPWs, and school administrators provide support to students who are chronically absent, and utilize attendance as part of the early warning indicators for high school dropout rates. Additionally, we'll continue to adjust our mitigation practices in response to COVID metrics so that student health is protected, ensuring that they are available for learning. Next, Ms. Kim Ferguson, Executive Director of Student Support Services, will share information about student attendance. Thank you, Mr. Conley. The Maryland Compulsory Attendance Law, COMAR 7-301, requires children between the ages of 5 and 18 to attend school regularly. Baltimore County Public School Policy and Rule 5100 and 5120 address topics relating to attendance, including procedures for recording, excusing, and monitoring student attendance. The Maryland State Department of Education and Baltimore County Public Schools expect students to maintain an attendance rate of at least 94%. Policy, policy and Rule 5120 reiterates the 94% attendance standard and defines chronic absenteeism as 
being absent 10% or more of the school days that have occurred to include excused and unexcused absences. The rule also describes what lawful and unlawful absences are and what staff are to do to verify absences and tardiness. The rule briefly describes makeup work, attendance recognition, as well as disciplinary action and accountability. Next slide, please. The Baltimore County Public School Attendance Manual is a resource to provide schools with a framework for creating a culture of attendance. The revised Baltimore County Public School Attendance Manual includes procedures, strategies, and resources to assist schools in developing a proactive school-wide attendance plan. In addition, the manual outlines a multi-tiered system of support structures and interventions to use when assisting families and identifying and addressing barriers to regular school attendance. School attendance committees are charged with monitoring and analyzing attendance trends and implementing school-wide plans aimed at creating a culture of attendance while addressing the needs of individual students and families. Mr. Howard Franklin, pupil personnel worker assigned to schools in the West Zone, will now expand upon the tiered approach to attendance interventions. Next slide. Thanks, Ms. Ferguson. Good evening, everyone. Uh, school attendance committees are comprised of key, based, uh, key staff members. Typically, there are administrators, a school counselor, school nurse, school social worker, as well as involvement from the school's people personnel worker. Other BCPS service providers um, and outside community partners are also sometimes included. Um, as Ms. Ferguson said, attendance committees are charged with monitoring and analyzing a school's attendance trends, and they're charged with implementing a school-wide plan aimed at, as she so elegantly said, creating a culture of attendance, as well as addressing specific needs that individual families or students may have. We know that attendance is essential for academic success. There are students, we also know that there will be families and students who require more intensive levels of of support relating to attendance. BCPS implements a comprehensive multi-tiered system of supports to improve attendance. It's the same type of uh, multi-tiered system of support similar to the MTSS model that's used to improve uh, achievement or student behavior. The current slide is an abbreviated version of a resource from the newly revised BCPS attendance manual which is utilized by school attendance committees to help guide their work around attendance. Tier one interventions are universal. They're preventative school-wide attendance uh, uh, strategies that are designed to encourage good attendance for all students. Typically, these are um, in tier one in interventions. It's for students who have missed less than 5% of the days enrolled, which in this case would, would classify the student as having satisfactory or a low absentee rate. And to be perfectly honest, we've shifted from focusing on average daily attendance to decreasing the amount of students who are chronically absent in schools. That's the shift that came along with ESSA. Um, as well as um, in tier one, we do address the students who have missed five to nine percent because these are the kids that will be considered at risk for becoming chronically uh, absent. And to be, you know, these are the students that the school should be putting the most work into from having them cross over into what I call chronic land. That's what, you, that's what we want to avoid. Tier one in interventions, as I said, are, they're, they're preventative in nature. Um, some examples might be a summer mailing that a principal sends out that has the school's attendance policy on it, or the automated phone calls that go home to all students when, when they miss a day of school. Many schools have incentive programs that recognize good or improved attendance, as well as uh, health, health interventions. For example, schools that host vaccination clinics or dental clinics, because we know that kids miss school for going to the dentist. Typically, par tip parents can keep them out for a full day. So those, those sort of things. As I mentioned, even though the tier one interventions are proactive in nature, they, we also do address barriers in that, in that, in that tier as well. For example, staff outreach. In some of my schools, if a student is absent two days in a week, it's, it's known that the teacher is going to be making a phone call home. In another one of my schools, when a student misses three days in a, in, in a week, the school nurse reaches out. 
Um, in another one of my schools, every time a student who has an IEP or a 504 plan, if they're out, the case manager makes a phone call home. Those are all tier one. In tier two, those are the there are early interventions that are designed to support families who have a moderate chronic absentee rate. These are students who have missed 10 to 19 percent of the, the days enrolled. Once a student hits 10 percent of the school year, they're considered chronically absent. So a student who hits 18 in October is already chronically absent for the entire school year. It's a moving target because of the fact that, you know, when I do an attendance meeting, the hope is that a student will drop off of it as, as the year goes on. Um, tier two in, in, during tier two interventions, the student and families need more personalized attention and support to address the barriers to attendance. Some examples might include um, school-based attendance letters that are sent out, and the verbiage in the letter comes from a problem-solving kind of helping place. Uh, it might be staff out outreach. If there's an ESOL student that is missing school, we may ask the ESOL teacher to reach out to the family to find out what, what's happening. During Tier 2 also, um, administrators typically get involved in the form of calls, letters, require parent conferences. Also, uh, in Tier 2, we can refer a student to SST or IEP, where a plan is developed, monitored, and then going back to and seeing if there's been a positive response to the intervention. All that said, um, if the student's attendance rate is still trending in the negative direction, at this point in Tier 2, the school may make a decision to refer it to the school's pupil personnel worker. Tier three interventions are those interventions that are designed to offer the most intensive support to families who have severe chronic absentee rate. These are kids who have already missed 20% of the days they've been enrolled. Um, tier during a tier three in intervention, um, that's when the work of a, the pupil personnel worker comes into gear at the, at the most highest level. Um, also during tier three, uh, it also includes assistance and coordination with outside agencies. And because people personnel workers are responsible for enforcing the Maryland compulsory attendance law, during tier three, there may be legal intervention that are, that's used to, as a intervention. Um, examples of tier three interventions might be the PP, like I said, for PPWs to get involved could be a call, a letter. They also they often do home home visits. Um, we have a partnership with Department of Juvenile Services called Project Attend, where a family goes before a hearing officer, and it takes place in in the courtroom. But it's more to create the visual of if things don't straighten out, this is where you can be, and a plan is put into place. We also make referrals to the state's attorney where there's outreach in the form of a warning letter that's sent home from the state's attorney. And finally, there are rare cases where charges do have to be filed in court. So I was hoping just to be able to give you a brief overview of the work that schools put in and people, personnel workers put in to create cultures of attendance. And it's all aimed at, like I said, removing barriers to ultimately decrease the amount of students who cross over into being a chronically absent student. So thank you for your time. Thank you, yep. um, Mr. Howard, for helping us to understand what that looks like and feels like in real time in schools. Um, I think, was there another slide? Did we take the slide down? Thank you. So <laughs> not to prolong, but um, just to highlight on the slide before you, you see uh, this evening's uh, presentation is one more of our ongoing efforts to provide um, consistent um, academic achievement reports for uh, our board members and for our community. Um, thank you. Next slide. Uh, this you will just see our uh, schedule that runs throughout the summer. Next slide. And this really concludes our first semester attendance presentation. So thank you. Thank you. So Dr. Hager and then Mr. McMillian. Um, very quickly, um, thank you for the presentation. Thank you for providing the historical pre-pandemic data. I know we talked about that with another data presentation and how helpful that is to really be able to compare that. Um, did COVID uh, quarantine absences count towards absences over the past year? Those were counted as regular absences, right? We um, had a different coding for those, but yes, okay. that is correct. Yeah, just thinking of, of what 
may can be contributing because I'm sure it's, there are many different factors. Um, just another thing, I'd like to see would be standard deviation bars on the histograms just so you can see how, how the data spreads out over time given that there is a, was a dip down. Um, and do you think that really the, the dip down was due to greater number of chronic absences or those kids who had to quarantine for a few days here and there, or probably both is the answer. So but. we had an unexcused absence rate that increased by 42% wow. in the first quarter to the second quarter. Mm -hmm. We also had um, a uh, COVID-related absence code increased by 600%, but the end oh counts God. are very different. Right. The COVID um, count was uh, about 3.5% of the total absence rate. Right. It really was more unexcused. Um, which is more of an unknown um, than, than actual the COVID coding. Okay, great. Thank you. And it was great to hear all the work that you guys are doing. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McMillian. Mr. Connolly, please help me understand the VLP data. If those kids don't have to turn on their cameras, how do you know that you have an accurate attendance? So I don't... Um, supervised directly the VLP program. My understanding is that you know, teachers actually do know who logs in and student participation is included as part of that. Um, I don't think Dr. Elmendorf is here at the moment to answer that, but I'm not sure if you know. Yeah, so uh, what I, he isn't with us at this point in the evening, but I will say, Mr. McMillian, the attendance for VLP is something that our team has been very persistent around because, again, to your point, it, it is our, our fundamental access to students, right? If they're not logging in um, and, and participating in the lesson, uh, it, we, we don't have any access to them. So it is something that our team has been very persistent when we have students that are not engaging and not attending the outreach to those parents around, you've selected for your student to be in VLP. These are the expectations we need. Um, and so students do participate and demonstrate their engagement. It, it, can not, it can be beyond just having your camera on. Things like active participation in the um, submission of assignments, in the chats, in the small group breakout sessions. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Ms. Mack? Yes. Um, thank you very much. Um, one of my questions was what triggers Tier 1, Tier 2, and Tier 3 interventions? So you answered that. But I do have to say I'm concerned that students can miss 9 to 16 days before a tier two intervention even takes place, and then they can miss up to 35 days before a PPW even gets involved. Um, so keep in mind, this is fluid. Um, each school was charged with having an attendance committee, and depending on the school and the, the way the administration wants the attendance committees to go, some, some PPWs meet and they have attendance committees with their schools once a month. Some have them every other week. Um, there's no steadfast rule. Uh, the game changer was when ESSA came around it, it, because the focus became more on chronic and less on the average daily attendance rate, both of which are important. But as the question you just asked in terms of when a, when, a, when it kicks in, it's up to the team. For example, if, you're, if they're gonna come to, if there was a family that was on our attendance, it's not like a step-by-step. -step. Um, on the slide that I shared with you, it was an abbreviated version right. of, se right, of several. So it's, ba it's basically a menu of choices. So for example, at my schools at the end of the year, I send out a letter to all students who were chronically absent. The following year, when we do our first attendance meeting, if they're showing up on the radar very early, we don't necessarily stick with tier one. We jump right over to tier two. So it depends on the family. So keep in mind, it, it's a menu of choices to okay. give schools just a, a launching point, if you will. Well, to doc, and I appreciate that. Thank you. That helps a lot. And I appreciate Dr. Um, McComas saying that, of course, we're interested in attendance because there's a direct um, impact on academic achievement. And I track a lot of data. And when I look at a school that has low attendance or high absence or chronic absenteeism, you can see it in their academic achievement. And I, again, I just have to reiterate, allowing a student to miss 18 to 35 days before we, and I, I know you say you, no, for keep, some students. Keep in mind, it's a moving target. For example, if a kid misses the first 10 days of school, they're already chronically absent within 10 days. 
because it's the 180 days in the school year. It's a constant moving target. So in an ideal world, when you have your first attendance meeting, there's interventions that have already taken place. Hopefully, they're, they're not going to continue to grow as the days grow in the school year. A child might be on, on, a, on a school's attendance watch list, so to speak, but by the next meeting, they've fallen off because they've dropped below. So it's a constant moving target with, with the 180 days and the missing 10%. Okay, I mean, I'll, I'll, it's, you, given the I, hour, I'll hold my questions. Okay. Well, no, I'll tell you what. When I have my next school attendance meeting, I'm going to send you an invite. You're welcome to I come. will absolutely come Perfect. because I have very serious concerns about this, so thank Perfect. you. Perfect. Thank you. Mrs. Causey? Thank you. Quick question. Um, the Back to um, page three, slide three, comparing marking periods, and it says all BCPS. So... Does that include VLP? Yes, yes it does. Okay. VLP is approximately 3,000 students out of our 111,000 students. Okay, so is there any chart here that is just the in-person? So we didn't include just in-person, one for the sense of 3,000 versus 111,000 is a small number, and it wouldn't dramatically change the all, but you can see the difference more discreetly when you look at VLP in comparison because that's just VLP. I still think it would be helpful to see in person, distinct and separate. And, and we certainly can do that Nice for you. histograms that, that uh, our epidemiologist is uh, requesting <laughs> with color coded bars or whatever. Um, okay, that's all. But I also too appreciate the uh, several years worth of, hi of history. And then is there, um, a breakout that can be provided to the board of the quarantine absentees, you know, how much of that was related to that special code? So in the report, there is detailed information related to first semester's uh, attendance data in relationship to that specific code. So it's, it's in there. Okay, great. And then the attendance manual looks awesome. Can the board see, have a copy? I'll send you copies. Okay. Great. Thank you. We will follow up with the board based on that request. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Outstanding presentation. Oh. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. The next item on the agenda is information items, which include the financial report for December 2021, quarter two audit report, report on the special education staffing plan for 22-23, the Student Count 2021 Report, and Update on Key School Legislation. Next on the agenda is a postponed item from February 8th, 2022, Legislative and Governmental Relations Committee Update. During the last board meeting, Ms. Pastor, as chair of the committee, discussed the committee's position on several legislative bills. Postponed was House Bill 476, Baltimore County Board of Education member appointment and terms and election of officers. Also postponed was Senate Bill 1245, House Bill 150, grant program to reduce and compost school waste. If we now desire, we can allow discussion and vote on the board's position. I would also entertain a motion to postpone this item given the lateness of the hour. We need to vote on this given the, the timing. Mr. Thomas, would you like to speak to this or Mrs. Causey? So thank you, Chair thank of you. Legislative. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you for appointing me um, Chair of Legislative Government and Relations. Uh, Ms. Pestor has uh, shoes to fill and a voice to fill and a persona to fill, which I will vaguely attempt to do. Um, I spoke with our Vice Chair, uh, Mr. Thomas, earlier, and he is going to provide the report since he was Vice Chair at the time under Ms. Pasteur and was running that meeting. So I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Thank Thomas. You. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Thank you, Ms. Sen. So the first bill we have today is House Bill 476, or this evening, um, Baltimore County Board of Election, Member Appointment and Terms and Election of Officers. This bill would alter the process for appointing certain members to the BCPS Board of Education by requiring that one, the governor must appoint four members to the county board on a date after the gubernatorial inauguration which is typically in mid-January and before February 1st of that same year. And it would alter the term 
Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's that's basically what the bill does at, at this moment in the form that is provided to us. Uh, the committee has requested that this board that the board support this bill, uh, and there is an amendment that I have in, in collaboration with our uh, with Mr. Bazemore about that I would like to present. But first, this this had the support of the committee, um, and the committee's recommendation is to support this bill. So, thank you. Okay. <laughs> is there is there a motion you'd like to make at this time? Is there a motion to? Can I make a motion? So is there um, a motion to support House Bill four seventy six? I believe it was to support it with amendments, but Mr. Thomas didn't state the amendment. Yes, there wasn't an amendment discussed in the meeting minutes for our legislative committee meeting. It just said that we would support this. Now and we did want to support this with amendments. So I believe that first we have to process the committees recommendation or not process it. No, I think we have to hear the amendment because the committee's recommendation was to wait for specific information that we needed for the amendment, which you are now in possession of. So if you could state it with the amendment, because we did discuss that in committee. Okay. I can discuss uh, the amendments that I've shared with Warner. So the uh, amendment that I think we should, as a board, uh, we should say that we support this with amendments is... Uh, to support with amendments that are made to create a staggered two-year schedule of introducing to new members and avoiding possible full turnover of the board on a four-year cycle, which you suggested in our 2022 legislative priorities be accomplished by making board appointments in 2022 to be only two years instead of four, and ensure that the suggested bill language regarding member appointment after the gubernatorial inauguration have an impact for only the 2022 election year. And I'm going to put that in the chat right now for our board members to see. That is uh, from the conversation in our, in our committee, conversations with Mr. with Delegate Bazemore, or, so conversations with Delegate Eversall, and conversations with Mr. Bazemore, uh, the consensus as to what this would look, uh, the best amend way that the board would move forward with amendments for this piece of legislation. Thank you. So, so I, I move to support, sorry, I shouldn't move yet. I have a question for Mr. Okay. Thomas, and sure. then Sorry. I'll come back to you. So it was my understanding that these amendments were already included in the bill, but is that in not the, the current case? bill's in the current bill? form? It does not include those those amendments. Not in the current writing available on my MGA. Hmm. Okay. What is the motion? Yes, Dr. Would it be possible to? I don't love this idea, but to have a brief administer, or I don't know, brief meeting next week to just discuss these three bills with a quorum, if we could have a good quorum. Is that a, is that a possibility? We would have to um, call an open meeting to, to discuss them, yeah. to take a position. Yeah, I'm just, I don't know. I, it, it's, so this, this I is wouldn't really be a, interesting. I just worry it's going to be yeah. a big discussion. I can be opposed to calling a special meeting just for this purpose. If the when are they going to be discussed? I, I'm not sure Mr. if Mr. Bazemore wants to speak to this. Um, that might be possible when they could discuss this. This has already been presented. There's been a hearing before the Baltimore County House delegation, I believe. This was heard in delegation. On, this yeah, week. it was. So there, the vote will be coming up soon. I would imagine this Friday then if the hearing was last week. Mr. Bazemore. Mr. Bazemore. Or morning. <laughs> Good morning. No, that's not um, and, but, and a lot of this has already been stated in our legislative priorities. So well, if I can, Ms. Um Sure. Or I, I'd like to hear from Mr. Bazemore if, since we called him. Yeah. Forward. Hello. Hi, Madam Chair. Uh, Superintendent yeah, is good, not here right morning. now and the board members. Um, this is a fix-it fix it bill, uh, House Bill 476. Um, it's addressing um, the situation where Nobody really anticipated this when the legislation was first put forth, that a two-term governor uh, who's not running for election again can't appoint um, the at-large members. So this bill attempts to fix that by staggering the terms and also um, having the, uh, uh, the current board, board members that are appointed extend their term for another month. Now, what Mr. Christian Thomas is talking about um, is that the bill in its current form doesn't um, address that. Um, the amendments that will be coming forth by Delegate Ebersole will address 
you know, in its entirety, this, you know, this situation that we're in. So what you have before you now is not the full bill. There will be an amendment coming forth by Delegate Ebersol. Okay, thank so you. So he's anticipating that he's spoken with Delegate Ebersol. So what you're doing is um, just getting out in front of uh, what, he's, what he's gonna be introducing. Okay, and is this, del this is Delegate Forbes' bill, is that correct? Uh, yeah, am, am and I thinking Ebersol of two and Forbes. Different, the wrong bill, okay. Yeah. Just wanted to make sure we were talking about the same one because she told me that it did include those, so that's why uh, I was mistaken. As I'm reading, that is the intent of the legislation, I believe, but in the way that it's written, uh, it just says, this is the, the added language, the governor shall appoint four members to the county board on a day that is after the date of the gubernatorial inauguration and before February 1st of the same year, a member appointed in accordance with subparagraph of this paragraph shall begin their term on the date of the governor's appointment. Um, okay. And it, it not, doesn't explicitly state those, so this amendment would state one within our legislative priorities that next year's uh, appointed members would serve a two-year term so that we're kind of alternating that or that's the suggested language but what it's asking what we're asking is that we stagger the elections of appointed and elected members and two to ensure that the lame duck governor of this of this term would not be able to would not appoint the next board members it would be the governor that's incoming after the governor election. And so that means that that's another intent of this bill originally. So, Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Thomas. Um, so I would not support uh, the process of having the governor appoint after inauguration. Um, that is what happened with uh, Governor Hogan. And when a new governor comes in, they have appointments all up and down the state at every level of state and local government. Um, and I, I think boards would be lucky to get their appointed members by May. So I, I would not support that at all. And I think um, I understand that that is a, a concern, but um, I think they're trying to combine two concerns and this board voted on the one concern. And I would really not like to see um, the board um, be disjointed in its entry. So we're going to have elected members that are elected in November and that right now come in in December with other county elected officials. Um, you were not there, you won't recall, but as you recall, uh, there was a ceremony with all the other elected officials from Baltimore County, um, in inauguration all sworn in um, for those that chose to do that, do it that way. Um, so now you're gonna have people elected coming in at one point and then the appointed members coming in at, a, at an unknown date uh, and then trying to work on whatever it is um, um, that's hitting them at that time. So, yeah. so Mrs. Cosey, I can speak to that, but just on principle, one, I can't support something that I haven't seen. And on hearsay, I have been told that there will be a deadline included in these amendments that, again, we haven't seen of February 1st for the appointment, which sounds great and it addresses your concern. But again, until the board has seen it, I don't feel comfortable of, you know, lending my support to something that I haven't seen. So that's where I am on this. And unfortunately, the timing is such I, I'm with Dr. Hager. If we needed to call a special meeting, we we could, but given tonight and that we haven't seen it, I would not support it. Well, Miss um, Hen, Dr. Hager, if I can respond Dr. to you, Dr. Hager, and then I'll guess. I believe I was she and Mr. Kuhn. Have the, their hands up. I agree with everything Miss Causey said, and and the two-year um, proposal that we had that went in really does address this in the long run. I know it doesn't address it this year, but I think that. I mean, my, my, I, I envisioned it status quo this year, and then every two years after that fixes the issue that we were talking about when the governor is stepping out and appointing new members. So, and we already said that we supported the two-year right. appointment this year. So do we need to vote again? Is it, does it matter if we vote again since we already said that we support that? I agree. And it's 1235 yes. a.m. <laughs> okay. Mr. Kuhn. Um, I do not support this bill, and I will not be sitting here after November of this year. <laughs> so you will be down one member, and um, I, I, I just have a lot of, anyway, 
That's it. Uh, if we vote now, I'm voting against it. Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Uh, this bill in its current form actually addresses both your concern, Ms. Hen, and your concern, Ms. Calzy. Um, Ms. Hen, it says, the governor shall appoint four members to the county board on a day that is after the date of the gubernatorial inauguration and before February 1st that same year. So it already does address that. And Ms. Causey, for your concern about members being elected in December and in, 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 in December, but then this unknown date in the future, well, it has to be by February 1st. And it also says a member elected to the county board shall begin their term on the date that the members are appointed in accordance with this paragraph. So that means that the appointed, that the governor, the way that he, when he would determine who, to, would the date he would determine to appoint the members would be the same date that the um, elected members would be starting their term. And so that would mean that, to Mr. Kuhn's point, um, in December, uh, the current elected members and appointed members would have a continued term until that appointment would occur. We vote in, in a new chair in December. That doesn't make any sense. It also, it also okay. says in this bill, in a gubernatorial election year, the county board shall elect a chair and vice chair from among the members at the first meeting of the county board after the new term of members has begun. So it also does address that in the bill. That would shorten the elected term. That doesn't make, that doesn't make sense. Ms. Rowe. Okay, so putting all the elected members in and waiting for their elected term to start until the, sometime before February. Sir, what's today's date and what did we vote on today? And can someone start their term in February and meet the budget approval process? We cannot have a Board of Education where none of the new members, where everyone else, like, I'm not going to be here December 3rd, <laughs> right? So I won't have run. So then what happened? Like, we have no board. They have to sign, put in the elected, this is not well thought through because we cannot begin a budget cycle with a brand spanking new board the beginning of February. This, you just can't. So they're gonna have to swear in the elected officials first and then if they wanna do this, then the appointed members, I think they need to rethink some of these details. Okay, um, so I think any of these concerns would come up in a transition year when we're trying to get to that stagger election without all the information. This would only affect this year in, in particular. It would, there would, this one year would really have this huge effect on the election and the appointments structure because prior, it, with the amendments that were suggested tonight, uh, what we would support it with amendments of, it says only for the 22 election year. Now, that means that with the staggered elections in the future, this quandary that we're in would not still be in effect. Every two years with the appointment, the, we would not be in another gubernatorial election year where the, uh, where the governor is coming in. Understood. The, Mr. Yeah. Thomas, given the lateness of the hour, it sounds okay, so then, we need to move forward. Um, we have a few more items. To was there a motion? There was no motion. Okay, so there will be no motion on this matter. Is there a motion on this bill? I move to reject it. <laughs> no. We, we don't need them. Okay. Hearing none, next item. All right. The next the item board. on the agenda, on the legislative priorities. Hold on. There's one more. Sorry. Um, let me just pull this up. Apologies. Okay, this one, is, the second bill is Senate Bill 1245 and House Bill 150, Public Schools Grant Program to Reduce and Compost Weight. This bill establishes a grant program to reduce and compost school waste requiring the Maryland Association of Environment and Outdoor Education to review grant applications and select recipients to be awarded grants. This bill was brought forth as information. However, Ms. Pashore submit submitted that information via email on uh, February 2nd, 2022 to all board members. Um, and it is being brought forward for information. I would move to support that one. Is there a second? Second, Thomas. I would just say briefly that Baltimore City Schools have done a wonderful job composting. And by creating a composting program in a very large school system, you can really change things for the better for the whole state. Just saying that. Okay, so there's a motion and a second. Any discussion? Mr. Kuhn? If I can speak to my second. Oh. Oh. So I would, I'm, I'm just gonna share some quick information because uh, I do support composting, um, but there are limits to residential composting. So I'm just hopeful that it is outlined that schools don't have to abide by the compost limitations associated with different areas because if there are rats in the areas, then you can't compost. Therefore, 
significant portions of the county will not be available to do this. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Thank you. I just wanted to add that this bill, um, in response to Ms. Pastor, when she reached out to uh, our our delegate, our senator, Hedelman, um, uh, it was determined that this bill would not require the counties to uh, provide any funding per se, but it does offer an incentive through state funding to support school level and school level efforts. This was a concern that was brought up in legislative committee, um, but it has been addressed. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Hager? And just to add that the idea is that when a large school system is going to move forward with this, then the infrastructure ends up getting built. So that, that's, that's part of the reason that um, the city schools made such a move to go in that direction, so. Great, okay. thank you. Any other comments, discussion? Ms. I just want—I just want to say we did discuss in committee, and I do support it. Um, it's it's good for the environment. It's good for the children to understand how everything works. So, and it's grant based, so there won't be a fiscal impact uh, on the schools. Okay. May we have a roll call vote, please, Ms. Cover? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. And that is all for legislative committee updates. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. The next item on the agenda is board committee updates, board member comments, and agenda setting. First is committee updates. We'll start with the audit committee. Mr. McMillian. Uh, our next meeting is March 15th at 4.30. We've added a new member. Ms. Hen's going to uh, take Ms. Pastor's place. Um, my comments are I've I already missed Ms. Pastor's uh, educational expertise and the support that she's gave, given me over the last couple of years. Uh, I have no agenda items other than what I've mentioned before. Thank you. Thank you. Budget Committee, Mr. Kuhn. Um, Budget Committee has an, a meeting in March. Please refer to the website for the date and time. Um, the last committee meeting, uh, we discussed uh, Title I funding, uh, and we talked a lot about poverty and how it's determined and ranked uh, throughout the system. It's very eye-opening and disturbing. Uh, and, <clears throat> and that's it. Thank you. Thank you. I, I want to thank the, um, I was chair of the Budget Committee, and I just want to thank the staff for their support of um, that committee's work this year as we've gone through the budget process. Um, Mr. Saris and Mr. Tantliff have just been amazing. So to, to add on to Mr. Kuhn's update, I want to thank them for their support with that. Um, buildings and contracts, Ms. Joes is not on. Who's the vice chair? Mr. McMillian, are you vice chair of that? Uh, I'm vice Committee. chair. Do you have However, any updates? I have uh, nothing to report. Thank you, sir. Um, curriculum, Ms. Matt? Yes, um, we had a very um, good meeting. We talked about a number of contracts that will be coming to the full board. And we also talked about... Um, BCPS's use of Fontas and Pinnell and um, the message that is being delivered to our educators around that. Thank you. And our next meeting, I believe, is the 17th. Thank you. Equity Committee, Ms. Scott. Do we have anyone from the Equity Committee who wants to give an update? Dr. Hager, are you the Vice Chair of Equity? No? <laughs> Okay, so at the last um, equity committee meeting, uh, we had an incredible presentation uh, on uh, non-discrimination practices for our LGBTQ plus students. And we also had an incredible presentation on CTE programs and the distribution of those, as well as there was one more presentation I be presented by uh, Ms. Shea, um, and that was also incredible. I can't remember the exact topic right now. But our next meeting will be in March at some time, and you can go to the website to figure out exactly when that is. Thank you. Legislative, Ms. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, our last meeting was February 3rd, um, and Mr. Thomas uh, ran the meeting. And um, we had lively discussion. There are a lot of bills related to education. 
Uh, there is attached to board docs a comprehensive document with the most recent update on the legislative issues. So it's available to the public as well as uh, board and staff. Um, our next legislative and government relations committee meeting is Thursday, March 3rd, 2022 at four o'clock. Um, and um, the committee meetings are currently meeting virtually. Um, and so the public is still um, invited to attend virtually and they can go to board docs uh, to participate, uh, not participate, to listen in on the meetings. Thank you. Policy, Ms. Rowe? Yes, our last policy review uh, committee meeting was February 14th, um, and our next one is March 14th. Thank you. Um, next agenda items for future board meetings. Anyone have any agenda items to share? Ms. Causey? Um, I would like uh, the board, and I don't know if this needs to start in a closed session or administrative function to discuss uh, the public works recommendations uh, that involve the board, uh, because there are a number of them, and I think that they um, can be very helpful in improving our governance, oversight, um, transparency to the community, and uh, engaging with the superintendent and the staff. Thank you. The last item on the agenda is announcements. Oh. The Mr. Thomas? Yes, I, I thought, sorry, I thought we were doing board member comments and agenda items. I'm sorry, Mr. Thomas, yes. Any uh, board member comments? Yes, I just had a comment. I, I wanted to discuss uh, the virtual learning days for snow days. Um, I've been in conversation with Dr. Williams, our deputy superintendent, our chief of staff, and I am disappointed in kind of the overall engagement of students in determining this position. I feel like there are not enough students in discussing this uh, unprecedented kind of a way to conduct snow days um, and, and virtual learning for students. I have concerns for elementary school students during these virtual snow days, including my kindergarten sister and my, uh, five, my, my brother who's in fifth grade who has autism. And I just think that in future discussions about the virtual learning for snow days, we really need to be more engaging of our, of our students in those topics. So uh, I appreciate the presentation to the board, but I, I wish that we could have also had a discussion on that matter as well. Thank you. Thank you. The last item on the agenda is announcements. The board's next meeting will be held on Tuesday, March 8th, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for, to staff for sticking through it with us. The meeting is now adjourned. Be safe, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you.